Hi everyone, welcome to World Data Summit once again, and this is uh, the day fifth of World Data Summit 2022, the mega summit that we do every year. So let me define what is World Data Summit. World Data Summit is basically a platform wherein we bring change makers, updaters, policymakers, politicians, entrepreneurs, investors, a lot many different people, spiritual healers, business coach, in a common platform to share their insights, network, connect, communicate with each other. And every speaker brings their own flavor. Every speaker brings their own wisdom. And what we allow, we allow everyone to network with them to do some good business together. Let me give you a brief history how it started, why it started, and who am I? Of course, I'm the host for today's uh, World Leader Summit, apart from the fact that I'm founder of World Leader Summit. I started my life back in 1998 as an entrepreneur when I was 17 years old. I floated India's one of the first game development company called Virtual Infocom. We started making PC-based game that time. Eventually, it was as because it was a bootstrapped company. There was no mentor for me. There was no guide for me. I learned things from the market. And I learned a very basic thing. To grow, you need to grow together. And you need like-minded people to grow things and make things viable and strong. 2008, when we released several different games, several different small applications for our clients, for our corporate clients, and definitely our own products, we have been making superheroes from real actors and actresses that time, which made a disruption in the Indian gaming history by taking real actors, hire them to become a 3D superhero into our own game universe. So we floated India's one of the first RPG game called Ashatthama the Immortal. Long, long back with color effect to fighting style. Directly we went there, learned the entire fighting style to do the exact kind of simulation. So I'm actually coming from a very deep background of technology. While doing my master's into computer science, I learned the fact that if you really want to give back, you need to create an ecosystem of giving back the education process. So we floated amazing training institute and I started giving franchising. 2008-9, I was realizing that after running the business as a serial entrepreneur, a lot of people like me, they are bootstrapped as well. So they need support, they need assistance. So I started giving them mentoring, guidance, whatever I have learned so far so good by traveling a few different part of the world. Yes, dear sir and madam, I traveled more than 40 plus countries in my life while doing businesses, while doing charities, while doing ecosystem building. When I became an angel investor, started investing in the startups, I understood that they need a lot of things coming together. So we floated our own platform called Entrepreneur Face long back to support with mentoring, with money, with network, with business assistance, not with me only, but like-minded people like us. So I concept converted into us. The concept of me became we. So M word went off, it became W. It just twisted. It becomes a great meaning. So from that we concept, re removing the entire me concept, all of us felt that there is a need of creating another big platform wherein people can come and they understand the pain of each other. So World Leader Summit is basically in a nutshell, a think tank, a powerhouse, where we share our pain, our strength, our weakness, the most important part, where we are weak. I'm pretty clear about my ventures. If I'm weak in something, I will try to find out someone who can become strength into that particular business. And that's how you can grow. You cannot be a superhero from comic book strip and say that you have all the superpowers. Practically, in your comic books also, you can't find any superhero who has got all the powers. So they create leagues. So welcome to World Leader Summit. And we have amazing change makers today who will be sharing their beautiful thoughts knowledge, wisdom, learn, understand, network, interact. I can all uh, see that at the moment we have Europe, we have Asia, I can tell you the countries. We have uh, definitely our first beautiful speaker because 
I personally feel that women are the universe. So we are about to start our first session with the universe. A lady from Europe. I'm sure that she is going to rock us like anything. How are you doing, Jenny? Thank you, Arjit. What a brilliant introduction and what a journey of expansion that you have been through. And I just hear the authenticity and the self-acceptance that has led you to inviting all of us to collaboration. It's such a powerful initiative. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure. Jenny, where are you coming from? Which country? I'm dialing in from Sweden. Oh my God. So we are missing a couple of Swedish dishes at the moment, I guess so. <laughs> yeah. So uh, for the world, uh, don't look at me. I'm a foodie. So if I look at this lady, I'll be thinking that maybe she's cooking something in her house and um, I'm really becoming hungry. So let my mouth shut and give this mic to this amazing woman. Jenny, could you please introduce yourself and uh, the floor is yours for 15 minutes. We'll go in social media for if there is any kind of question and answer. And for uh, other people, we already got Australia. My God, a couple of continents already joined. We have Pakistan, India, Sweden and Australia. Welcome. Jenny. Thank you so much. Yes, my name is Jenny Langren. I'm the CEO and founder of Nora Communications. I coach CEOs and managers and leaders worldwide to reclaim their lives, making psychology concrete, and teaching them tools for communication to connect with themselves on a deeper level so that they can connect with their teams as deeply and guiding them to recognize their sphere of influence in, in any situation. And I can let you in on a little secret. Five years from now, like five years ago, you would not have recognized me. Having spent 10 years in an abusive marriage, I was dying spiritually, mentally, emotionally, um, making decisions based on fear and the impulse to wanting to protect myself and my children um, I burned out and my children were cared for by a woman that resembled their mother and I was so focused on the things that were outside of my control that I was not present in my own day in knowing myself at my core in knowing my needs or owning my decisions, I can tell you that I did not know myself. And you see, this is how it is that we are born into this world with a space that is only ours. And I like to use the image of a beach because when I'm standing on a beach, I sense my freedom. I reach my hands to the sky and I don't care who sees me because I'm just enjoying being me. It's the vast blue sky, it's the ocean as far as I can see. And I am enjoying the gifts that I'm given. And it's my perspective, my needs, my way of seeing things, my creativity, my longing. And then people come into our lives or events occur that causes us to compromise on that space. As we were first connected with ourselves and our inner knowing, hearing within ourselves that, hold on a second, this situation right here is a no for me. This is a boundary, this is no. And yet we hear ourselves saying, yes, okay. And then equally on the other side, we want to open up to something. Our inner knowing is saying, yes, this is in alignment with who I am. I want to receive this in my life. And yet we hear ourselves saying, no. And we begin this journey of self-destructing 
of making the space that was always ours smaller and smaller and smaller. I see this journey in my clients, much like my own journey. I find my clients feeling constricted by and held back by the events from the pandemic that hit us in 2020. So many found themselves in their homes feeling trapped, denying themselves the basic needs of community and fellowship, touch even. Questioning their decisions and worrying about their loved ones. And we have since been returning to our workplaces. Many times with the fundamental needs of being seen and heard still unmet. And all around me, I see organizations struggling with organizational fatigue. Increasing numbers of burnout and conflicts around fairness. And I hear employees and my clients narrowing it down to expressing their psychological needs of being valued, seen, and heard. They recognize more than ever how much is outside of their control. And digging deeper, there is that deeper need for the sense of security, the experience of feeling safe. Three years ago, I took a walk in the woods and I made the decision that I am not going to die for my kids. I'm going to live for them. And everyone who's watching, this world needs us to be alive. A series of events woke me up to reclaim my life in a most powerful way. And my mindset started shifting from trying to control what I could not control into listening to within, to owning my needs and my decisions. Today, I spend my days mapping out work environments counseling teams, teaching communication and aiding in conflict resolution. But what I truly do is supporting my clients into reclaiming their lives, to own and enjoy their stories, to own their yes and their no, and meet them at their beach. And together we walk from there to support them in recognizing that regardless of circumstances, if it's working under the restriction of a pandemic or working in office, true expansion starts from within. It comes from knowing yourself and your values so that you can live a life in alignment with them and aligning with the values of your team. It comes from acknowledging and respecting your own needs so that you can professionally relate to the needs and the goals of your team. It comes from owning your authentic full body yes and full body no so that you can create a life of integrity and show up at work as your best authentic self. Dear listener, I choose to call this pandemic a collective trauma and we have before us to heal, to find our sense of security 
not in trying to control our circumstances, but to knowing ourselves and offering our employees the safe space to self-reflect, self-motivate, heal, grow, and expand as well. It's my firm belief that the future of business is led by leaders who are not just open to, open to or willing to, but longing to do their own inner work of healing to show the people within their span of care that they are safe and encouraged to allow themselves to do the same, to give themselves permit, permission. So before I wrap up, let's pause for a little bit. How do we then heal? To step into our choices, we need a sense of clarity. It is clarity that leads to action. To live in clarity, we first get to know ourselves. To know ourselves, we first get to spend time with ourselves. And to even be wanting to spend that time with ourselves, we get to be comfortable in our own company. So do you see where I'm going with this? We can only grow as human beings in a compassionate relationship to ourselves. And I encourage you to consider that we build a relationship to ourselves just like we build relationship to the people around us. So I encourage you to pause for a little bit and consider how are you building high trust relationships to the people around you? What are you doing to inspire that confidence and that trust? To go to myself, I respect them. I open up to them with a sense of curiosity and care. I'm slow to judge and quick to forgive. And I hold that space for them. And fellow leaders, for us to move forward through this trauma and grow through this trauma, this is what we get to give to ourselves and inspiring our teams. And to give another concrete example, picture that there's a new neighbor moving into your neighborhood and you are walking over there to knock on their door and spend some time with them to truly get to know them. And let's imagine that they open that door with eyes of hatred or disgust or like bitterness or judgment. Will you stay in their company to get to know them? Will you enjoy spending that time with them? I, I sure don't, I sure want. And the lesson is that this is very often and especially in the experience of trauma. Research tells us that this is often the way that we open the door to ourselves. And this makes us very uncomfortable in our own company. So I encourage you, I'm telling you that from the moment that you're listening to this, there is a new path where you open that door to yourself with eyes of compassion, with eyes of curiosity the intention to want to understand and connect. We in self-caring and giving this to ourselves, show our people, the people within our span of care that they have permission to do the same. And together we can choose to reconnect 
and live our lives and business in a way that we expand with integrity and compassion towards ourselves and others, truly understanding that expansion comes from within. So thank you for listening. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant speech. If uh, any question comes from the speakers, please feel free to raise your hand and ask her a question directly. Toby, you want to ask any question? No, but I just thought it was amazing. Thank you, Jenny, for sharing that. That's really, really, um, really passionate and really authentic. So I really like that. So thank you. Thank you. That means so much to me. Thank you, Toby. Hmm. Yeah. So we have only one question from social media. Um, it's coming from uh, some part of Asia. I can recognize it is listed as Vietnam as country. Uh, the question is, do you meditate? And the second part of the question is, what is your proposal to heal from inside? So the first, do I meditate? I think meditation means different things to different people in the way that I view it, yes. I spend time in this moment because I believe that the future does not exist. I create the future. I cannot control it, but I create it by the choices that I step into and the awareness that I step into this moment. So for me, this is all about presence, presence and appreciation for, you know, tasting my coffee and being here and now and feeling the sun on my skin and um, connecting with myself so that I can truly connect with the people around me. Um, yes, I meditate. <laughs> what was the second question? Second one was, what is your proposal to heal from inside? To heal from inside? It is being compassionate and accepting yourself. Trauma is very much connected to questioning yourself whether you should have done things differently. So recognize that you have, you carry every age inside yourself. And I have sat with myself as a 12 year old, <laughs> as a 18 year old, as a 24 year old. And I have shared my, with myself and given to myself the love and the understanding that I was always longing for from the people around me. So healing is about saving ourselves and showing ourselves that grace and recognizing that I get to carry every age within myself into the future. And I have my own back. I trust myself to know. Absolutely amazing answer. Well, uh, thank you so much, Jenny, for the beautiful speech. I guess uh, Rahul, you wanted to ask the question? We can. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am, for the wonderful presentation you just made. So I wanted to ask you, what is more important to create what we want for our future or, you know, just to let the universe guide us and do things for us? Like if we become concrete and we want a certain thing and if we are powerful and we manifest it, then maybe we are interfering what the universe has designed for us. So how do you see that? It's a big yeah question Thank that you. I am currently facing so it will help me a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I, I trust this process. I trust that it's a co-creation between us. So I can only share what comes in for me as you're sharing. And what is coming in is that when compassion is complete, it, it includes all of us. So sometimes I you know, I'm in either ditch, like I'm caring for everyone else <laughs> or I'm, and I'm self-destructing or I'm only caring for me and not taking into regard how that affects the people around me. So I believe that when my compassion includes myself, that gives a balance to things. And it gives, it gives me a perspective of where I end and other people begin. And when I include myself, yes, there are boundaries. <laughs> and 
Yeah, I don't know if that's if that brings something to you. Yes, ma'am. I think I got my answer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> so thank you, Jenny, for uh, that amazing speech. And thank you, all the guys, for asking the question, uh, because we are always tight in schedule. Uh, so we are running exactly on time. Thank you, Mohammed, And thank you, uh, Jessica, for the lovely clap that you are giving virtually. Now from the beautiful lady, we will be going towards someone coming all the way from Australia. Toby, how are you doing? Very, very good, thank you. Yes, so I'm from Melbourne, Australia, and I guess um, today I'm going to talk about safer entrepreneurship. So it's really a smarter way to start your business. And what I'll do is I'll give you a brief introduction, then I'll, we'll dive straight into it because I know we're running short on time. All right, so hopefully everyone can see my screen. And what I'm going to do is just going to dive straight into it. Sure. Right. Right on so, time, so don't worry. Floor is yours. Well, thank you. So just a bit about myself. I'm an entrepreneur and educator. I'm also founder of the Global Entrepreneur Academy. And essentially, um, I've been working with entrepreneurs for about 30 years. So I'm a serial entrepreneur and I've been helping businesses, but also been mentoring and, and building other people's business, businesses as well. So what I do essentially is, is I help people launch their next big idea. And I am a business coach and mentor and have been for about 16 years. I also have a master's of entrepreneurship and innovation. And also I've been a former university lecturer in entrepreneurship and also a course developer, author and writer. So my real passion is about, um, well, my passion is about education, sustainability and innovation. So a little bit about what I do, um, the Global Entrepreneur Academy, it helps entrepreneurs build their ideas and test and validate them before they launch. So what I'm finding is that too many people are starting businesses and then failing. So my journey throughout life has been, why is this occurring? So I've spent uh, many years on the academic circle trying to figure this out, also my own experience, but also helping others as well. And the, the program I've developed over the last couple of years is called Startup Fundamentals. And again, it, uh, it helps entrepreneurs test and validate their idea before they launch and in effect it saves time money and opportunity cost but what i want to talk about today is a new concept called safer entrepreneurship so let's i'll just begin some facts on business failure um, the late clayton christensen he said in the usa each year more than thirty thousand new consumer products are launched and 80 percent of them fail in the first year and also a quote here by nielsen they say that 85% of new consumer packaged goods products fail within the first year of launch. And the main reason for failure, people just didn't want the product. The reality is people don't care about your idea, solution or technology, which is kind of counterintuitive to what we're led to believe because we all believe that our ideas um, are the formulation of, of a business, but I will show you otherwise. The question is why? Because customers don't want a choice. They just want what they want. The reality is we create products and services we think are going to sell. And the question is, how do you know it will sell? What makes you think so? And many of us fall in love with our solution or our technologies. This is one of the biggest problems and not the problem. So you should be falling in love with the problem, not the solution or the technology. The second problem is what happens is people hang on the tail coats of other successful businesses, thinking that if they copy what other successful businesses are doing, surely they will emulate their success. And you may have gone to a seminar and the presenter says, if you do this and that, you will be successful. That's not the reality. The reality is you've got to create something that's unique. And I'll explain that a little bit more in detail. And people make this fundamental mistake over and over again. Many people think that it's all about the idea. The reality is it has nothing to do with your ideas or idea. Why not? It's not you who dictates whether the idea is good, but the market. Now, as an entrepreneur, I rarely see 
someone's initial idea actually turn into a business idea. So what happens normally is either turns into a pivot, right? Or at worst case, they fail, which is not really failure, but it's just a learning opportunity. Of course, if you, if you repeat the mistake twice, then it becomes a failure. The mistake most people make is simply they link an idea with a business opportunity. And because they're blinded by the cognitive biases, this results in improper or insufficient market validation. Now, the question is, are you likely to overstate your position? Are you often blinded by your cognitive biases? Well, if so, you might be suffering from what, what I've termed the ugly baby syndrome. I mean, sure, opportunities are driven by ideas. However, not all ideas can be developed into business opportunities. Why not? Well, ideas are dime a dozen. And as the uh, Richard Branson says, opportunities are like buses. There's always another one coming. And here's another quote by the late Kerry Packer, who was one of Australia's richest men. And he said, the opportunity of a lifetime comes knocking every day. Now, is that true for you? Well, could be. Really, it's all about building a team, creating a valuable business model, and then testing and validating your assumptions through a series of experiments, gathering the resources, and then executing it successfully to build it into a business. Now, that sounds easy, right? But what is important? It's execution. And successful execution always requires a team. It's almost impossible to be successful in business without building a team. Otherwise, it can just end up being another job. And we call this self-employment. And you end up being what we call lone wolf entrepreneur. What you do is often you trade time for money. Because you're unable to get leverage as a lone wolf entrepreneur, and leverage gives you the ability to scale. And without execution, it's nothing more than just an idea. And without a team, it's nothing more than just a job, often with a lot of headaches. The other important factor in seizing opportunities is timing. And here's a great via TED talk by Bill Gross. Uh, he's the, uh, the founder of the Idea Lab. And he launched well over 100 businesses. And he talks about the single biggest reason why startups succeed. Now, we won't play this because we're short of time, but you can Google this video, Bill Gross, TED Talk, and the sing single biggest reason why startups succeed. And it gives you amazing insights as to why startups succeed. Now, to be successful in business, you must be able to create a business that is unique and valuable. Now, when we map these out on valuable on the x-axis and unique on the, on the y-axis, what we see is some businesses are not valuable and not unique. Example here is pets.com. And then there are businesses that are unique but not valuable. And they're just another mousetrap or many other inventions we do see. And then you get businesses that are valuable but not unique. And they end up in price competition as a commodity. Where you want to be is in this frame, unique and valuable. Now, when we create a, a valuable business design, it looks a bit like this. So we use the design thinking principle. So desirability. So do they want it? Is it feasible? So can we do it? And is it viable? And then that's the most valuable design is the overlapping in the middle. Now, the other thing to also want to do, you want to do is you want to create a remarkable business, not just 10% better, but 10 times better. And here's a great video by Seth Godin, and he, he, he frames it, is your idea remarkable and worth spreading? Because if it's remarkable, then people talk about it. So there's a viral effect. And again, the video is here. You can Google that. It's a great video from 2003, but it's a classic. Now, also price and value. Most people confuse price and value. And cheap does not necessarily equate to good value. And we are conditioned to respond to that. And just think of it about this for a moment. Why are people prepared to pay so much more uh, for buying an Apple iPhone? So why do you think that's the case? It's certainly not price. So then what is value in business? 
Remember, value is only generated when customers put their hand in their pockets and hand over the dollar. Until then, you simply have not generated value. So my question, is your product or service idea compelling enough for them to hand over their dollars? And furthermore, you do not get paid for your time, but what value you create for others. So think about this. What value are you offering? Now, I just want to talk a little bit about safer entrepreneurship, and you can, you can find out this website under um, safer.net. Uh, but what you must do is I want to go through the principles and you must align everything before you start. So always begin with the end in mind. So where do you want to be? Begin with building your team, network, and community first because it's your community that builds your brand. And surround yourself with the right people who guide and inspire you. And find the right mentors who are experienced business owners who have done it over and over again. I very rarely get advice from mentors who or business coaches who have never started a business. Yeah, they might have started a coaching business. But that's not a real business in, from my, my, uh, my experience. One, that's uh, a business is one where you start you, 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 and, and you, you might succeed or you might fail. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it is going through that process that's really important. Next, create a business model that is unique and valuable where you can build a market dominant position and create something that's truly remarkable, 10 times better and test and validate your assumptions through an ex established experimental process before you launch it. And this way you can save a lot of time, money and heartache. And here's a quote by Tamara Gillen, founder of and CEO of Wealthy Her. And she says, it's all about your network. Think about who you already know and who they can introduce you to. And believe it or not, I've actually met two or three brilliant investors via my personal trainer. So you just never know where you're going to meet the people. So here are the key takeaways. Building a successful business is about getting your fundamentals correct before you begin. It's not about the idea. Understand the customer job to be done. Don't fall in um, don't fall in love with the solution or technology, but rather fall in love with a problem and learn to keep asking why. So be curious and challenge the status quo and build a team um, and execute that idea and getting your timing correct is really important. And create a business model that's unique and valuable and dare to be different and be truly remarkable. That's when you can make a difference and test and validate all your assumptions before spending money to launch it. And it will help reduce the probability of your failure and get you on the right track quicker. You don't want to spend two years trying to figure it out. You want to try and spend maybe two or three months to try and figure out whether your business is going to work or not. Now, if you want to have a chat, certainly um, here it is. Um, you can have a chat with me about safe entrepreneurship. You can book a 30-minute session in. And there is my LinkedIn, and I'll put the LinkedIn in the, in the chat as well for you guys. You can follow us on on um, on Facebook and all all those all those things as well. And there is my LinkedIn connection again. All right, so I'll stop the share. Do we have any questions? Yes, Jessica. Yeah, we have. So right on time. I think I'll open the floor for first for the speakers. Yes, Jessica, please. Uh, thank you, Toby. That was really elucidating. And it's an interesting connection to what I do because I'm an assistant director at the John W. Altman Institute for Entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm, nice. And in addition, I can say that everything that our teachers teach is what he's saying. And in addition to that, you made me think of a couple of ideas. And one of them is um fall in love with your client um and in that will make you listen actively you know practice at your active listening um and then and then practice that validation and i'm surprised that our students so often they don't want to go out and validate um but it's that active listening and, and falling in love with your client that also will help. But thank you absolutely. for that. Yeah, Wonderful absolutely. Speech. With hundred percent, because that, that client's problem is is part is part of the solution. So yeah, falling in love with absolutely the client. 
without a doubt yeah any other questions before we wrap up yeah um interesting question some people create things for future market may not even understand that maybe they are too early for the market but they sustain and then eventually make things happen your comments on that christian from thailand um well what i've noticed with with with, with people is um they either give up too early or they give up too late but the most successful businesses have got their timing correct right so you look at you know like airbnb you look at uber now had EMB, Airbnb come out 10 years earlier or 10 years later, it probably wouldn't have succeeded. It was just a come out of time, the GFC, they needed, people needed, uh, you know, had a spare room. I mean, who would have thought that concept leading strangers into your house or um, even Uber? Um, again, that came out of the GFC, people had spare spare car, spare resource. Why not? So I think the most important thing, if you've watched the Bill Gross video, he talks about that intensely. So it's well, well worth uh, having a look. I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but certainly um, my experience is entrepreneurs either just keep going, 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 and then they just don't know when, when to give up, right? So a good entrepreneur knows, is a bit like Kenny Rogers, knows when to hold them and knows when to fold them. And that's where experience comes in. Super. Uh, Mohammed probably wanted to ask a question. He raised his hand. Uh, he is from Pakistan. Uh, please be quick because we are running one minute behind now. Next is Mr. Ragnish. Bilal, if you want to. You're muted, my brother. Yeah. Thank you, Arijit. Uh, Toby, um, it was perfect. Just wanted to uh, comment on that. Uh, I think you've hit two things right on the nail. The first thing is the team, which is very important. Because uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, I also uh, uh, kind of come up with, uh, they like to go solo, which is going to be very hard. And yeah. the second thing is the lone wolf thingy. You know, that is per exactly uh, precise on top of that, that, come on, you can't do everything on your own. It, it, as like Ajit also mentioned in the start, that you can't be a superhero. Yeah, you have to have the league. And uh, I think I just want to add one thing on top of it is, um, you know, for me, what worked out was building emotional relationships with my mm -hmm. team rather than transactional relationships because mm -hmm. emotional relationships last longer and yep. transactional relationships don't last longer. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. No, that's great. Great feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. All right. I'll wrap it up and we can get on to the next next speaker. Thanks, Arjit. And thanks, everyone. Um, I really enjoyed it. Toby, uh, for your Thank information, you. we have a council for entrepreneurs. We have specifically mentoring sessions, courses, mm -hmm. and we have our own fund. We'll be more than happy to get in touch after this summit is over. For the sure. world, tomorrow is our startup pitch day. Basically, the revenue stage startups who are looking for raising fund. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, we can't open it for the public. So we don't put that in live sessions. So it will be done tomorrow. I'll be more than happy to get in touch with all of you after this summit is done. Uh, December 8th onwards, please be in touch with us. With that note, let me take Thank you guys you. from Australia coming to our motherland, India. And let me introduce our next speaker, Rajneesh Virmani from India. The floor is yours, sir. Hi, Arjit. Uh, and many thanks for having me on this uh, session. It is a pleasure uh, to talk to this uh, August group uh, and more. Uh, let me share my screen uh, quickly. Uh, is this visible to you guys? So the challenge that I was uh, given by Arijit and the team was, uh, what is the profile of leadership required for a global success and global growth? Uh, so here I am, I'll take about 15 minutes or so, maybe actually 10 and leave time for uh, questions. Uh, First and foremost, I had a few questions myself, but I don't know if this forum, Arijit, uh, allows me from, uh, you know, to get answers uh, from the people who are listening in. Uh, so maybe I'll, okay, so let me try. Are you already working? Big question number one, are you already working on uh, the global stage? Type in your name, location and say yes or no. Are you guys already on? I'm on. Others, I'm sure, yes. They can, they can unmute them, yes. Bilal is saying yes. Uh, okay. So, yeah, I guess the uh, folks on the panel most definitely uh, would be a yes. 
Uh, if there yes. is anybody who's uh, uh, answering no, then possibly the next question, the big question number two was, are you aspiring to be on the global stage? And I thought, uh, you know, if there is a larger audience, then I'll probably get a poll uh, from these uh, uh, guys. Let me, uh, I don't know if you, if the group here can tell me a little about this, your big question number three, what are the challenges that you're facing or anticipating facing uh, in the chat box? Do you want to put something in? Feel free to put the answer in the chat box. I can see another Arjit Datta, he said no, with your question about global scale. Political development, Rahul says, networking and reaching to the right people, Mohammed. Of course, of course. And I loved your comment earlier on in terms of uh, the relationships and the uh, not transactional relationships, but building an emotional uh, connect. So yeah, I quite vibed with that as well. Anyway, wonderful. Let's move on. I have only three or maximum four slides, uh, but I thought I'll cover the gist of what I want to say just in these three or four slides and we'll open it up to questions. Uh, I have been lucky, uh, I didn't introduce myself up front. I've been lucky that I have been working for uh, over 30 years as an employee with large multinational companies. And I have been at the C level, including a CEO, uh, CXO and so on and so forth. Uh, and I've been leading global teams. I've led over 10,000 people in India and over 1,000 Americans and British and European staff as well. So I'm talking from actual experience uh, rather than uh, you know, theory books. Uh, and uh, I can virtually vouch for this straight away. Uh, reality is that your thinking has to be both global and local. Last 10 years, I'm a consultant uh, and I'm giving back to the industry and developing. So rather than uh, running companies myself, I'm teaching others how to run companies. And uh, this also, uh, the scale is global for me. Uh, why do I say this? Uh, that the uh, reality is that we have to be thinking at both the global and the local level. Well, first and foremost, uh, I'd say understanding the macro and micro picture of the market that you are wanting to launch in. Uh, at a, a geography level, at the political level, uh, you know, like was pointed out earlier, maybe there are uh, rules of the game which are changing every so often. Uh, if I take the example at, at a customer level, uh, for example, take the auto uh, industry, a smart car in Europe is literally half the size of a usual car, but the best selling car models in the US are the ones which are the uh, fuel guzzlers, SUVs and so on and so forth, because size is not an issue as far as the US uh, market is concerned. So making sure that as you launch new products uh, into uh, new markets that the, uh, you know, what is selling at the governmental political level, at the economic level, and of course, at the individual uh, customer level as well. Employee needs are different and yet similar. Uh, I don't know if you appreciate this or not, but while it may seem, and you know, the cultural nuances between countries have so often been spoken of saying, oh God, how will it be? Uh, to uh, manage an American employee versus a British employee versus a German employee and an Italian employee and so on and so forth. What I've realized, and I'm talking for actual practice that I have actually done this. It's not as if uh, you know I'm talking uh, about it from the theory book, but uh, the fact is that while there are cultural differences, uh, bulk of the employee needs are very similar. Employees will expect you to be fair. Employees will expect you to give them an opportunity to develop. Employees will expect good appraisals, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, the nuances culturally are there. I remember the first time many, many, many years ago when I was posted to the US uh, and uh, I tried to take my team out on a picnic on a Saturday or a Sunday. And they said, shut up, not, not done. Now, in the Indian context, that's a done thing, taking the team out for a picnic on a Saturday. 
But no, as far as the American employees concerned, they said my Saturday and Sunday is absolutely sacrosanct. So, you know, don't uh, barge into it uh, with your picnics and stuff like that. So cultural nuances are there, no doubt about that, but a whole lot of stuff is similar and understanding what are even the similar needs of employees across the world is uh, equally important. The third thing, as you set up the uh, organization, the organization design, uh, you know, you could have a org chart, which is geography based or product based, or well, at least I would suggest, uh, let it be customer driven. Let it be customer focused. The operating model companies are struggling uh, between centralized and decentralized. Uh, at some point in time, I was believing that it's a seven year cycle that people do go between central, all the centralized companies are decentralizing and all the decentralized companies are centralizing. So I guess the best answer that I can give you or the tip that I can give you is uh, if you, uh, if you hire the best people around the world, then empower them to do the right job. Then don't try and keep the controls uh, in, up in the uh, hands of the head, head office because the leaner the head office, the better it is. In fact, that's something that I've realized uh, over time. So global and local, you've heard this term before. I'm sure I can't take credit for uh, creating this word, global. Uh, let me, what I did, however, was use the word local as an acronym, and I created six uh, skills, leadership skills, which I feel the leaders must have. Now, I could, I could really have been very boring and told you that the basic tra traits of, yeah, of course, you have to be result driven, you have to have care for people, you have to have the financial acumen, uh, and in fact, further accentuated on these three uh, elements, to my mind, that would have been a copybook uh, answer. Let me dive a little bit into these six points that I have uh, raised. Uh, first and foremost, a global vision. What is your vision? If you don't know where you're going, all roads are going to take you there. So have a global vision. L is for listening. To my mind, this is uh, one of the more important things uh, uh, in leadership. In fact, one of the most underrated skill in leadership is the listening skills. I don't know if you'll give me any ideas around BGQs, but BGQs, uh, to cut a long story short, is bloody good questions. Ask bloody good, even as a CEO, and like I said, I've handled teams of over 10,000 people. I used to say this, I may or may not have the right answer at any given point in time, but I will always have the right question. So uh, have your thought provoking questions ready uh, and then listen, listen, listen. Organized and disciplined, uh, you know, sure enough, you could be an idea a minute guy, but like was pointed out earlier as well, uh, if you're not able to execute well, and I don't know if you guys have read that book, uh, uh, Good to Great. Uh, the one key differentiation is uh, being organized and disciplined. What does it take to, Wimbledon, to win Wimbledon once? Probably a good amount of talent and you know, positive thinking. What does it take to win it 15 times or 10 times or five times? It's just discipline and being organized. Customer sensitive, I mean, I don't think anybody will uh, debate that. Adaptability and agility, again, uh, something in today's day and age, uh, I don't think anybody will uh, uh, debate that as well. If you cannot be adaptable, and if you have to fail, then fail fast. Absolutely, I agree with that uh, thinking. But be adaptable, listen. If you're listening to the customer, then you're adaptable. And leadership confidence. Let me talk a little about this uh, in the uh, next slide. If we drive each one of these points, so global vision, like I said, be purpose-driven. And here, from a CEO founder perspective, the high energy element has to uh, come in. Uh, the more the energy with the team, the better are the chances for success. Listening, show curiosity. If you're not building people relationships, if you're not building your network, as a CEO founder, you're wasting your time. So be out there in the market, show curiosity. Structure, discipline, process-driven, absolutely a must. 
you know i added another dimension to customer understanding and this dimension is humility humility to be a learner for life and keep reinventing yourself because once the customer tells you this is something i want or this is something i don't want even if it clashes with your own way of thinking you have to adapt you have to adapt and resilience that's obviously from an adaptability perspective agility perspective how often you fail is not the problem how often do you fail and get up again dust yourself and be ready for the next challenge be culturally aware think global but act lo local uh, you can have your strategies globally but empower the local management team to take on the local decisions uh, and execute and execute fast and i would say the crux of the entire uh, thing is really leadership confidence uh, i call it a pq which is positive quotient uh you know we've heard of iq we've heard of eq uh, i'm introducing another q uh, in the fray uh, which is positive portion is your mindset the more self belief you have as a leader the better is the probability of success of course there will be challenges of course there will be obstacles but it's for you to figure out a positive way to uh, handle uh, the situation and that was only the two or three slides uh, that i have shown from a contact perspective if anybody wants to contact me i've given my email id and my phone number mobile phone number uh, more than happy in uh, talking to folks who are interested uh, in setting up new businesses or running global businesses more efficiently i think that's a skill that i bring to the table having done that for i reckon the last 20 years now 25 years now Uh, any questions arijit any comments from you any questions from anybody at all we open this floor for q and a if there is any uh, we are running approximate 1 uh, minute uh, late but it's fine if you can kindly turn off your screen sharing it will be great so that i, I will do that yeah thank you yes jessica please thank you arjit i was thinking about being agile and adaptable and I think that's one thing that COVID retaught all of us, and it's kind of a human conundrum that um, humans don't really like change, but it's the only constant in life. And um, I think we're always adapting and we're always being agile. For it. so, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Jessica. My pleasure. Rajneesh, thank you. Um, and it was a great presentation. It sort of worked well with what I was doing as well. So I think we we overlapped. And certainly I take the principles from Jim Collins as well, good to great. So yeah, great book if you haven't read it. It certainly is one of the classics that you need to have in your collection as an entrepreneur. I'd love to stay connected, Toby. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, please do on LinkedIn. Thank you. Yeah. yeah and everyone else too in the room. Yeah, for all the speakers, if you have anything which you really need to share with uh, our ecosystem, for all of you and all of us, we have around two point five million subscribers into our newsletter. Feel free to send your content; we'll be more than happy to blast that, utilizing our system itself. Um, for all of you guys, World Leader Summit, uh, the website that you're watching, we have our AI-powered backend in the background. So feel free to reach to us; we'll be more than happy to help. in any way that we can um uh, talking about the same let me take uh, you guys from india to a particular another country and then we will come back once again to india again we will be going back to another country so this is the beauty of virtual conference you can travel with light speed so with that note let me ask mr rajneesh to please stay back with us and i'll be open the floor to our next speaker jessica and after jessica i'll be asking uh, suman to take the floor and then jim after that um, and what i'm going to do as i told you we always give the strength to women and it's the equality that we trust and believe more than that we believe in the team strength so i have got our team member nina all the way from uk she wanted to help because she was actually hosting well there is some it for continuous two days and she said that she is not going to come but then she sent a message that i can't leave you alone i'm going to come and host this so 
The stage is yours, Jessica. From now on, Nina will take care of all of you. I'm there with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arjit. And uh, thank you, Nina, for being here despite your fatigue. Um, you have great commitment to the cause. So um, in light of the increasing wars, the um, increasing uh, f uh, problems with our climate, uh, reimagining the purposes of education and aligning them with the very nature of learning are very important. And so I will share my screen, but then uh, the question I'd like for you guys to have in the back of your mind is, is what do you think the number one inhibitor to aligning teachers with this pur these purposes is? And then we'll talk about that after. So this was some from some research I did um, for Alamin International Center in Karbala, Iraq. What we discovered is that the purposes first have to align with the nature of learning. And note the colors. I go through some images of education and these purposes along with them. So skills for success, content knowledge, and societal needs. And we start with a kindergarten classroom. And in these classrooms, children are doing things. And what that means is if you look up here, you have, um, these are all student jobs. Every day, a student, every student has a job to do be that the, the line leader or fixing the calendar for the day. Um, and so all of the students are paying attention to the group along with um, being responsible for one aspect of the classroom. They're not passive is the point here. So when we look at the nature of learning, students are doing things. And what they're doing is scaffolding skills along uh, according to their age and their ability. Regarding content knowledge, um, they're learning to read. And at this very young age, it's things like the month, the day, which is numbers and others, simple counting and to tell time. When you move on to skills for success, um, they're learning personal responsibility, self-regulation, and work ethic. What's missing in a lot of U.S. education, I certainly can't speak for other educational systems, is we have this tug of war between the parents and the, and the teachers. And the teachers say, oh, the parents aren't doing their job. And then the teachers say, the vice versa, the parents say the teachers aren't doing their job. And they're both missing the point if that's what they're doing. Um, whether it's the parent or the teacher, they need to work together to create self-regulation and a, a work ethic. So what society is getting out of this method is awareness of uh, their community, um, patriotism, because in America we say, I pledge allegiance to the flag every day. And students are learning to proactively maintain in their environment. So if somebody throws a wad of paper on the ground, then someone picks it up. It, it's a very simple concept to teach at a very some, from a very young age. And we're going to go, go to different age groups here. Um, this is combining the younger students with, um, this is a program I created in which um, privileged international college students read and performed stories with marginalized at-risk kindergarten through third graders. And this is quite an example of active learning and everybody loved it. You can see them performing um, puppet shows here. And then um, moving to a slightly older, this is uh, an eight-year-old girl who has written a speech for Veterans Day 
and that's her father who is a veteran. And you can see in this picture that the teacher isn't even paying attention, which isn't really a problem. The point is that she's not the center of attention. It's not the teacher. It's, it's the students who are the center of attention. So when we start with the nature of learning, the student is scaffolding her ability to read and write and speak in public based on her interest. That's another important component. The student has to be interested in what's going on in order for that to continue. So content knowledge, obviously she's learning to read and write at a higher level. Skills for success, self-confidence in her ability to present publicly, critical thinking. And this is a story of honor and perseverance, which builds resilience, building off of what the previous speaker was talking about. Societal needs honor the parents and elders. Again, patriotism and then ethics. What are the right ethics to have? Um, but those conversations are very important for the future of humanity and our earth, actually. So he, this is what it, interactive learning looks like at a higher level. Um, so regarding the nature of learning, obviously it's interactive learning. Um, the what the students are doing here, this is a physics class and it is at night and counter to the American business ethic of don't take away my Saturdays. This is students on a Friday evening with the teachers and the principal and they have read all of the AP physics materials and what they did was they got stuff from their garage in their basement and they made perpetual motion machines. Some of you may know the term Rube Goldberg. So what this creates are that students are physically understanding, demonstrating their understanding based on strengths and interest. Students are not taking a test. They do eventually take the AP physics test, but here they're demonstrating their understanding. This is a mandate at our program the John W. Altman Institute for Entrepreneurship in Farmer School of Business. Students don't take any tests. Students demonstrate their understanding um, by giving their by writing their papers and then uh, giving presentations. Um, in business schools, we call them pitch contests. Content knowledge, obviously physics, motion, friction, gravity skills for success, critical thinking, creative problem solving, self-confidence, presenting in public, and the ability to work as a part of a team, which aligns with what Ranjit was saying, excuse me, Rajnit. Societal needs, these students, the teachers are volunteering, the students are volunteering. It teaches people to be tolerant and empathetic because this is messy work. Um, and things go wrong. And we have to work with that through that. So being patient too. It's a reuse of resources and working in harmony together. Um, and that's really the end of that presentation. Um, but I started with why does this matter for a reason? And we don't need to look very far to realize that um, there are a lot of issues out there that we need to tackle, and it can be our youth who are able to do that. So does anybody have any idea what the number one? Yes, go ahead, Jenny. Uh, I was too quick. I just wanted to <laughs> not answer the question, but let you know that your passion for your work really comes through. And I love that it's not about duality. It's not about right and wrong. It's about the joy of the exploration. It's about the joy of the discovery. And I think that's so important for all of us moving forward. So I just wanted to thank you. Thank you. And I'll acknowledge that by saying like there were, uh, I think it was Rajna who was talking about passion and productivity and curiosity. Well, that comes from the student. You can't just throw somebody into computer science and say, go be curious. You know, it, it starts with where their passion is. But thank you, Jenny. Um, anybody else have an idea of what the number one inhibitor to all of these things are? 
Well, I'll start by saying that um, I I show pictures of me teaching in a hallway, in a conference room, in an auditorium with students running around and doing things and in every type of classroom known. And then their first thing that people often say is, oh, it's the classroom shape. That's why I can't be student-centered. But no, really what the research shows us is that it is the um, teacher self-identity. They, especially at the higher ed level with all of those doctoral degrees, um, they think that I have a doctoral degree and my job is to pontificate. And um, even in medical school, when I did a presentation, I was showing images of professors from Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Stanford. All the teachers were in, in, in the classroom, not the center of attention. The students were the center of attention and they're case-based. And the first thing a professor says was, don't you know that research tells us that we should lecture? Okay, so keep doing what you're doing and you'll get the same result. So I gave the secret away. I'm finished. Nina, over to you, I guess. No, thank you so much, Jessica. A beautiful presentation. And I'm sure that a lot of people will take away from that. Um, do we have any questions for Jessica Arajet from yeah, any members? Have, of we have a couple of comments uh, which actually came. Uh, one, I think I'll be taking. Um, what, is, uh, what is a strong leader in your opinion? That's a very good question. Um, the a very good friend of mine, the King of Hawaii, um, King Edmund K. Paki Silva Jr., would say it's first knowing yourself, and that goes back to some of what Jenny was saying, is being centered and knowing yourself. Um, but I have a lot of uh, ideas on this, and it's hard to pick one that would be the most important beyond knowing yourself. Um, but being aware that I think to start with that leadership is not the same thing as management and leadership is inspiring a shared vision. And the first word is inspire. So, and you can't inspire if you don't care about what you're doing. So know yourself so that you care and have passion about what you're doing enough to inspire that shared vision and then translating that shared vision letting people participate according to their own passion. Uh, but I have a lot of ideas on that. I know we're short on time, so I won't share them all. Uh, thank you so much. And, and yeah, when you come from a heart-centered place, it definitely shows, as Jenny was saying, you know, when someone talks about something with complete passion because they believe in what they're talking about or they've been there themselves, it definitely comes through. And you're very, um, you're very lucky because a lot of people never find that. They never find their why. So to have found it and to be doing something about it, you know, I commend you on that. So thank you so much, Jessica. Um, we have another speaker now we're going to introduce. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Nina. I am the World Leader Summit London Ambassador. Um, so I'm speaking all the way from, not far from Buckingham Palace actually. <laughs> so I'm coming over to you today. Um, I do a little wave at you when you've got five minutes left. So just to let you know that when your 15 minutes are ticking away it's quite easy for time to go quickly we try to keep to the time because we're trying to respect everyone it's quite difficult over the last few days we've had internet issues we've had speakers not being able to find the presentation so bear with us if you're waiting we will get around to you and thank you for your patience remember to ping people in to come and watch us we are live on facebook we are live on twitter and we are we've had 90 countries over the last few days you know we've been having so many countries coming from everywhere and I think we've had over 120 speakers probably a lot more than that so there's been a lot of knowledge shared and a lot of people have given us very positive feedback so if you are not following Arajit on his social media please do please share the page on Facebook so other people can see and log into and also show World Leader Summit some love by following us on LinkedIn and sharing our pages too so without any further ado, I'm going to go to the next speaker who is Samantha. Samantha, are you there? Yeah, hi. Hi, Nina. Hi, right, I'm going to give you 50. Yeah, okay. So, so should I start my presentation? 
Okay, good, good. Thanks again, WLS team, for having me in this uh, uh, next edition of WLS. And every year, you know, I see the WS is, is coming with the new energy and really thankful to Arijit and the other team members to remain fueling their energy, which needs, you know, uh, for driving such kind of forum. And uh, with the very insightful discussion we had on the leadership coming from Jessica and other previous speakers. So now I'll uh, go to the, from management leadership, I'll go to the technological leadership and Arijit uh, is laughing because I know you, you have a soft corner for technology also apart from the leadership. So, and today world when the world is uh, um, kind of changing behind the innovation and te digital technology, uh, a leadership is going to be incomplete without talking about the innovations which is happening or uh, driving the, the enterprises and the people and, 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 and in the entire world. And so one such technology which is driving the large innovation is the quantum computing. And today I am going to talk why the computing has come as a, as a, as a, as a mainstream. Uh, uh, you know, since quite a, a few years back, we were talking about AI as, uh, as a, a, one of the innovation area, which is uh, picking up AI, blockchain, we, we talked about the metaverse. Now, why will the computing has coming to center stage? So last year when I, I was on the uh, WLS forum, I spoke about AI, but this year I wanted to bring your kind attention toward the computing, why this will lead the next set of innovation. Because if you see the, the metaverse and AI and blockchain, every, every emerging technology required the, huge computational power, but uh, can I share my screen here? Uh, okay, just have a, a slide to run, I'll just share it. Uh, uh, so the challenges in present day computing, we call classical computing is basically, uh, it's 75 years when world saw the first transistors, which have been used uh, in, in microprocessors and, and chips, which, which computes uh, or which works in our uh, data center, which works in our computer and mobile and every apps and every communication applications and uh, uses these chips. So these chips are, uh, uh, or, or just say these computing devices are reaching their limitations as Moore's law is no longer going to be relevant. And uh, you might have seen even Intel coming out with their own uh, 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 um, kind of uh, a prediction that Moore's law is already got disrupted because they can't package that number of transistors uh, every time um, are doubling the density, packaging density. So, so and then a couple of other uh, challenges also meaning the volume of data, the velocity of data, content, large content, then regulations. So, so present day computing, of course, is actually reaching the threshold. So if we want to drive the next innovation in AI, which is going to be very computing and resource hungry. If you want to drive next innovation in metaverse, want to drive next innovation in blockchain, then someone has to sort out the computing. So one ray of hope we are having right now is from the quantum computing. So uh, apart from the limitations, which uh, these slides talk about, I'll, I'll straight away jump into how the quantum computing is actually uh, going to drive uh, or converge with the uh, AI blockchain and metaverse. So uh, if you see, uh, as per the, uh, one of the uh, uh, recent Deloitte study, it, it say that the, the computing uh, for supporting uh, the new innovation in AI and blockchain and, and, and metaverse need to be 10,000 times, or maybe sometime uh, 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 10,000 times, or maybe a million times faster than the present computing ecosystem we have. So this is a kind of, uh, 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 revolution we need in computing, where just not the uh, data processing power and computing is speed to be grown by 10x or 100x, but it's also about uh, it's also about uh, analyzing those data, you know, uh, and and finding out the insight from data, which are very important. So uh, now here is the emergence of quantum computing. We hear about the traditional computing being done on bits one and zero in quantum computings, the natural positioning of an atom can be a representation of a computer. Like in air, you have atom, you, at a particular moment, atom can have been in one direction of a speed, but when you apply some computation, it, it can uh, uh, change its spin and which can be measured, which can be an outcome for the computing. So the, the two major characteristics of 
quantum computers are superposition and entanglement due to which they are driving the innovation as far as the speed of computing is concerned and power of computing is concerned. So the computing happens through the qubits. So this is about the introduction of quantum computer. Now I mean, go to the next slide quickly because we have been uh, restricted with the time. Uh, Uh, in, in if you see Google, so Google has uh, launched their own uh, TensorFlow uh, quantum computing, and they are they are also calling it quantum AI. So so they have especially built up and developed their uh, quantum computing frameworks for uh, AI applications. Uh, you know, similarly, the other vendors are also developing, like IBM. They are also they have also the quantum chips, especially focused for AI and 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 other resource hungry uh, application. So. Uh, IBM uh, research announced that it found mathematical proof for advantage of quantum machine learning. So they have uh, done uh, uh, a bit of research in the quantum machine learning and uh, where they have speed up the overall classical ML methods. So quantum computing is field of research is still very new. Quantum computers use a lot of quantum mechanics and information that mean they can find pattern in big data, uh, which is impossible to find in the classical computing. I know this is bit a new concept, but I'll try to explain its application. Uh, so artificial intelligence has come a long way in the past few years in able to generate realistic 3D images and videos. Uh, uh, in addition, uh, it's beginning in press quantum computing that has given rise to quantum AI. So now, uh, what, what is a quantum AI? So wherever we are using quantum computing for accelerating the AI application, that, then that is called quantum AI. So artificial intelligence now leverages quantum computers and their full integration will be technological revolution of the century. So there are several benefits of using quantum computing for the AI application. So uh, these benefits are listed here. Uh, one of the most extreme prediction of the quantum computing is intelligence in the potential to break through the language barrier. Uh, 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 AI models can understand one language, the language used to train them. So if you need to uh, AI to understand a different language, we shall need to teach it from the scratch. However, when we use the quantum computing, which can help AI model to break the through thorough language barriers. So at the same time, your quantum model, I mean, your AI model can be uh, uh, can be taught in various global languages. So that is the one, one huge cases we are showing here uh, for quantum AI. So the quantum uh, chip learns about 63% faster than classical computer and quantum me uh, mechanics makes the system a linear and few step. AI algorithms can optimize the fine tuning and quantum circuits. For <clears throat> so uh, uh, quantum and AI will converge in what is called quantum advanced intelligence. This is another uh, trend which is emerging. Their combined power will literally transform everything about life, society, economics, and business. QI will also converge mobility, robotics, internet of things and virtual. Okay, so and there are so many huge cases written here. I'll just move ahead. Uh, I will come towards the blockchain, you know, quantum blockchain. You know, this is another important area. So like uh, AI blockchain is also very uh, uh, computing resource hungry. You know, uh, for a cryptocurrency mining, you need to run uh, the mining queries uh, you know, in thousands and thousands of uh, blockchain nodes. So which requires means a lot of power consumption if classical computing use. So, and, and it takes a lot of time to mine the uh, crypto uh, or, or you can say Bitcoin information. So uh, there the quantum computing can be utilized. So that is wherever the quantum computing is implied for blockchain application, it is called quantum blockchain. So the combination of computing and blockchain technology come to an end quantum lecture, like classical blockchain, quantum blockchains are decentralized encrypted ledger and how well a classical D network could be based on quantum computation. So uh, 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 another thing which we have to know that uh, blockchain is getting, uh, people say blockchain is getting threatened from quantum computer. Why I see other way? Of course, you can uh, make your blockchain uh, on classical uh, computing a uh, quantum resistance. But, but uh, the thing is you can further uh, encrypt your uh, blockchain applications uh, with the quantum algorithms, you know? So it will be become tougher to break the uh, security feature of your uh, blockchain application for that matter, AI application for that matter, metaverse applications. 
So um, if you see quantum computing and blockchains may not necessarily be, that's what we are saying. We, they are not enemy to each other, rather they are complementing. Some researcher believe that a quantum computing and blockchain technology will end up the merging. This could create more secure, faster potential and revolutionary computing solution that could end up helping to solve variety of both cryptography and real world something. So that's what there, there is a conversance. Instead of rivalry, there is a conversion between quantum and blockchain technology. You know, so that's the, the slide one to, uh, in, in this slide we are highlighting. So major concern is that quantum computers could overpower blockchain encryption. So this concern is already going on. I discussed about that leading the end of secure cryptocurrency, as we know, the quantum encryption can powerful. But one of the study of Deloitte showed 25% of Bitcoin could be stolen in one attack. As of January 2020, that world would amount about 300 billion US dollar, uh, the, the cryptocurrency, you know, if even 25% of it can be broken. So uh, you, you can imagine uh, the, its impact. So now with this, I will come towards uh, uh, quantum uh, resistance ledger, and then I quickly talk about quantum rupees. So we we all know that in India, CBDC uh, implementation is going by Reserve Bank of India. So whether it is possible to uh, uh, drive the uh, quantum rupees instead of digital rupees. So we are talking about digital rupee or e rupees implementation. Now here are my thoughts. The digital rupees pilot launched by Reserve Bank of India, RBI, is certainly going to boost digital economy of India and going to regularize rapidly growing digital payment markets. However, it is also a time for envisioning digital to quantum shift, which is inevitable sooner or later. Hence, India should have a vision for quantum rupee beyond presently piloted digital rupee. You know, so here are further uh, insights, a closure analysis of RBI concept note on central uh, bank uh, uh, <clears throat> digital currency reveals that quantum tech is just treated as a cyber security threat. That's what I was talking, you know, many people believe is a threat to the cyber security while rolling out e-rupees, that is digital rupees pilot. However, large innovation potential of fast emerging quantum computing technology yet to be explored for uh, digital rupee projects. While presenting this year, Indian budget in 2022, 20, February, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman talked about introduction of blockchain-based digital rupee by the Reserve Bank of India. But in the present RBI concept note on CBDC, DLT, that is distributed ledger technology, being considered as a barrier due to higher computing resources requirements uh, for implementing blockchain-based uh, CBDC. While it appears a true constraint considering the fact that present-day classical computing technology may not support massive blockchain-based uh, uh, digital rupees financial transaction, but the power of quantum computing is well suited for conducting billions and billions of financial transactions over widely spread blockchain nodes. So what are the concluding remarks here in as far as the CBDC is concerned? At present, proposed retail CBDC, which is going under pilot, uh, is going to be form of digital uh, uh, <coughs> digital tokens, which essentially mean digital form of rupees to be stored in electronic devices based on semiconductor chips, which operates on bits and bytes. However, quantum rupee is likely to be implemented by using natural quantum states of the atoms in form of qubits, which shall be more energy efficient as required lesser power to hold its quantum state and contains more information on a qubit. With the power of quantum computers, it is even possible to operate direct mode of CBDC removing many intermediates of traditional currency supply chain, giving highly productive, cost-effective and efficient current, uh, currency supply chain and distribution. Five-level research believes that it's time for reimagining currency supply chain and distribution globally, and just not for existing internet and e-commerce ecosystem, but also for the upcoming qu quantum computing and quantum internet and metaverse-based virtual ecosystem. I think uh, after that, there are some sl slides here which links the quantum computing uh, I, uh, we call with the metaverse, we call the quantum metaverse. I'll just walk you through uh, you. I will, what I'll do, I will upload the, these slides, uh, you know, and then uh, we, you can go through it. Uh, there, uh, there is the, the last slide, it's called Quantum Power Web 3.0, how the quantum computing will slice the Web 3.0. So with this thought, I coming towards the end of this, my presentation, and uh, here my contact details are given if you have any query. You can please uh, let me know right now. You can write me in my mail ID also given me here, sumant underscore parimal at the rate inogris.com. Sorry for oversitting my time, uh, you know, because these are the topic which require some, some inside discussion. That's what I, uh, it oversuit some time, but I really, again, like to thank uh, WLS for providing me this opportunity. Thank you and over to 
Arijit. Thank you so much, Samantha. If you could just stop sharing your screen, then we can see your face. That'd be amazing. Um, oops, that's your timer. Please, co please connect with each other and please share your details. The one thing World Leaders Summit actually loves is people connecting. So we feel we are that super connecting force. Um, so please connect with one another from all around the world. You don't often meet people from different areas or different parts of your own country, let alone different ends of the world. So please do connect, say what you do, say what type of thing you're looking for and somebody within the chat or that's listening might actually be that person that can help you elevate your business and your dreams. Um, we are going to move on to the next speaker just to keep things within the time um, restraint. I've got Jim, Jim, are you ready? Can you hear me? I sure can, yeah. Fantastic, I'm gonna hand you over the mic and um, yeah. I should give you a wave halfway through. Thanks so much. Very good. I will quickly share my screen and get right into the content for today, okay? Let's see if I can get that to... happen. Are you able to see the screen, everybody? You can see that, fantastic. You can see it? Yep. All right, perfect. All right, yeah, a little bit about me. I am a consultant and uh, a leadership coach. I've recognized by a lot of different places for my work in leadership, culture, strategy, and future of work. I'm here today to really talk about uh, the differences between leadership and management. In fact, an earlier speaker, uh, Jessica, mentioned that there was definitely a difference, and I am uh, full in full agreement with her about that. Um, I've got 10 differences that I wanted to talk about. I'm not sure if we'll get through them all, but I'm going to try to stick to the time and we'll get through as many as we can. The first one is leadership inspires change and management manages transformation. And I'm not going to read the bullets. If you want to sort of take a look at those as I talk, that'd be great. But when you think about this one, maybe think about Richard Branson. He's one of those kinds of leaders that really doesn't get into the weeds. He prefers instead to define a goal and then let his team have at it. And it's a concept that he calls talking ahead of yourself. So he's probably a really good example of a leader that practices this particular difference. Um, another one is leadership requires vision and management requires tenacity. And when I think about this one, I think about whether you love him or hate him, I, it's Elon Musk. Uh, you know, he's one of those visionary leaders that inspires people to follow him and you know look what he did with spacex um again kind of a remarkable uh leader in in that his vision sort of defines the destination and then he has his management team working uh you know religiously to get there a third one is leadership requires imagination and management requires specifics and it's really um a prodigious leader that can inform their ideas and provide sort of a compelling vision and then make their companies and their organizations indispensable. And when I say indispensable, I'm talking about being the, the pref preferred uh, uh, provider of choice in your marketplaces. And when I think about this, I think about a guy named Troy Clark who, is a recently retired president and CEO of Navistar International. Uh, he was the guy that recognized that their brand international truck was really starting to fall behind the competitors. And what he ended up doing was he crafted something that he called the vision 2025. And it was in there that he placed an emphasis on product reliability and, and the whole customer experience. And lo and behold, here we are in 2022 and that vision still uh, holds up and the business is back on track. Um, another difference is leadership requires abstract thinking and the management requires concrete data. And I actually posted something on LinkedIn yesterday on this one. 
Uh, when I think about leaders that practice this kind of thing, I, I think about maybe someone like Steve Jobs, who had the the vision and, and the ability to think a little differently when he started to come up with products that like the iPhone that combined a phone with a music player, with a camera, with computer access. You know, that that certainly was taking disparate technologies, plugging them together and creating something wholly new. So a good example of that type of leader might be someone like Jobs. Another one is leaders understand the external environment and managers understand how work gets done inside the company. So there's a key difference there. Leaders looking outside and kind of seeing what's going on in the greater marketplace and managers are figuring out how to get things done inside the business. And a good example for me on this one is um, Reed Hastings, the co-founder and chairman CEO of Netflix. Uh, he he kind of had that ability to look outside, see that rental uh, places, the brick and mortar sort of uh, uh, stores and so on were a difficult customer experience for some people sometimes didn't want to go to this to blockbuster and check something out and find that it wasn't available and have to come back the next day etc cetera, etc cetera. so he came up with the whole notion of being able to first use mailings to be able to get get it and then obviously when streaming technology took a hold they were right there to to drive that wave so again a good example of a leader that was looking outside and obviously surrounded himself with an incredible management team that uh, helped him get things done. Uh, another one here is a leader requires ability to articulate, management requires ability to interpret. And what that means is a leader's defining where we're going and a manager has to figure out what that means and translate it into something that their teams can actually understand and act upon. And a good example of this is a recently returning CEO of Disney, uh, Bob Iger, and how he made a commitment uh, back in February of 2019 to get something called Disney Plus off the ground. And we all know that that's uh, become a, a real success. And in fact, you know, as the company started to struggle a little bit um, just in the in the past few months uh, the board brought Bob back to to drive the company uh, through this challenging time so again good good example of a guy that was able to define a destination and then make sure that the team was there to to help uh, get there one more here and this is you know, around aptitude we, you know leaders require an aptitude to sell and managers require an aptitude to teach and again it's something that i talk about quite a bit some of my work on with the folks that i coach when i think about an example of the ability to sell i think about someone like zuckerberg who took facebook where he's taken it you know and his I, idea was really hatched in the dorm room in harvard uh way back in 2004 and to look at it today it's hard to believe that that had such uh, modest beginnings um so again the ability to sell and the ability to teach teach are really two distinct skills that, that organizations need and then this one's i don't know one of the more interesting ones in my mind and it's around leadership requiring the ability to take some risk and management requiring the ability to have self-discipline so you know leaders got to take educated guesses and managers got to be able to sort of stick with the plan as defined by their top leaders when i think about risk taking i think about sarah blakely she's the founder of spanx uh you know she really bootstrapped that business from her own savings and now it's this huge conglomerate just uh, again amazing success story but it, it took some risk taking on her part to build that business and then sort of the next to last one if you will i know we're rushing through this but you know leadership requires confidence in the face of uncertainty management requires commitment to completing the task at hand so again 
you know, leaders are always uh, having to set a course for their company in uncharted waters. When I think about this, a type of uh, characteristic in a leader, I think about Jeff Bezos. Uh, he's got tenacity and confidence. And, you know, it took, you know, many years for Amazon to finally turn a profit. And now look at it. It's just, again, an amazing business and one that a lot of people, at least in the United States, can't imagine living without. And then the last one, this is the one you've all been waiting for, the very last <laughs> example. And that's that leadership uh, requires, you know, accountability to the organization. Management requires uh, accountability to the team. Um, I think we need both. Uh, clearly, you need good leaders, you need good managers to, to be successful. And, um, you know, it's one of those those things that is a distinct difference, but one that is a, an important one to make in our minds as we think about the, the differences between leaders and managers. I think the best leaders, will, you know, lead and they let other people manage. Um, and it's important to understand the differences. If you need to get me, here's some of the ways to do it. Probably the best is the email, and that's Jim at indispensable-consulting.com. And with that, I will stop sharing if I can figure out how to do that. <laughs> okay. How did I do with time? Did I catch us up? You still have a couple of minutes. So okay, perfect. Great. So any closing remarks or statements you wanted to make? No, not really. You know, I invite folks to reach out and follow me on LinkedIn. And I'm, I'm always posting there and trying to provide some leadership ideas and tips and so on. So you can look forward to that if you're interested in more on this kind of, kind of topic. You have a radio voice, Jim. I'm sure you've been told that before. It's a very relaxing, calming voice. Well, Nina, you know, thank you for that. What I've been told is I have a face for radio. I don't know what that means. Exactly. <laughs> I think that's something we should maybe explore. What do you think, Arjit? Uh, World Leader Summit radio station sounds a good thing to me. Brilliant. That's a brilliant concept. I think we should start. Welcome the new speakers that have come on stage. Thank you again, Jim. Please do follow Jim on his social media, LinkedIn. And if you've been listening to his leadership um, share, then please follow that. And it's not easy being a leader, I will say. Um, people often look at other people that are doing something and think it's easy, but they've had their own journey. And it's the journey, that process that makes them that to have those leadership qualities. It's not something they just, you know, end up with. It's not something you can buy. You have to actually go through that journey of resilience um, often failing to get yourself to be picked up to get to the end result so if you are going through anything stick in there keep going now stick around with this Jim if we have any questions I'll ask Garage. do we have any questions we have actually five so but for the sake of time can we skip it and send it to Jim directly uh, these are very long questions that I can See, amazing in fact, you've obviously made in fact, for, in fact for sumant also we got questions like uh, uh can you explain superposition and uh, i mean it's a it's a long question about quantum computing then we have <laughs> a question for our gym as well but because we are running a little bit of behind time so i will request nina to take our next speaker um there's a situation about the next speaker before she comes uh, on the stage i hope that maria is there with us Maya got a bad help, but she is brave <laughs> enough to come yeah. and speak. So, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much, Arajit, for giving me this opportunity for this World Leader Summit. And thank you, Nina, uh, listening to us and commenting whatever we are sharing our experiences. So, I won't take much because most of my fellow speakers, they have already shared and talked about the leadership a lot. And I was just noting down, down the point and I was just looking at my own points, which I prepared, even though I couldn't prepare this presentation for this discussion, but somehow I was relating with it that all of us have the same idea regarding the leadership. Somehow, more or less, we are on the same uh, stage and the same stage of thinking as well, that how we can you know, cultivate the leadership uh, culture in our organizations and how we can, uh, like engage people, those who are part of the team, according to their expertise and experiences. 
for me being a leadership specialist i would i mean just i would like to quickly give an overview regarding my experience because i'm wearing so many hats at the same time and all of us are doing the same uh, as what we are expected to do actually i'm a leadership uh, specialist because my uh, latest degree is related to leadership development and management i'm a business consultant i am like establishing one community for women entrepreneurs worldwide as well and i'm into a number of other things too so as related to leadership and my topic which is like uh, leads uh, leads to empower and uh, empower to lead basically we are always afraid of one notion probably you would disagree with me that we do not let people to lead us and we do not want them to get empowered probably where some at one point of time we have this fear they probably they will go ahead and they might supersede us and then they will not listen what we are trying to share with them but as a leader if we are confident regarding our strengths which we have learned uh, over the years if we are so sure about the experiences which we have gained and if we are not afraid to share those experiences then we can develop ourselves as a better leader because being a leader it is the integral uh, quality that we should be good listeners and then we should have this capacity to share our vision and if we are confident to share our vision definitely we are able to make a change and we are able to develop the readiness of for the change in our teams as well and being a leader it's important to understand the experiences and expertise of all the team members and that's how we can build upon it and then we can give them a chance to take uh, responsibility as well because leadership also comes with responsibility and accountability at the same time and even my fellow speakers they also mention it that it's also about the experiential learning too so being a leader and all of us must understand this aspect that if we give responsibility to our team members we also let them to take an accountability of that responsibility and we also let them to make the mistake because once we make the mistake definitely we're going to learn about a lot through that mistake and, and experiences which we gain through that mistake uh in one of my interviews with with one of my researchers i did uh with few leaders those were all established and i asked them categorically that how do you uh make uh, how do you put the mistake as a significant part of the leadership journey and most of them said it very categorically that through the mistake we learn because it, it doesn't remain a mistake anymore it becomes your experience which you learn over the years and definitely we all have this capacity to review our practices keep on learning keep on reviewing and uh, how we can you know uh, take it ahead and if we talk about something related to decision making and conflict management which is another aspect and trait of a leadership then definitely the leaders they have this kind of charismatic personality and people they look up to them but being a good leader when you are in certain situation you have to take your team on board you with you because when you're sharing your vision it does not remain your own vision only it remain it becomes a team vision when you share with your team members and when there is a conflict management definitely there's a decision has to be taken care of then you have you should involve we should involve our team members and should take their uh, like uh, like consent their opinions because being a leader it is important to understand what their point of view is all about give them acknowledgments if they recognize it and then definitely we can come up with better uh, mutual decision making as well so uh, as far as my topic again i come back to it that uh, lead to empower empower to lead because being a leader it's important and there's a very thin line among three definitions of leadership management and administration and we can see that it might be a situational leadership too because leadership has different styles different ways to deal with and we can't stick to one style only but the point is this that when we act differently into different situation that the leadership is all about a leader could be a manager at the same time or a leader could be an administrator at the same time so it doesn't mean that we cannot switch our roles but it depends that how we deal with it and how we can take in care of that situation accordingly and how we acknowledge it because it's not about you know taking a right decision or a wrong decision it's about how you deal the situation with and if you have experience and if you have that capacity to listen 
and open to learn and giving opportunity to other people to excel according to their expertise and experiences, then definitely we all of us can become better leaders. Because I believe that all of us are leaders in our capacities and our domains and and being a leader, we have to develop more leaders. It's about sharing your knowledge because we believe, as a human being, we believe that the water, when it flows, it shares different kinds of experiences. In, and if it remains stationary, it becomes stinky. So it's better to share knowledge and let people understand their capacities too. And uh, we have to work, being a leader, we have to work on the interpersonal skills, which are related to us and intrapersonal skills, which are related to other people as well. And how we respond to their uh, skill sets, their experiences, and how we engage our team members uh, in the team building and how we can, you know, make them and ensure them that their opinion, their consent, their experiences, they do really matter and they are being acknowledged in uh, their particular way. Probably I managed it through without coughing for that whole time. If you have any question, you are like open to share with me and then I can share my LinkedIn profile. I would love to connect with all of you and definitely we can do a lot. And as far as my that community, which I'm establishing at the moment with the name Womanpreneur, and it is also a part of my PhD research, which I am like writing a synopsis at the moment, which is related to strategic consultancy and management. And the aim of this community is also to empower female entrepreneurs and business owners so that they can place themselves as a brand. Because somewhere we need this kind of a push in our life, we need kind of a motivation in our life. So somebody should be there to listen to us, to acknowledge us and do motivate us and support us in so many ways. Because one of our fellow speaker, he mentioned about the TQ, positive quotient. All of us talk about the emotional quotient as well, but this is something new for me to learn as well. The positive quotient is another kind of a terminology which we need to understand and practice in our lives too, either professional lives or personal lives as well. So that community is also be having a vision of empowering female entrepreneurs and make them understand that they are leaders in their capacity and how they can execute their leadership while developing their businesses and while uh, like uh, putting a strategy for team building activities as well. And in the end, obviously, it's going to make their business grow and they, it could generate more revenues for the company as well, which is going to benefit everybody in it. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, yeah, thank you also for sharing up because you're not feeling well. That's a real leadership quality in itself. And we respect you for that, you know, World Leader Summit. We have a lot of speakers that can't make it because of technical issues and all sorts. But, you know, I, I want to applaud you for coming and, you know, making the points that you made about leadership, that leadership's not always so visible. Um, often we're leading in the background. Um, I'm actually an activist. I speak out against honor killings and human trafficking, and you won't really see me leading that thing, but um, I have a nonprofit and in the background, we do a lot of work. You know, I'm always mm. doing something in the background and being a leader doesn't mean you'll have an ego or that you want to be seen. It's because you're doing the right thing by what you believe. So being a leader in the respect that you've covered, I really felt was a really simplified, but very important way for people to receive that. And I'm sure amongst all of the other people here on the World Leader Summit, they would be in agreement with that. But thank you again for attending. If we have any questions for you, I know Arajit will be emailing them or sending them or adding them into the chat here for you. Um, I'm sure a lot of people that are listening connected with what you were saying um, and equally are happy that you did turn up today. So thank you for that. Without thank you so any much, Nina and Arajit, for having me then. Thank you so much. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Um, so without further ado, just to keep things moving on the World Leader Summit, I want to thank you all to the new speakers for coming. Please ping in your family and friends, let them know that you are talking so they can watch you, support you, and also share these important messages that are coming through from world leaders all over the world. We're going to go to Mohammed Bilal next. Um, are you there? Can you hear me? Um, yep, I'm over here. Thank you so much. I'm going to leave it with you and um, I'm looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. Thank you. Sure. Um, I'll just jump in right in, keeping time in context.
So the topic that I selected uh, for uh, uh, this panel was uh, hardware startups, the sustainable future. And what do I mean by hardware startups? The startup uh, spree has been going on for the last almost uh, five years and it has caught uh, quite a substantial fire and everybody wants to be a part of it. And coming from a background of software, I moved and switched towards the hardware element of things. So just to keep in context, um, if we look at the unicorn hype that started up around five years back, um, there was just one unicorn uh, that was uh, uh, in the world in regards to a, a hardware as compared to other software startups. Now, as of today, there are 200 plus you know, unicorns that exist in the world. And where we can see that approximately 18 of them are unicorns that are valued at $1 billion. So if you look at a cup, uh, this map that you can see on the screen, if you look at Peloton, those, uh, that is one of the startup that is spinning bikes where that is producing, selling spinning bikes with videos. And then we've got Proteus uh, in the US sector as well, which is uh, selling digestible uh, sensors uh, for medical purposes. And one of uh, the startups that is view is uh, very interesting because it's selling dynamic windows for buildings as well. As you can see, China has been the main center of it. And Sigfox is one of uh, the startups which is trying to establish, dominate the IoT market. So when I talk about internet of things, uh, what do I mean by that? And spe specifically when we're uh, targeting hardware startups, IoT is the mainstream future because it's becoming a multi-billion dollar more than $800 billion industry in the future. So IoT is just software and hardware merged together. To simplify, to simplify the whole context, um, how I started my whole IoT uh, company in that regards, that would be very simple for people to understand, to give a hands-on right uh, experience. Um, I believe the text is small, so I'm just gonna zoom out and uh, kind of uh, move into this image. Uh, this is an article that I published on Hackernoon. It's available over there as well. So the starting uh, started up with the urge and the ego in the context. There was self-worth and the ability for con contribution and as well as self-recognition as well. This added up with profit. And what I did was I started researching similar products that I wanted to do. I checked Amazon is a great website right now in which you've got a series of products that are available. And what you can do is you can just take up a product and see what are the competitors of that product. And then you have customer feedback, the engine, the review engine is very much useful in creating new products. So how this helps in, let's suppose you select a product, you look at the customer review and see what are the people complaining in that uh, specific product. And what the complaints are right over there are the hacks and fixes. You repeat this process and what you have is a new product. And once you have a new product, where do you go for? How do you find the market in that regards? So first of all, social media is definitely over there. Secondly, tech conferences. Um, uh, before the COVID came in, uh, moving uh, towards the internet of uh, moving towards the internet and everybody going online, um, the traditional style of marketing was quite much challenged in that manner. But as the COVID restrictions went down, um, I just felt that once I attended a couple of content, uh, uh, conferences like Jitex for the last two years you know, there's a still a physical interaction right over there. Um, all those people that, are, that have the money to invest in you or in your company, they are still uh, aged above 50 plus or 60 plus. Now, these people, for them to understand technology and even sometimes use LinkedIn or social media, it's very hard. So what they do, they pick up their bags, they go to these tech conferences. And if you have a stall and you're exhibiting over there, that's how you find the money that you're looking for. So coming back to the IoT aspect, um, this is a small diagram I cooked up just to make things understand that uh, when you look on the internet and you uh, kind of uh, cross compare uh, that whether I should start up with a software startup or a hardware startup, there's a lot of uh, um, bias towards software startups in that manner that hardware startup is very hard. But as uh, I think it was, it was true for the, uh, since 2010, I mean, 10 years back, it would have been way truer than that because having access to such things was very hard. But as of today, um, the whole globalization has given access to a lot of things. 
So if I look at uh, the hardware element of things, the right side of my map includes everything that a software startup would require for it to be completely scalable and in that manner. And on the left-hand side, if I just add in hardware on top of it, there are so many dev kits available online, which are easy for you to access. And YouTube is filled up with content that you can self-learn. For us, um, my background as, uh, as an electrical engineering, four years of education and what the content is currently available on YouTube, the time for you to learn anything has been reduced down to a couple of hours rather than years of it. And over here with hardware, talking about Arduino, that is the perfect, uh, that is your best friend. Arduino is like a framework that helps you easily control hardware. So if you Google that up, it's very much available over there. So I think finding a dev kit is much, very much easier. You get affiliated with Arduino and what you have is a prototype. And the prototype there, the prototype over there is on the breadboard. And finally, there are so many uh, universities that are catering to electrical engineering projects and that you can see. So they just get stuck over there in that context. But moving from a prototype to a product stage is what is very crucial. And this is something that I've seen that universities, specifically in my area, they lack for you to understand how you can take a prototype and convert it into a product that the other person can consume. So I think uh, this piece of software right over there, it's called Autodesk Eagle. It helps you manufacture, convert that uh, uh, breadboard circuit into an actual PCB. And contenders like JLC PCB online, you can easily just post in an order and you will have the complete fabrication process and the PCB in your hand. So moving forward, 3D printing has kicking off and getting an enclosure design right over there, it's very much easy. And this is how I was able to produce the first uh, product for my company that got accepted and it's moving on in the, in the market. So based on the software side of things, the traditional methodology uh, for uh, moving forward was using your spinning up your own servers, but cloud and Amazon, AWS, it has taken up of this over the space. And if I talk about software, a lot of people that I've uh, um, talked to and I have taught, they uh, very much complain that there are so many programming languages out there. And for you to absorb all those languages, that's going to be a big issue. But with the hybridization and uh, cross-platform access of apps, uh, a lot of frameworks now exist. In my case, like Angular and Node.js, that you can just program the complete mobile application architecture in one single language. So if I talk about my company, my complete company is just using two languages, C++ and JavaScript to manage everything. So coming back to um, the context of the slide, um, who am I? Um, I'm the founder of a company uh, known as Breathe.io. My qualification is uh, I'm a postgraduate in AIML from the University of Texas, Austin. 10 plus years of uh, complete full stack hardware and software engineering, author of two books, and rest of the details uh, are online. So keeping in context, the time and everything, um, that's my presentation. And if there are any questions in regarding to IoT, I think uh, you can just post in or just reach me on LinkedIn and I will definitely give my level best to help you out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Um, that was a great presentation, very informative. And if anybody does need to contact him, please, you know, as he said, reach out to him on LinkedIn. Any questions will be forwarded to you if any viewers are watching and they're raising questions with Arijit, because of time, we're not going to repeat them. But Arijit wants a quick word. Yeah, I guess uh, uh, it's an important question that you have got, uh, to be very, very honest, uh, at least from the chat that we have received. Uh, Bilal, when we look at uh, entire Asia, the combination of software and hardware, somehow the match is not happening on the product level. The question that came, is how can you ensure to have a proper software solution company which can have a hardware product company as a partner? Your takes on it. Um, I think uh, it comes down to the base level of communication um, because uh, um, like I'm from Pakistan and uh, we need to create in more bonds. We need to understand, we need to stop having transactional relationships with others. You know, every time we tend to meet somebody, it's always like, how can I take out benefit from the other guy? Uh, we need to start thinking on the lines that how we can benefit the other person without any transaction in between. Because that, that enables us to establish a bond. 
a very emotional level of bond in which uh, uh, every time somebody wants to help you back it's like uh, it's like this urge of uh, you know paying back for something that's just natural to you so i think uh, uh, with the software companies they need to go to universities um pick up student projects help them uh, convert those prototypes into products and give them the platform because uh, it's the students in our universities with their fips final year projects um they require our support and uh, uh, come on we're, we're creating students more and more and we don't have the companies to support their job structure how it's going to work so we need to create more and more of these uh, companies so that they can fulfill the unemployment in that manner um, i hope that answers the question and if there's anything other in detail i can obviously available at linkedin thank you thank you so much and without further ado we're going to introduce the next speaker um we have right we're going to go over to ron ron is that how i pronounce your name from america to ronay Hi. Ronnie, yeah, I was just about to say it's either Ron or Ronnie. Lovely, you look beautiful, by the way. So we're going to go over to Ronnie. Um, we are waiting for Natalia to get her slides and everything ready, but we will go to her shortly. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing your speech today. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Nice to see all of you, and happy to be a part of, um, you know, the World Leaders Summit and. I am doing what everybody has been trying to do, which is to share my screen. And for some reason, it is not working. So I am going to tell you just in a few moments about um, blockchain. I know that this is a leader summit, a world leader summit. And I know that speakers before me have talked a great deal about leadership. One of the things I want to share with you guys, I'm sure you've heard before, a boss has the title, a leader has the people. And I think as leaders from various countries around the world, you can have the title and boast with your title. But if you don't have the people, if you're not connected with the people, if you're not um, enhancing people's lives, then the title really means nothing. You must be a leader. We must be leaders that are connected with the people. Um, I'm going to talk about blockchain and I am not understanding why, okay, perhaps because I haven't pressed the share button. Hello, Rone, wake up. Okay, let me get the share button going here. I am a individual who has lived in more than 40 countries around the world. I speak a few languages. Uh, Arabic is not one of them, although I'm trying to learn it. And as I was living around the world, I was living as a speaker and learning about other countries, other cultures, other cuisines, and really being developed as a leader at that time in my life. For me, blockchain is the major platform of the new world order and where we're going. I'm the founder and CEO of Excel Crypto Partners, and Excel Crypto Partners Identity Council. If I had to say that I am an expert or an authority on anything, one word I would say people. When I started Excel Crypto Partners a few years ago, a few years ago, I had a passion for the unbanked. I'm going to talk briefly about blockchain and understanding blockchain the technology that really makes cryptocurrency possible. A lot of people, I'm fairly well known. I, I'm a bit of a public figure. I put out a lot of content. I would like to say that my content is valuable, adds value, blesses people, honors people, 
and enlightens people. I believe that my mantra is to touch, heal, and inspire. I do that in a plethora of ways, one of which is what I'm doing now, speaking in online summits, speaking on stages. I've done that for years. It's in my DNA. My father was a pastor. My mother is a retired educator. So using my words is a gift. It's a part of my blood, or as I said, my DNA. I'm often asked, what is blockchain? Now, some of you may not be old enough to remember a ledger or what a ledger is, but there was a time when there were no computers, no Microsoft, but there were typewriters when accountants would use a book, a ledger to record everything that they were doing financially. It was the way to keep the record. The problem with that was that it could easily be deleted. It could be whited out. It could be manipulated. It could be changed. Years later, pressed to now, we have blockchain. Blockchain has the power to not manipulate life, but to manage and to measure life. At the end of my presentation, I will show you some of the areas where blockchain is doing just that. I want to get a little personal without to go on the deep end. I'm sure you know that Bitcoin was started or launched January 2009, but the white paper came out October 31st, 2008. Do you remember what happened in 2008? There was a man named Richard Madoff who made off with millions in the United States. It was a Ponzi scheme. He's deceased now. He went to prison. And if I'm correct, he died in prison. At that time, I had just, if you will, overcome being a victim of a Ponzi scheme a few years prior to that. I lost $700,000. Well, bloody hell, would you believe that that $700,000 I lost to a very dear friend of mine who was an investment banker? To put it bluntly, I got, I got stripped and I lost everything. I lost my home. I lost my car. I lost my passport. I lost all my clothes. I lost my career. I lost my contracts. I lost everything. Now, while I may come from a family uh, of nobility of sorts, I didn't call my father who was alive at the time, my mother who is still alive to say, guess what? I'm homeless on the streets. Would you believe I was homeless for one year, nine months, living on the streets in a foreign country where I knew people, but they were as poor as I was at the time. I knew NGOs. I knew executives, I knew people who had money, but I said nothing. I knew that to get to where I am now, I had to go through that particular point. I eventually rose out of that state because of one woman. Believe in the power of one. This is the reason I say you have nothing without people. My father used to say, man believes in counting numbers, but God believes in making numbers count. I'm conveying and strongly suggesting to you, make your numbers count. What am I conveying? I'm saying that you may not be an influencer with 2 million or 1.2 million or 50 million or 20,000 or 100,000 followers but you've got 500 and they're bloody faithful to you. They're good to you. Whatever you put out, they support it. Whatever you sell, they buy it. Those are your numbers. That's where you build. Build from the remnants, build from those scraps. And you will find that your foundation will be a lot more stable. Now, moving forward to my slide. At the time when I was told about Bitcoin in 2008, 
I basically told him to go to ATLL. I'm not doing it. I'd already lost a few years prior, over $700,000. I wasn't willing to put $10 into Bitcoin. Do I regret that today? A little bit. But the point that I'm making is that when I learned about Bitcoin, because it was going to be financial, I went to banks. I had already overcome my plight. I was back home in Paris and I was trying to find a way to understand what Bitcoin was all about. When I got my hands on the white paper, I learned what the author, and no one knows who he is or who they are, what they were saying about Bitcoin, how Bitcoin was going to change the world, change people's lives. I'm going to make an offer to you freely at the end of my presentation, because I have taken the Bitcoin white paper and all my years since 2008 of being involved in Bitcoin, I've added on to the Bitcoin white paper and created XL Crypto Partners new blockchain platform. But as I'm conveying here in my, in my slide, blockchain is like that ledger. It's a distributed ledger that can authenticate cryptocurrency. You've heard of stable coins. You've heard of Ethereum, Ether. You've heard of a lot of things as it relates to cryptocurrency and blockchain. But a lot of people are still a little confused or ambivalent about blockchain. Blockchain, like the ledger, but better than the ledger, is an encrypted network and it's used like the ledger to store that encrypted information that has been generated. Look at my picture. Blockchain is a series of blocks. They're all interconnected. Note that all blocks on a blockchain are related to one another. The platform that we are launching in January, it's a new blockchain platform and we are doing exactly that. Connecting people just as blocks on the blockchain are connected. But when you find out what we're doing and how we're doing it, it is absolutely going to amaze you. For the sake of time, I'm going to move on. Blockchain is the backbone of cryptocurrency. You may be investing in cryptocurrency, but if you are not investing in blockchain and putting some research and adding blockchain to your business platform. I don't care if it is a startup or you've had it for years. If you are not involved with Web3, with blockchain, with all of the elements of the ecosystem, you're missing out and you're going to get left behind. Blockchain is and will always be the backbone of cryptocurrency. Now, I'm often asked, as I said, what is blockchain and how do I use it? I've given you seven slight examples of how you can use blockchain in your business. We're using it in these seven ways. And again, at the end, I'm going to make an offer to you. I'm close to the end to hopefully enhance and enlighten your thinking as it relates to blockchain and being leaders, how you can really jumpstart what you're doing as leaders in your own countries. Better yet, I hope you'll join me and our army and force of NGOs to empower, touch heal and inspire the unbanked. Product inventory. Right now, product inventory is done manually. There are some companies out there using blockchain 
creating smart contracts to produce highly effective inventory. Look at Amazon. I've been talking with them. One of the things that they have been sharing with me and even training me and some of my team is how they use their own AWS for product inventory. It would astound you to see how this company has been so effective for so long and why. Legal contracts. Well, if you're going to launch your own token, I would strongly suggest that you do it through Ethereum. If you're not going to do blockchain forking, as my company has done. Okay, what is blockchain forking, Rone? I guess you'll have to connect with me to find out, yeah? But if you're going to launch your own token, do it on Ethereum. It's like a template. It'll be easy and it won't be time consuming, such as creating your own blockchain or expensive as I'm doing. Cloud storage. Well, you can create cloud storage through Google Drive, isn't it? But you can go even deeper than that with cloud storage through your own blockchain. By the way, if you don't know how to do it, that's part of my offer to help you create and to stimulate your business, your business growth, and enhancing the lives of your staff, your employees, your village, and your communities through blockchain. Supply chain communication. That's another area where I'm strong with NGOs in various countries around the world. Supply chains, more than anything and anybody, need blockchain. There are quite a few of them out there. A company organization called Uplink that I work with, they're driving me nuts with all of the work they're throwing on us to help with supply chains and creating blockchain for them. I have a course on learning blockchain. I hope you will take my contact at the end of my slide and become a part of the course and build, build from the remnants and restart, relaunch and explore new possibilities for your business. Electronic voting, highly passionate about that. In the United States where I happen to be at the moment, by the way, I'm French and American, Voting rights, I won't even go into it because that's not the purpose, but electronic voting, United States, if you're listening, you're in for a big surprise. I've got something that I'm headed to the White House with through blockchain for 2024. If Donald Trump thinks, oh yeah, I'm going there. If he thinks he's going to run and win or cheat to win, bye, Bubba, it's over. And then digital IDs, you and may I, have heard. Uh, we are really sorry, but uh, uh, frankly, the time is up and if you can finish and wrap up. Uh, okay, I will <laughs> move my slide down to, okay, uh, dear, dear, dear. I'm trying to get my slide to go down so that I can just get to connect. Okay, electronic voting, all these things, are possible. Healthcare, all these things are possible when you use blockchain. Connect with me. You have the email address there, the website. You can follow me on LinkedIn, Twitter, all platforms, and learn a great deal more about how we're using blockchain and how we can help you to use it as well. Merci beaucoup. Bonne journée. Au revoir. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Sorry to rush you. It's just um, we've got a lot of speakers waiting and we're trying to keep the room moving. But Ronnie has a lot of information to give you. So if you need to find out more, if you're interested in what she was telling you, please reach out to her on LinkedIn, connect, um, and you know where to find her and the knowledge that she can share. And without any further ado, I'm going to keep moving this on to Natalia. Natalia is actually originally from the Ukraine, but now she resides in Dubai. And I'm going to hand over to you, Natalia, for your 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Hello to everyone. And uh, I'm delighted to be in World Leader Summit with you together. Well, I'm Natalia from Ukraine. Um, I have a big experience in, uh, in arts, <laughs> but also in technologies. Technologies, uh, I'm from 2017 when I started one project about 
biometric identification and identification system. It was very interesting and uh, it was in different countries like in, uh, crypto cruises and uh, blockchain assignments in Malta. I meet very nice people and uh, it was like um, I discovering the new world. Well, from 2017, I, I discovered a new world for me and uh, my life it changed. Uh, well, my art became the uh, NFT art, yeah. I'm an NFT artist now, interior designer, scientist in art. And also uh, I practice meditation and um, learn a spiritual school also. For me, it's very uh, close spiritual life and uh, technologies because all talk uh, about the blockchain, about the Bitcoin, about the cryptocurrency, but no, very, very little... Uh, Plenty of people is ready for new technologies because new technologies discover your spiritual life. Because people need to be ready for, for technologies because uh, they need to have patents. Because uh, a lot of people waiting when the market go up, when they have more bitcoins, more crypto, when they uh, they wish to have everything in a in one day, but it's not, it's impossible because uh, the technologies is learn about uh, spirit, yeah? Because we need to grow with technologies together. Yeah, we need to grow, people need to grow with technologies together. Uh, that's uh, mean uh, that uh, technologies discover uh, a lot in our life, like uh, different kinds of styles, different kinds of uh, uh, NFT arts and, uh, new companies and the uh, metaverse web3 so on well uh to understand like, how working those technologies we need to understand ourselves at, at first because all is going from humanity for from humanity design yeah it's our energy and it's very um like it's working uh, in um well it's working together we need to to go to go with technologies patent step by step. My NFT arts, I'm uh, going at first for charity. It was in Malta blockchain summit for worse. And um, I helped a lot of people because I'm philanthropist also. And now uh, my arts in uh, on different platforms like Opensia, everyone knowing, uh, and um, Socos platform, NFT art, in a crypto exchange like Centurion. And uh, I know that everyone in technology can find it because all kinds of uh, specialties can find them in blockchain. Blockchain is uh, the very interesting system which unit uh, our world. That uh, it's showing that uh, people uh, I need to be more, more unit, more uh, friendly with each other. You know, it's um, reflected in our life. All what happening in technology is reflected in our lives, in our world. That's why we need to understand. It's my, uh, like, um, I wish to say that all what happening in technology is happening in our lives now. That's why uh, we need to understand ourselves first after going to to uh, to know more about technologies. And the people needed to adaptation uh, for technologies. Most of people don't know what is it blockchain, what is it crypto, what is it NFT, what is it metaverse, what is it, because they are staying in, um, they're living in, uh, in um, illusion, you know, because uh, we are in blockchain, but a part of people are in material life like it was yesterday. And it's different. And uh, we need to help each other. We need to show it, but uh, how we can can we do it more uh, more interesting? It's with our interactions because just our interactions interactions can show uh, how we can be helpful and how those technologies working. It's very simple, very simple. Like Web three, we can make it in meditation meet meet each other uh, every time in the Web three. It's also we have network. Well, it's reflected. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalia. Um, I'm not sure if we've got any questions, but I know that Arjit, did you want to email them to Natalia? I think I'll email them to Natalia because we have got uh, seven questions in uh, social media, Natalia. 
I know your WhatsApp and we are already connected, so I'll mail it to you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Natalia, for attending and sharing your speech with us about blockchain and NFTs. I think it's a new word that people seem to not understand, so they stay clear from it, but it's forever being thrown in our faces and I understand it. So I would say if you don't understand it, please go to Natalia. You can find her on LinkedIn, um, follow her social media. And you can always contact us here at the World Leader Summit for her details. We will pass them on. I'm going to go on to the next speaker, which is Rajesh. Rajesh, I, are you can there? I, can I have one yeah. before Rajesh? Yeah, just before we start, Rajesh, just going to pass it back to um, Arajit. Give me a second. I'm so sorry to uh, interrupt. Anyone who has got any kind of project, any kind of program, any kind of uh, probably opportunity, which you feel that you want to take it forward with any of uh, any part of the world, feel free to reach to us. We run an accelerator. It's called Co Innovate Ventures. We collaborate with multiple number of companies working with several different revenue stage companies at the moment. So who can say that probably we can connect you with the right kind of partner? And maybe you guys can do some amazing business together. That's a soft message I wanted to give up all of you. So at the end of your speech, if you feel that there is something you want to get or give, please feel free to mention that. We'll be more than happy to take it forward. I'm so sorry for the interruption. Rajesh, the floor is yours. Yeah. No problem. Thank you, Rajesh. Yeah, thank you, Nina. Thank you, Arjit, and thank you, everybody. Uh, good good evening from India. You know, it's it's amazing when you have a set of speakers from diverse and distinguished, you know, industries, domains, but the ultimate objective remains the same of building a very strong future for tomorrow. You know, my name is Rajesh Desai. I'm the co-founder, CEO, and managing director of a company called Lila Tech We are we are a digital payments company based out of India, work globally all over the world, and have been uh, have been instrumental work in working along with the government of India to build a very strong nation or a, rather a very strong digital nation when in, as far as India is concerned. Well, if, if I can set the context uh, of my speech and the tone for my speech, the topic is basically the ever digital uh, growing landscape of India. Um, India has seen a tremendous and a momentous growth of digital payment transactions over the past few years. Uh, digital payment acceptance, the adoption, the infra has seen a rapid growth uh, in the last couple of years. India was always perceived to be a cash country that slowly is changing from that domain to a less cash and probably a cashless uh, country as we move on. I have, I have divided my uh, speech into three different topics or other three different uh, eras. One is basically the past of what India was all about, what it is currently in terms of digital payments and what it is what's the future for digital payments um, as far as India is concerned. The whole world is looking towards India because India is becoming a very strong economy. Right now, it's the fifth strongest economy in the world. The GDP itself is speaking for India as such. You know? The whole world is looking at what India is doing in terms of digital payments. And one of the strong reasons for that, um, for this sharp increase, is the, in, is the exponential growth in the acquiring space as such. Over the years, India has India's payment system has advanced significantly, right from exchanging goods uh, for other goods or rather a barter system. It has gone to cashless, one-click digital transactions. India has gone a very long way. If you look at the statistics of India, data shows that digital payments in India has increased fivefold. That's five times. That is by 33% year-on-year growth during the financial year 21-22. That is a huge, huge growth when you compare to global countries globally. You know, India has seen a massive transformation and an exponential growth in digital payments over the past decade, including the development of cutting edge uh, payment systems and a very progressive change in consumer behavior from cash to digital payments. Of course, the pandemic was one of the reasons. The pandemic may have fueled the transformation uh, to digital payments, but yes, the shift has not happened solely because of this. It is because of the new technologies which have made digital payments more clean, more easy, more seamless, and much more convenient for users to accept and adopt, you know. With personalization, uh, customer convenience, uh, security becoming, the, becoming key drivers of success in the digital era, banks and non-banking institutions are rapidly adopting the offerings offered by FinTech Spaces. As a result, people are getting more, more comfortable when it comes to digital payments. 
look at UPI, for example, UPI, Unified, Unified Payment Interface. You know, Lyra as an organization is doing it in India for UPI. It has been a player which has taken UPI outside the Indian boundaries. It has taken UPI to France and to Europe. Uh, you know, so UPI has been a revolutionary product when it comes to digital payments in the payments payment ecosystem in India. It has gone a long way in making digital payments a habit and firmly placing India on the track towards a very cashless or a strong cashless economy. Uh, if you look at statistics, just in the month of August 2022, 364 banks were live on the UPI interface. 6.58 billion uh, transactions, financial transactions went live on the were live on the UPI interface, which amounted to a total uh, transaction value of 10.73 lakh crores. Phenomenal, isn't it? So as you look at as you look at the future, internet, innovation, inventions, these are bringing the world closer. You know. A growing requirement for instant, uh, transparent cross-border payments is is cropping up. Several global companies are leading the innovation and working towards leveraging global payments uh, that will transform completely uh, the global payment arena and improvise the digital payments landscape in the in the in the years to follow. Um, uh, Debotization, de of course, has played a phenomenal role when it came when it comes to uh, the payment system in India. The Indian government, of course, besides the demortization, besides the, uh, the pandemic, you know, the Indian government is strongly supporting and has been a big contributor to the digital push in India. You know, if you look at 21-22 union budget, the Indian government announced a huge sum of 1,500 crore Indian rupees to boost the digital payment sector in India. Now, one more notable uh, boosting factor which comes from mind uh, for digital payments is the initiatives is initiatives pioneering financial inclusion and facilitation of banking services to the unbanked community india's players i mean digital payment players india's government is looking at that market the tier 3 tier 4 tier 5 market which is the unbanked market and trying to bank the unbanked you know it is not only accelerating india's social progress but is also economically driving economics, the, the economic progress of the country. Today, there's no doubt the digital payments landscape in India has transformed phenomenally. You know, complementing the efforts of the government, uh, the, uh, the people, the, the, the people who adopted it, the people who have accepted it, like the merchants, the e-merchants who have accepted it. You know, the people of India, if you look at, if you look at, have displayed strongly a great affinity for embracing new technologies. You know, technology has leapfrogged from a normal uh, bank, for, from a normal branchless technology in banks to maybe banking, to maybe mobile banking. So it has gone a long way and people have really adopted that, phenomenally changing the entire landscape of India's digital payment infrastructure. You know, of course, I, I can see that there are many developed countries in the whole world who still are facing problems due to the right due to the inadequate digital infrastructure in those countries, they face problems because it is not geared to accept those amount of load of transactions for transferring money to the citizens' accounts. But India has emerged as a leader in creating digital assets. It can serve as an example to many other countries, developing countries, developed countries, um, to, to, to form a platform where the other countries can look towards India and try and replicate what India has done for its country and for the people of the country. You know, with no, uns with no stone un unturned, India without a doubt is on its way to become a global leader in the arena of digital payment systems. You know, it is definitely going to help it attain the status of one of the most efficient payment markets or efficient digital payment markets in the entire world. Uh, PIDF, uh, the point of sales infra for physical, for digital models. Uh, look at BNPL, what BNPL has revolutionized. That is buy now, pay later. Uh, look at QR payments. It is not present there globally. Look at QR payments. That is a quick response payments. And look at the most recent, the CBDC, that is central bank digital currency. You know, look at the amount of adoption, look amount of innovation India is doing when it comes to this physical payment or this digital payment methods, you know? See, there's just a few examples 
of how India is building its way to become strong, to become a successful digital payment ecosystem globally. Digital payment, of course, has provided businesses to communicate with the customer on various channels. Only channel payment system is a perfect example with such payment systems. You know, a customer can purchase and pay through any medium, such as card, net, I mean, rather net banking, UPI, digital wallets, and I'm sure these payment methods are going to increase as we move on. You know, though India is still in the less cash era, it has moved on from cash era to a less cash era. It is constantly updating regulatory frame, framework, but set, set by the government and strongly supported by the government with the investments in the fintech sector, with the amount of uh, attraction global players are seeing towards India, and with the pension for innovation in India, and the talent which India has, India definitely is on the right path of becoming a, of becoming a cashless economy. Now, there are many reports globally available which forecast the digital payments market to more than triple, that is three times, to $10 trillion in the next five years with non-cash contributions, uh, probably two-thirds, that's 65% of uh, all payments. You know? So as India, as India is one of the largest fintech and the paytech companies, Lyra has seen tremendous trends and fabulous growth of India's transaction or transition to non-cash payments regarding P2P, that is um, the P2M in the transactions. India is currently the fourth, as I said earlier, the fifth world's largest economy with a GDP of dollar uh, 3.5 trillion and India's payment ecosystem is in a very, very strong and good health. Though, of course, much more advancements are indeed needed to ensure the availability of technology, security, safety, infrastructure supporting digital payments and navigating through emerging digital landscape will not be easy as we move on. I'm sure it is one of the golden keys to India's future growth future prosperity as India becomes one of the strongest digital payment player when it comes to strength, when it comes to safety, and when it comes to seamless transactions. So for me, I definitely see India as one of the nations which will keep on strongly growing and strongly and be a strong contributor globally, not just nationally, globally when it comes to digital payments. I'm sure the world is going to learn a lot from what India has done, from what India has transformed in the last few years, from India, what India has offered in the digital payments landscape. I'm sure developed countries, developing countries are going to adopt that. And India is going to be a benchmark or India is going to be a strong, strong benchmark for the other countries to follow. With this, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's the end of my speech. Thank you so much for inviting me here. And thank you so much for uh, being a part of this elite panel. And thank you so much part for, thank you so much to World Leaders Summit as well for having this phenomenal platform where one can come across and you know, present his journey. Thank you so much. Did you want to say anything, Arjay? Uh, yeah, we have questions, but I think for the sake of time, we will skip it. Only one thing that I would love to mention from social media, uh, Mr. Shao is commenting that with a low internet connected country, like in hills, you don't get internet or in maybe distant part of villages, we don't get net. How does it help Indians? We will take all these questions maybe after a uh, couple of speakers are done. We are actually running a little bit of 15 minutes delay. So if it is fine with Rajesh, if you can please stay back with us and uh, we can have this Q&A session. If I can quickly respond to that just in a matter of lines, one line or two. You know, India, of course, has got tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four, tier five cities. You mentioned about villages that is tier three and tier four cities. Internet definitely was weaker in India, but has gone a long, long, long way. You know, India, in, it has reached the uh, villages as well. And with yeah, the thank government... You so much, Mr. Thank you so much, Mr. Desai. Thank you, Rajesh. We're going to ask you to hold on and stay with us. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you so much. Just so that we can keep it moving, because there are speakers and they have other commitments. So I want to thank all the other, the other speakers for being patient with us. We're trying to keep to times, but as you can see, it's not always the easiest because there's a lot of people wanting to ask different people different questions. So if you stay with us, Mr. Rajesh, we will get back to you or Arajit will send you all of the questions that he's been um, contacted with by people that are watching. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nina. Thank you so much. Um, so we are going to swiftly move on to V. Francis John. Hi, thank you so much for being here, Mr. Is it John is your first name or Francis? 
I'm confused. Uh, yeah, so that's a million dollar question. Uh, hi, good evening, everybody. This is John from uh, Dubai, UAE, United Arab Emirates. Uh, uh, I have a very bad voice. I hope you co all could, uh, can you hear me clearly? Uh, okay, great. So I'm having a very bad cold and I've been uh, traveling hectically all over the globe. So uh, invariably I have been uh, not keeping up to my commitments and touching base with everybody. So sorry about that, Arjit. Okay, so uh, John is my name. As you know, back in India, we have the house name first, which is uh, starts with V. And I don't want to pronounce it because it's difficult for me also to pronounce it. Francis is my father's name and John is my name. Okay, so that's how it's in my school, university and in all my uh, certificates and, and, and credentials are like that. So... Um, I basically head uh, startup.com, uh, startup spelled with a Z. Uh, Z, uh, the reason being uh, the, the, the UAE government and Dubai government didn't give us a, a, a registration with a startup as an S-T-A-R-T-U-P. Okay, so that's why it's startup.com. Uh, startup.com is one of its kind, uh, uh, sector agnostic, license agnostic, visa agnostic, uh, 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 incubator accelerator based here in Dubai. It's from the private sector. All the other incubators here based in Dubai are government owned. Uh, it took us quite a long uh, two year odd years to convince the Dubai government uh, that uh, if you want to incubate startups, uh, you need to uh, facilitate the private uh, uh, entrepreneurs who are keen to mentor, coach, guide, support uh, those sort of startups who come up with uh, ideas, thoughts, processes, innovations, inventions, platforms, applications, you name it, anything from the space to the oceans, of course, except for armaments and defense and missiles, uh, we are not allowed to incubate. But anything else from the space to the oceans, we are allowed to incubate. Uh, the government of Dubai has given us a license uh, which allows us to incubate up to 100 startups. Uh, we are we uh, do not take any funds from the government or from uh, associations, corporations or from uh, banks. Uh, our funding is purely from uh, the uh, our personal uh, kitty. Uh, basically, we are uh, four. Uh, the the board consists the startup board consists of four members who are cumulatively from Stanford, Oxford, Harvard, and uh, MIT put together. Uh, that's about two hundred years of pedagogy. So today, I'm going to speak to you all about incubation. Uh, we get we get we get pitches galore from all over the world, uh, right from Estonia, Africa, Ghana, India. Uh, we have tied up with uh, 100 plus of the global uh, organizations, whether it's GIN, that's a global in incubator network, or with the uh, global accelerator network, GAN. Uh, we get pitches of every hue and color of every culture from every culture. They all want to come to Dubai. Um, the reason being, you know, uh, you might be reading it in the papers and you might be reading it online. Uh, incubation um, is the first stepping stone, a platform which allows a co-working space which allows you a license, which gives you the uh, bank account opening facilitation. It gives you all the co the workstation space. It gives you the Wi-Fi. It gives you the meeting rooms. It gives you the conference rooms. It gives you the networks. And it also uh, facilitates in the form of uh, mentors like us who mentor them, coach them, guide them, and support them, uh, and also give the infrastructure. So Incubation uh, in today's date is not just about giving them a workstation space and allowing them to then be incubated and then scaled and then nurtured and then uh, accelerated. But much more than that, there's a day-to-day hand-holding that needs to be done. And this is where uh, people like us uh, come in into the play. Uh, we uh, started, we have just barely 18 months old. And in this 18 months, we onboarded 16 uh, uh, incubatees. Out of the 16 incubators, we are glad to uh, let you know that uh, four of them have received their golden visas, which is a tremendous uh, uh, boost of morale for this entire incubator because uh, uh, there are strict guidelines on the basis of which golden visas are issued here in, in the UAE, um, except for the frontline workers who uh, post the COVID uh, did, during the COVID did yeoman work, so the government has off, off the cuff given to every frontline worker a, a golden visa. But otherwise, there are certain criteria on the basis of which um, golden visas are issued. So a startup to get a golden visa is like it's it's like a it's like a phenomenal achievement for us. Uh, further than that, uh, three of them have crossed their million dollar mark in revenue, which is again for a startup uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment coming from outside of the Dubai. Uh, outside of UAE and then coming and setting up base here and, and within a period of eight months to a year, 
uh, reaching a, a, a milestone of a million dollar mark is itself a very big achievement for a startup, specifically when they are starting new. So we are right now in eight sectors. Uh, we are in travel, tourism, uh, we are in AI, robotics, we are in blockchain, we are in crypto, we are in, uh, we are in uh, e-commerce, we are in reverse logistics, we are in health. So we have these various verticals that we are working on. Yes, of course, we are not uh, proficient in each and every uh, vertical or a, each and every sector. So we are tied up with the global management consultants who, uh, uh, who, are, who are a global body of 2000 plus specialists. Either they are doctorates or PhD holders and, and, and very well versed in their and very well honed into their craft of being able to mentor, coach and guide those subjects which we are not in the loop of. We bring in those uh, individuals to uh, support our startups. So uh, we are uh, directly funded by Mr. Ratan Tata himself at a personal level. Uh, not at the corporate level. I would really like to clarify that point. We are directly funded by uh, Mr. Rishabh Premji, who is Asim Premji's son, uh, who's the who's the chairman. Asim Premji is the chairman of Wipro Group, ex-chairman. And uh, the third the contributor to our platform is uh, uh, Shibu Shibulal, who is the co-founder of Infosys. Uh, plus, we have a whole lot of mentors and guides who, who have come forward. We have identified a few core individuals who have come forward. And uh, we are soon going to be setting up in India, in Kochi, in Smart City. That's a 50,000 square feet hub that's coming up uh, where we'll be onboarding incubates who would be interested. Uh, so incubation is the subject that I would like to let you know, talk to you about. And uh, the reason why I have taken this topic is because specifically speaking, we all are cumulatively, we all are failed entrepreneurs. Okay. So we have tried, tested ourselves and gone through various formats and, 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 and trying to achieve. And when we realized that, okay, it's time that we moved on. Uh, so we decided to uh, at least mentor and coach those startups who are keen on wanting to come and set up your base in Dubai uh, and facilitate them with the infrastructure. That is something which we don't need to fail on because that's just an infrastructure that's a brick and mortar. And mind you, we started at the peak of the COVID time in 2020. Uh, for one year, we were sitting twiddling our thumbs because there was actually it was fully on quarantine. So there was no way we could uh, uh, onboard any incubate. So we were working on towards creating the platform. We are actually working towards creating the virtual platform where we could onboard all and any startup, which is the next generation of uh, incubation, which is called uh, Digital Dubai. Um, which is you could be anywhere in the world and you would like to have a virtual license. You go onto your mobile, you do your biometrics through the camera on the mobile and uh, boxes start opening up. Do you want to be working in a, uh, do you want to be uh, hosted in a co-working space? Do you want a, a real estate uh, office set up to be put up? Do you want a bank account open? Uh, the license can be from any of the zones. Uh, uh, even though at our startup.com, we are, as I said, we are license agnostic. So you could have a license from any zone, from any emirate. You could have a free zone uh, license. You could have an offshore license. You could have a mainland license. Uh, you could still be working at our center. Otherwise, the norm of the land is if you have a mainland license, you can only work in the mainland. If you have an offshore license, you can only work in the offshore. Uh, we are also visa agnostic, which means uh, you could be on a student visa, you could be on a transit visa, you could be on a visit visa, you could be on a tourist visa, you could be on a, a mainland visa, you could be on a free zone visa, but you could still be hosted at our incubator. That's the blanket permission that the Dubai government has given us. So all in all, incubation needs all these facilitations. Uh, it needs the Wi-Fi, it needs a co-working space, it needs a, a direct broadcasting room, it needs a, a direct um, the webcasting room, it needs a direct uh, conference room, it needs all these facilitations uh, apart from the, the small mentoring. Now, how do we mentor? Uh, earlier when we started, we didn't have any of these logistics with us, which is we didn't have a legal team with us. We didn't have a marketing team with us. We didn't have a social media team with us. We didn't have a have a have an admin admin team with us. Slowly, we started bringing in those professionals who had all that experience and expertise and could also take up work outside of the incubator, but also were mentoring hands-on, the incubators whom we were onboarding one by one. So what happened is we are the first of its kind incubator here in Dubai, where you'll see in the incubation center, in the hub of the incubation, you'll have an accountant who's a CA, you have, you have a full audit team, you have a full 
legal team, you have a full marketing team, you have a full social media team who are complementing and who know the trends and who know the skill sets required and on a day-to-day one-on-one contact with all the incubators who are already being one by one being hosted at our center. So what's happening is you're getting a hands-on experience uh, at a very subsidized rate from these professionals who are also doing commercial work outside. But at the same time, they are also mentoring these incubators. So you're getting a whole holistic 360 degree outlook where the incubators do not have to step out, out of the hub. And in this process of what we are doing, we have uh, been approached by the uh, by the Dubai government and uh, they have uh, uh, taken the keen interest of wanting to facilitate us with at the expo site. As you know, the Dubai expo is over and uh, the, the expo uh, pavilions, which are uh, now being vacated, are now being leased out uh, or, or, or are, being, are being restructured or refabricated for um, various, uh, uh, you know, specifically for sustainability or for or for tourism related or or for a few of the countries have retained their uh, their, their their pavilion. So uh, they have given us a space whereby which they want us to tie up with uh, LinkedIn for startups, Google for startups, Meta for startups, SAP for startups, Oracle for startups, IBM for startups, and they want to create this ecosystem whereby which uh, AI can uh, AI startup can speak to a blockchain startup can speak to a robotic startup can communicate with a with a AR VR MR or any of these topics. So and in and around that, which we don't like, but they have also created a system where you have the subways and the McDonald's and the Domino's and you know that, that's what. That's what today's kids want, you know. So even though we don't appreciate that, but uh, in a way we have uh, we have uh, gone ahead with the with the flow plan of how the Dubai government wants to set it up. So uh, we are working on these various modules right now in Dubai, uh, in 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 Kochi, in 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 India, and our third center is coming up in uh, Singapore, uh, hopefully by early uh, next year. So uh, this is in a nutshell uh, what I wanted to speak about. Uh, if there are any questions, queries, clarifications, uh, we have we have tied up already. Let me just give you a brief example. Uh, we have tied up with the India Startup Mission at an, at an official level. We have tied up with Kerala Startup Mission at an official level. We have tied up with Tamil Nadu Startup Mission at an official level. Uh, these are the only three bodies from India uh, that we have uh, gone ahead because being a semi quasi government entity uh, we are certified under you'll see on all our uh, uh, armbands we have certified by under sheikh hamdan innovation incubator we are one of the four uh, seven global incubators that are ratified and certified by his highness the crown prince of dubai sheikh hamdan so we are very privileged as a as an expat that the government of dubai have has given us this facilitation and uh, we want to do our best. This is the legacy that we want to leave for uh, for startups and entrepreneurs who want to come and set up business here. Uh, touch base with me or touch base on info at startup.com. Startup spelled with a Z. Uh, we will do our best to uh, facilitate uh, anybody from any part of the globe. Uh, thank you, Arjee. Thank you, Nina. And uh, if there are any questions you want me to answer, I can do it at the end as they have already uh, uh, decided okay that's a beautiful beautiful presentation i'm a, a jury member for startup india award which is happening uh, from the government itself I'm okay part of uh, multiple different accelerators i do really don't want to uh, go with my own discussion and descriptions uh, but would love to get in touch with you we have our own uh, network of startups as well as investors we'll be more than happy to handshake over to you sure. i think we'll skip the questions because we are actually running yeah, sure. time. yeah i thought so i thought so okay Okay. Yeah, as, as we said, we're going to skip questions. We will email them to you or, you know, if there's time at the end, we're just trying to keep it moving for the speakers. And before I introduce um, Byron, who's the head of Technicolor in India, um, I just wanted to mention as well to remember to follow World Leader Summit, share your details in the chat, share your details when you come online. If you're interested in any of the speakers or what they're providing, or if you agree or have questions, you can connect with them directly via LinkedIn. Remember, the World Leader Summit has two, uh, roughly 2.5 um, subscribers, two and a half million subscribers. So you need to try and, you know, use this facility as you can to really project your message forward. Um, we hold think tanks, we have newsletters, and there's a lot going on behind the scenes where it comes to helping new new companies to get off the, you know, get off there where they're 
the space that they're at. So we're here to help. Right, without any further ado, I will pass it back to Byron. Welcome to the World Leader Summit and I will allow you to give your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and to, to, to meet everyone. I was, I was invited to talk about the future of storytelling and I'll keep it a little bit generic with, with, with a little bit of examples and anecdotes of what's going on. So I'd like to start by just saying that the famous economist John Keynes famously said, in the long run, we are all dead. The good news for this conversation, however, is that we will live on through the stories that we create and tell while we are here. And we are all storytellers. I was listening very carefully to some of the, the conversations before me. And we live in this giant web of stories, that, which is like, I guess, a never ending matrix. And uh, while I heard that, uh, you know, even, even, even the free zones in, in the Middle East are going virtual, but at the same time, I think it's stories that create almost like this fiber optic connection uh, between our hearts and minds uh, and which extends to everyone around us. And uh, I guess when we look at the, this summit, we humans think in stories, right? And we, we try to make sense of the world by telling our stories or interpreting them as we hear them from the others. And it's this uh, most powerful force that, that we deal with. This is how we deal with the world, right? We, we forget, uh, we forget uh, what, what causes our world to change the stories. And as the world's stories change, which is happening now as we look at, you know, whether it's inflation, attrition, Ukraine, uh, everything else, we shape our own story through, through that passage of time. So just a little bit about, uh, you know, Technicolor. About 107 years ago, uh, we brought color to the screen. And I can see that we have uh, numerous colors here in the backdrops that we all are sporting. And that wouldn't have happened if, if, that, if that innovation didn't take place. But technology in, in audiovisual storytelling changes so dramatically that uh, I came to this uh, company only about uh, 13 years, two months, uh, six days, and 10 hours ago, approximately. And in that time, 50% of the services that we had 13 years ago no longer exist. That's how quickly media changes. All of us on this call have got five different phones, at least in the last 10 years, five different computers in the last 10 years, five different television sets in the last five years. And everything in that world of the pixels has changed dramatically. So stories that we see on these devices are this amazing fuel that aids learning, that aids understanding, because they help us to build communities, right? Today, I'm proud to be part of a new community with the folks on this call. And what is the best part of these stories? It's that they help us to see the world through the eyes of other people. We have the pleasure of making around 20 large films and visual effects a year, four animated movies in a year, eight television series. And if I tell you what those are, for example, in this year, uh, most of you would have seen Top Gun Maverick that we did all the visual effects for. And I can tell you Tom Cruise in real life looks a little bit older than he does in that movie. That's a story in itself, right? We've talked about the Elvis movie and I think the actor on that is probably going to be Oscar nominated. When you talk of animation, we do, you know, Kung Fu Panda, we do, you know, Boss Baby, we do Penguins of Madagascar, we're doing, you know, all, all of those kinds of big iconic. We even produce Mickey Mouse every day. So that story is a never ending one, okay? Think about what causes intimacy within our families, with, between our friends, with colleagues, with new friends on this call. It's the first great real connection between two people happens when we exchange something private, when we exchange something personal, when we share something. And I'm going to tell you a few secrets because I'm told that's the secrets. Secrets are the source by which, you know, we remember each other. People forget facts, but they remember stories, right? What do you remember about your younger days? What became part of your story? Through school and holiday and family moments, it's not the facts that you remember so much as the emotional highs and lows and the out of the ordinary incidents which have shaped us. And that is your story. You made it happen and it happened to you. And where I'm headed with that conversation is that basically, the world of stories is becoming very, very personal. 
We today have worked on the last seven movies of Sir Ridley Scott. We work with John Favreau. We've got four Oscars till now. We've got uh, 24 Can Lions since I joined this company. But all of those are stories that we help top flight creators to tell. And that will continue. The big tentpole stuff will continue. But what will change is that all of us are seeing that stories, whether they be movies or television or games, are approaching now this huge prolific volume that we are spoiled for choice, right? There's a paradox that happens when you want to go on a TV set with a remote and you don't know where to start. It's like my CD collection. I had a wall full of CDs. And every time I wanted to hear some music, I didn't know what to hear, right? Because I was paralyzed by that choice on that wall. And I think what, what we are beginning to see is that entertainment and stories actually drive GDP. So if you took up the US or Canada or UK or Germany or Japan or Korea, 2.5% of the GDP of that country comes from storytelling, from media and entertainment. In India, we are about 0.5%, so there's headroom. And therefore, the Prime Minister of India has formed this task force to prom promote animation, visual effects, games, comics. I'm proud to be one of the seven members from the industry on that force. We have a policy that's being authored and will come out in the next one month. And as the leader of the G20 summit, now he wants to have a media summit because he, because he believes, like everybody else, that storytelling of what who we are and what we do is the soft power for a country to take its culture and heritage to the world. And I think that's a that's a really big testimony to what's going to happen. So how how did this exist before, right? It existed in village squares, it existed in community halls. We've always accredited the grandmother for being the person who always passed on traditional stories from generation to generation. But that has changed with something that I call the capital T, which is technology. And I did tell you about how technology, you know, in 1919 brought color to the screen. But what's happened since then is that the world has gone, you know, in a completely different direction, right? It's become very savvy about understanding the tastes of people. It's become very savvy about what should, what should happen using new tools and new technologies and AI and machine learning has dramatically changed everything there. So before, movies were made in front of a camera. Stories were told in front of the camera. Today, it happens inside and substantially behind the camera. So we are seeing today that technology is leveraging millions of data points that can actually pinpoint and help craft a story because it tracks your emotional response to every element of that story arc. And therefore, those innovations are going to drive you know, things that are, are going to head towards more AR, which is already there in marketing, VR, which is there in ed tech, health tech, and every other tech. And no conversation can be complete if I don't use that buzzword, right? I can't leave this call if I don't use the metaverse word, right? So, and, and like everyone, I can safely talk about the metaverse because there's no scientific way you can prove me wrong. <laughs> McKinsey, however, have risked their reputation by stating that the metaverse will generate up to about $5 trillion of value by 2030. And I'm really excited because we'll get a good part of that. But if we hark back to basics, even in this metaverse universe, if you can call it that, the rules of storytelling will not change, except that we will be able to step in and out of the real world and the virtual world, right? You'll be able to get that Dubai virtual visa and also be in the Jebel Ali free zone at the same time. Mm -hmm. And a good story, even in these future paradigms, will have to tick the boxes. So I'll give you the five things that you have to have to make your story. Circum it all C's, by the way. It's simple. It's five C's. Circumstance, curiosity, characters, conversation, conflict. I love the word conflict because, in, you know, if it, if it wasn't conflict, you'd be bored very quickly. And basically, where computer graphics is taking us is in a very different direction. When Fast and Furious 7 was made, and unfortunately, Paul Walker had passed away with 30% of the movie, we had to create Paul Walker for 70% of the movie. When you saw the boy in Jungle Book, everything there was virtual except for the boy. But hang on a second. Disney only had one boy. So for the dangerous scenes, we had to make that boy virtual as well. That's what's happening, right? 
We are handcrafting creatures. We now created on Apple TV with uh, with the voice of the famous uh, Sir David Attenborough, uh, something called prehistoric creatures. Please go to Apple TV and see it tonight. It takes you back 66 million years. And we're now on the second season of that. It's just groundbreaking. So what's happening with stories is it takes, can take you back or it can take you into the future. It can take you to alien worlds. And what happens is that experimentation, also called innovation by a lot of people, is now the norm. Because what we are seeing is that when we create something in, in the virtual world, I don't know if anyone in the call hasn't used a VR headset, but if you have, and if you are looking at this incredibly difficult task of walking on a plank between two buildings 35 stories high in New York, you can tell yourself a hundred times, this is only a VR headset. But I guarantee you that our brains are so fickle that in 10 seconds after you put that headset on, you're lost. You will be petrified even if you are, have a good head for heights. And that's really what's happening. You, you know that games, for example, are the way that stories are most prolifically told today. And that is now a form of entertainment that is likely to be 30, 40, or 50% of all of media across the world. But I have news for you. And the news is games are no longer just games. They are a complete escape from the real world surroundings. If you have a tough job, if you are stuck in the nine to five and you want to release, like most people run away from that desk and then go and get yourself lost in the game and you're good for the next hour or two before you get yourself for a drink or a meal. The excitement of storytelling, you know, it, it, it plays on the fact of human imperfection. Humans have a lot of unease and story characters mirror those in the real world. And you know the unpredictability of nature is something that, that comes out here. But I've also argued and had these conversations locally with, with government and with industry that games can also be game changers. And the power of immersive media can be used you know, for a lot of good stuff that happens. There are some big disaster games and they form huge communities. Now imagine if we can get a country or a whole continent to be prepared for a flood, for a virus, and be connected through a game and actually support each other in a way when, when real life incidents happen. So who knows what will happen in the future of storytelling in games, but it can go in several different directions. And we have been making games for the last 15 years. So if anyone here plays FIFA, which is really a topical story at this moment, the Electronic Arts FIFA game has been made on the same floor from where I'm talking to you for the last 14 years, right here in our studio. I have a small cozy team here in India of 7,300 artists. And it, these folks work across games, movies, fully animated story. So for the visual arts today, there is no better time and there is no better place than to explore the opportunities. And if any one of you have a bucket list and you want to go somewhere in the world, you want to do something in the world, there is a way to do it virtually. In, Korea and in Japan, the country level uh, authorities have created the playbook for esports. It's becoming such a large, such a large and trending business that you're finding that uh, you know you might be able to see a, 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 a FIFA type tournament that you're seeing in Qatar right now. You might see something of those proportions without even being in a real stage or a real venue in the next ten to fifteen years. I'd like to kind of wind down by saying that. Storytelling cannot be erased from our consciousness because we come with that inbuilt. It's like when you buy a computer and it says Intel inside, right? All of us are born with something called story inside. And that chip keeps memorizing and learning what we do for a long, long time to come. And all our personal stories should have a goal. And it should deepen the collective understanding of who we are. It should reflect our character. And I thought that the best way of having this conversation about storytelling would be to, to say that we are a narrative that builds bridges. You know, you mentioned that this narrative could include taking our narrative onto LinkedIn and connecting with each other afterwards and putting our names out here. That's how storytelling you know, goes. It goes from word of mouth, it goes through communities, it goes through you know, 
social media, it goes everywhere all the time. Uh, it makes people like Elon Musk want to buy a company in social media. But today, I have shared with you the story about stories. And I hope that you will take away an understanding of the magic potential of your story and what that will do for your future. I hope that this session about the future of storytelling has helped me to build a bridge with you. And these insights will help you to craft future stories happily ever after the end. Thank you so much, Baron. Thank you. That was absolutely amazing. It's, um, it's really great when we have a, a different kind of story, as you put it, coming across. And I totally understand where you're coming from, probably more than the other speakers that have spoken today, because I myself, like Arijit, I'm a storyteller. Um, and it's really important to have that survivor story often, um, because I'm an activist, I speak out against honor killings and human trafficking. And it, by telling your story often, you can make a difference to somebody else's life because they resonate with you and they think it's not just happening to them. You give them strength. And I know with another speaker that's coming up shortly, um, Tony, you know, you can really make a change and we are here to serve one another as much as we can whilst we're on this earth. So I really appreciate you. Please connect with Byron on um, social media, his LinkedIn, because I'm going to check him out very quickly. And without further ado, so that we're not holding up anybody else, I'm going to connect with Arajit now. Arajit Dutta, hello. Welcome. Hi. Good, good evening. Good evening. I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Um, I've been on and off throughout the conversation since around six o'clock. Because post 6.30, I think it was, I consider it is me time. But it has slowed over and Arijit has given me the timing at 8.15. I'm very unconventional. I don't have a presentation. Uh, I, you're going to hear me speak verbatim of what I think about what an entrepreneur should be or could be, what, what act probably are the values which that person should be looking into. So I'm going to be very, myself, Arjit knows me, a very carefully casual person, or let's say carefully careless person. I'm going to put out a few points where I would say uh, should be pointers to an entrepreneur of what that person should have in him ingrained to help him go forward. Number one, I would say is passion. Passion to do what you want to do. You must have that passion that I'm going to create this. I have to create it. I have to do it differently. I have to give time to it. I need, that's my passion. Followed immediately by 100% commitment. I know I may be using very cliche terms, but all the same, 100% uh, commitment. If you don't have 100% commitment, you've given it 99%. And it doesn't or it didn't work, you'd be saying, thinking, if only I had given that 1% more, it may have worked. So I regret. Give it your 100%. Time management. Me time, taking out me time is important. Taking out work time is important. Taking out your leisure time is important. Taking out time for others is important. One of the things I, used, I always hear from a lot of people, I don't have the time. I am too busy. I am working 15 hours a day. I really never believed in that right from the start. My me time was always very important to me. Work time was important, but my me time also was equally important, if not more. Regretting wrong decisions. There are a lot of people who I've met also in the past who, because they regretted certain business decisions, they did not have the guts to take the next decision or they were wavering from taking the next decision. In its business, there are times wrong, wrong decisions are taken. There are times right decisions are taken. So one must put, in my opinion, wrong decisions behind, look forward on a more positive note, because yes, wrong decisions 
will be taking. The type of work I want to do, the type of business I want to do, the type of things I want to get, get involved with is something which I should be interested in. If I'm not interested in that type of work, I don't think I'll be able to do it well. There would, there would be fine tuning required. There would be innovations required. There would be adjustments required. If you like that line of work, you would love it because then you would be able to do it far, far better. Open-mindedness to getting new inputs. That's something I think everyone will agree. You have to be open-minded to get new inputs in. Therefore, you would rearrange, you would readjust, and you, you might rethink the path. So open-mindedness to new inputs is important. Don't carry old baggage. To this, I can give us give a story. Uh, when Columbia TriStar, the distribution house, which was in Bombay, a new managing director came in called Uday Singh. I got a call from him and I was not in a distribution. I was well known in exhibition. That Arijit, could you please come to Bombay? I went there. He said, we would like you to handle our Columbia TriStar package of films in Eastern India, which later became Sony Pictures. I said, I've never done distribution. He said, that's why we wanted you because you carry no old baggage. In those days, cinema publicity used to be posted on the road, one newspaper ad. That whole thing changed. Today, what you see in cinema marketing was done by five, six of us in Bombay under the leadership of Uday Singh. Your newspaper being used, your television being used, your um, uh, social media being used. The first picture to be marketed was striptease. The major first real bang of marketing came in with Godzilla. And Godzilla was history where uh, straight after Jurassic Park, that was just fantastic. Yes, I was hearing someone talking about delegation of work, which I think is very important because if the top person is doing regular work throughout the day, I don't think that person will be able to ideate, not being able to think of new paths, not being able to think of new avenues or revenues, uh, revenue angles. So the top person must be able to delegate. It's very important for delegation. I agree, this is, this is something which I heard today. Luck, of course, plays a very important part, I must agree. Grabbing the right opportunity, being at the right place at the right time, it makes a difference, irrespective of, of who you are, how good, of, good your work is. But the being at the right place at the right time to grab that opportunity is very important. For myself, I could say I was, I start in spite of being in a film, film in the, uh, industry family, I first worked in GEC for five years. Then I came back to the film business that is running theaters. Then I went into distribution of films. I distributed for Sony, I distributed for Universal, I distributed for Paramount. Then I went into tourism. I have two excellent resorts, one in Purulia, which is the first place which I opened and it was a mouse infested area, changed the face of Purulia. And the next was in Sikkim, where uh, I've opened one in the, in the in south of Sikkim, in the only tea estate in Sikkim. Unfortunately, that was, we opened it two months before COVID lockdown, so we are still struggling, struggling on it. So I worked right throughout and my graph, which all of you all will find very funny, has been totally ultra. From where I started, in my youngest days, I used to be, I was the longest serving president of the Eastern India Motion Picture Association. I was in ICC. I was in uh, FIKI vice president. From there, to a bit of business. From business, I went into acting. Acting, I went into some fashion. And then I went to a different line of business. For others, it's always been different. I think first they would do a little bit of modeling. Then they would do a little bit of acting. Then they do organize their business, then they would be in association on the chamber positions. Unfortunately, mine has been totally ultra. But all I can say, I simply enjoy the way I work. 
and my work has been fun because I work with full fun. I don't put pressure on myself. I enjoy life. I work. My work is fun. That's why I like the work which I do. Otherwise, I wouldn't have chosen it. Now, I don't think I'll have too many questions coming to me as you're short of time, but I've just been generic about how I look at working. Thank you. Let me hop in, Nina. Uh, for the world and for everyone, I know him in person and uh, we meet often, definitely. I treat him as an uh, elder brother and uh, a good-hearted person who is always willing to give back to the community. An interesting part, um, as all of you know that we are into game development since 1998, we create our own game titles. So Mr. Datta gracefully uh, became a character in our title-based game, which is coming from a storyline uh, from Mahabharata called Karna. So he is in and as Karna in one of our 3D games, which we created, uh, started actually as an RPG game called Ashwatthama the Immortal in 2007, which was probably India's one of the first game um, which we released. Somehow we are too early for the market, at least in Indian market. And uh, I can I can take this clue from Bidain because in India, we do a lot of outsourcing work. But if you look at India, coming with same similar kind of game titles on 3D is not that easy to be very, very honest. And when we are talking about all such kind of game and all such kind of activities, India is uh, watching probably a lot of RNG, which is real money gaming, right? And I think that we have got an interesting speaker on real money gaming and the impact of it. We, as a policy, as a company policy, we don't create any kind of real money game, even though we call it as a skill game, but I feel that that is more of going towards gambling. So I will give the mic to Nina. We have got questions, but we'll skip that because uh, our next speaker is uh, waiting. Uh, and uh, I'm really glad he's all the way coming from you. Over to you, Nina. I just wanted to say firstly, thank you to our uh, Mr. Dutta. Thank you so much. I loved that you were just unapologetically yourself. And I love people like that because they don't have an ego. They're not pretending to fit in. And we need to be more like that. We need to all just literally be ourselves and bring ourselves forefront. Um, I would love to connect with you as well. So I will look for you on LinkedIn or bug the other Arajit later on for your details. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. The next person is very close to me. We work together here in the United Kingdom. I support his nonprofit. He's actually a very famous ex-footballer over here because football is a British thing that we absolutely love and you know with the World Cup going on a lot of people have jumped on again but Tony was a professional footballer before he turned the tables and I'm, I'm going to allow him to take the mic um, 15 minutes over to you and all my love Tony. Thank you Nina. Uh, hi everybody. Um, basically I'm going to start and I'm mindful of time and firstly I want to say that it's been fascinating listening to some of the speakers. Um, I've just taken a few tips from Arajit in, ter in terms of my business and what we do. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna start with a little bit of my, my story and uh, what we're doing in the UK in terms of gambling reform and uh, what my organization Red Card do and what I'm basically what I'm passionate about. So as Nina said, um, I would say semi-famous semi footballer at the time, um, played 200 league games in the English League Two, League Three, League Four. Um, and basically, uh, unfortunately, after a nine-year professional football career, um, I fell into gambling addiction. Now, gambling addiction is absolutely massive in the UK. We've approximately got 1.4 million gambling addicts in the UK, and that's rising. Uh, the gambling landscape has changed in terms of online gambling. We can talk about that shortly. But the impact it had on my life was huge. Um, I lost two houses, uh, and I ended up losing half a million pounds. So I'll repeat that. That's half a million pounds that I lost throughout my football career. Lost my two houses, had a 20 year relationship, which eventually, eventually broke down um, due to the lies and the deceit and things that we go through as a problem gambler. Um, and then unfortunately in 2010, I went bankrupt with a £192,000 bankruptcy file. And that was 32 creditors. Um, one of the things as, as a gambling addict that we will do, we will exhaust all avenues of borrowing and that will be friends, family and credit. Uh, and then unfortunately for some of us, there's two ways that we may go um, in terms of severity of gambling harms, and that is either ending up in prison, such as some of our team members have, uh, or unfortunately those that have committed suicide through gambling-related harms. So it's an absolutely massive issue. 
Um, and I was very, very fortunate. 2014, I had an opportunity to put my story to print. Um, I've listened to one or two people today and it's inspiring because uh, I always say to myself, how did I get where I am today, uh, considering where I was in 2014? And so I put my story to print with my first publication book, which is called Red Card. Um, and someone used the word resonate earlier. And I remember doing my first talk um, at a business gala, a black and Asian business gala dinner in Coventry at a hotel in 2015 and sharing my story. And basically um, the feedback from that and the, and the things that people were saying and women coming up to me and telling me about their, finding their dad's betting slips in the bin, et cetera, and what's going on in the home. So it really resonated, it realized to me that how much it resonates with so many different families, so many different people from different backgrounds, so many different demographics. It's absolutely huge uh, within, within the UK, but globally. Uh, so I'm sure some of you will know that are in different parts of the country. So after that, it was a question of, okay, what, what can I do now? What, what can I do to actually make a difference? Because there's one thing sharing your story, um, which I'm fortunate that I've got, I've had the mental capacity to do that because thousands of people don't want to relive trauma. Um, I put that down to my faith because I re regained my faith in 2017 and got baptized in 2017 on a, on a personal level. Uh, that's not for everybody. I appreciate that. And I respect everybody's belief in religion, but it's powerful for me and it's helped me along my new journey. So 2015, we set up, well, I set up Red Car Gambling Support Project, CIC, um, a community interest company. And we decided, right, there's, there's treatment providers out there in the UK. But, you know, how do we get to people before they get to, the, to where I was. And so we talked about early intervention. And to me, early intervention means from, from young, and that was from 11 years old. So we, we travel the country, um, go into youth projects, schools, educating young people on gambling related harms. And um, we also go to professionals. So we have a CPD accredited training course, gambling awareness training course that's aimed at professionals. Because as I said earlier, it's not just, it's absolutely anybody and everybody young and old uh, that are getting involved in gambling and suffering gambling related harm so we we make sure we spread that message um nationwide all over the uk and it's something that as i said earlier it's something that i'm really really passionate about it's something that i love doing i never thought in a million years that <laughs> this is what i would be doing after 2014 but it's amazing how um in, in my opinion how god works in my life so I push on with that. Uh, and I just in terms of where we are now, we, we had the Gambling Act review of 2005, uh, which concluded on March the 21st, uh, 2021. I was part of those consultations between the DCMS, the, the government, uh, other gambling organisations and lived experience people. And basically it, it was about how can we make gambling safer? So, you know, Red Card and myself, we are not anti-gambling in any way, shape or form, you know, I'm sure there's, you'll have friends that will like a bet, nothing wrong with gambling, but we, we do have to understand and respect it and understand that it can take people on different pathways. Um, and so if you understand the risk, then obviously it's, it's freedom of choice, what people do with their money. Uh, but it was all about how do we make gambling safe? And that is, we touched upon the four probably major topics that that's going to come out in a white paper very, very shortly. The white, the white paper has been delayed, uh, but we're hearing that it's going to come out very, very shortly. And the four things is affordability checks, advertising, loot boxes, uh, and the VIP schemes. Now, if I just touch upon loot boxes, you know, I know I've heard a lot of conversation today about blockchain and about you know ES gaming, etc. We're involved in certain conversations with colleagues about ES gaming and, and um, crypto gambling, etc. Because that's a, that's another level that's going to start happening soon. So, loot boxes is another form of gaming. Uh, someone mentioned FIFA earlier. You know, we have. Um, a case study within our workshop where an 18 year old lost £4,000 on, on FIFA packs. So the, what we were saying is that gaming is a form of gambling because it's risk and reward and there's an element of risk and reward and, and value. So um, when you're doing in-game purchasing in certain video games, then it has to be a form of gambling. Um, we are trying to change that law with the Gambling Commission and try to get gaming because there's kids at 11 years old that are gaming on Fortnite, on Call of Duty, FIFA, etc losing hundreds of pounds, i.e. not their money, their parents' money. Uh, and that's another story which we educate people on and parents on within our, our workshop. So that's a, that's a big issue, the banning of loot boxes. Advertising, back in my day, there was no real gambling advertising. Uh, there's been a massive saturation of, of gambling advertising in the last five years. And then we've got that relationship between sport, professional sport, particularly professional football and gambling advertising. So 
it's drawing thousands and thousands of people into gambling. You know, you've got kids that are going to football match on a Saturday and you've got the shirt sponsorship, you've got the stadia betting, you've got the perimeter fencing betting. It's absolutely everywhere. So we are trying to, you know, we know we're not going to get gamble advertising banned, you know, if, if we're being realistic. You know, I don't think we're going to get to where we were with the tobacco industry years ago in the UK. So I don't see that happening. But what I'm pushing for is to have a balance about the advertising and show the darker side. Uh, because on our, on our TV screens, all we see is the encouragement of gambling, the glamorising of gambling, the women coming out of the scene, you know, the men coming out of the pubs and playing football on their apps. That's all you see. You know, no one really knows the darker side. You know, we want to see the image and the content and imagery and um, language change so that people will actually see on our TV screens that, oh, hold on a minute, there is another side to gambling. So that's one thing, the loot boxes. The VIP schemes are the other one, which is there's those that gamble fairly heavily, depending on what profession you're in, you may be being offered a, as a VIP scheme by an operator. And basically, they're just going to shower you with gifts, uh, whether that's, you know, Cheltenham races, Ascot, Champions League matches, free tickets for this, free tickets for that, and shower you with cash bonuses into your bank account. Um, one of our team members was a VIP, and he had £14,000 put into his bank account, literally, by an operator within 14 days. And you're probably thinking, well... <laughs> Why would someone put 14 grand in your account? But you've got to understand the tactics and the practices of operators and how they work. They know you're going to gamble. You know you're a heavy gambler and they know that's going to come back in, ten, in tenfold. So um, in terms of the IP scenes, you want to get them banned. Uh, affordability checks is going to be the biggest one um, because of rights, um, freedom of spending, et cetera. But they want to have, we don't want to have a situation where you've got a student that can spend a thousand pound a night uh, and have a student grant loan gone within a week, which is happening today. You know, that really should never be allowed to happen. And that's all down to the operators and the Gamma Commission in terms of, you know, how they regulate uh, the license conditions of those operators. Because, you know, it, it's just incredible to think that that can actually happen. And, and the reason that happens is, is because the operators, they see all your transactions, they see how much you're spending, et cetera. Uh, but, but the majority of them, they don't intervene. So the lack of customer interaction and intervention is huge and, and what happens if, i don't know if anybody knows but what happens generally when an operator breaches their license, condi license conditions in terms of interaction uh, and intervention from a consumer they will be fined millions and millions of pounds so entain for instance was 17.8 million in august 22 uh to us it might sound a lot of money but to the operators unfortunately it's a drop in the ocean uh so we are we are pushing for licenses to be revoked uh, for those that are not going to adhere to their license conditions. So it's something I'm really, really passionate about. Um, you know, there has to be more social responsibility from the, from the operators. I think that the government, the DCMS, when we look at these uh, gambling reform, these gambling laws that are, you know, in terms of the white paper coming up, I'm just hoping, that, you know, my heart says that I don't think that, my heart says that I want more, but I don't really envisage any robust changes to the gambling laws. And that's why, Education, awareness and prevention is what Red Card do. That's why it's so important uh, because we are forever going to have people with problem gambling. Then we're going to get into the game and then we're going to get to crypto gambling, et cetera. So it's not going to stop. You know, it's a, it's a you know, multi-million, multi-billion pound industry um, and that's going to continue. So in my, in my opinion, I enjoy what I do. I, I have a great satisfaction of, of walking out of a school knowing that I've spoken to like 15, 16 year olds and, and having the comments that, you know, they didn't realise that gambling, they didn't realise the bigger picture, they're not going to get involved in gambling, etc. And if I just say one person from that day, I'm a happy man. So moving on, um, we want to educate as many people as possible. And I've noticed on the screen today, I don't know in terms of online, but there's lack of education and connection in terms of uh, the Bain community. So we have lots of people from the Caribbean, the Asian community and the Muslim community that are not educated on gambling related harms. We want to do that to as many as possible uh, because we had a film last year uh, whereby it was a Muslim uh, who was a gambling addict and how it impacted on the family. And it was absolutely huge. Um, being ostracized from, from your family, et cetera, the shame, the guilt that comes with that. So we want to, we want to reach a lot more people from those demographics. So if anybody's interested in having a, a whether it's an online workshop or it's in in person workshop, which I'm involved in, uh, we'd love that because we want to reach as many people as possible. I know I'm on a global stage now, and I thank Nina for that and Arajit. It's, it's fantastic. Um, and I've done lots of uh, media stuff in terms of the BBC and Channel 5 and all the, all the press in the UK. Um, but my main sort of priority is to continue to educate, continue to reach as many people as possible. 
uh, because I know this problem gambling is not going away any time soon. So, uh, yeah, I'm happily recovered. Um, seven years recovery now. As I said earlier, every game of faith. My second book, just to finish off on my story, came out last year. And the subtitle to it is A Bet You Can Win. And the reason why I called it Red Card, A Bet You Can Win, which came out on Amazon 21 last year, is because that's how I feel. I've come a long way. It's been a hell of a journey. Uh, and it's just testimony and hope to people out there that you can come out of adversity. You can come through trauma. Yeah, it takes a lot of help. It takes a lot of network support, mental strength for me, my faith. So, yeah, but you can come out of the other side. So I'm blessed and happy that I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing today. So thank you all for listening. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Arajit. Thank you all. Thank you, Tony. And if you want to contact Tony, please check out his details on um, LinkedIn. He's put his details in, in the chat and I'll get him to do that again. But if we don't hear from people, we don't learn about the struggles, so we don't know how to support them. So it's very important. And if you are struggling with gambling addiction, please reach out to Tony or find an alternative. But the most important step that you can take today is to talk about it. Talking about it is the hardest thing to do, but it's the one step that will start to help you to recover. And I'm going to pass it back on to Arajit. Thank you, Nina. Um, to be very honest, uh, I have been giving platform to all the speakers and probably forgot to actually share about myself, even though I've been trying to share things um, as much as I can during the speakers are actually speaking. A couple of things are close to my heart, to be very, very honest. And Tony, what you have done, you have done amazing stuff and you have been doing massive work. It's not that easy. Coming from the tech background, coming from running a, a game development company for the last 24 years, I know how difficult it is to declare to the world that we don't create betting games we don't we don't make um games which is actually going to take you towards something which is not very very cozy and cool and kids will probably lose their authenticity and people will lose their money it's not that easy hope you can understand it's a money boggling business to be very honest the number of games that we have created so far tony if we have created probably one or two max these kind of betting games, probably the, the, the story would have been completely different. You know that very, very well. Do you somehow, by chance, heard about a name called Craig Johnston? Craig Johnston. You have Footballer Craig Johnston. You know? Yeah, I know Craig Johnston, a footballer. Yes, yes. So he was the speaker in our first World Leader Summit. And uh, we have been talking uh, for the last couple of years now to create a virtual reality solution on football specifically, along with Bruce Hopper Hopkins, who is there in our platform as one of the ambassadors representing Australia. We will talk, Tony. We have a lot of things to do, but this is actually speaker's podium uh, for the world and uh, for everyone, every speaker who is joining here. Uh, world Leader Summit is not about a platform wherein you are just speaking and going away. If you have a hardcore desire to make things happen with each other. Understand this is basically a platform to engage with each other. What we have done so far so good, we have our own technology company, which is running in a couple of countries, approximate 17 countries. We went completely virtual in 2018, when people called me as a crazy guy, going completely virtual and uh, you know turning off all the physical offices in uh, India. But then those people came to me saying that, can we have some consultancy? How did you make it happen? Because COVID hit them in 2019. So it's about how you're thinking the future and how you are well connected and how you can grab the news, what is going to happen. You need to understand your EQ level and IQ level, to be very honest. I don't want to go deep into this. We have our own accelerator. We have our own incubation supporting system. We have our people. It's not that it is just we created. We have multiple number of people who are well versed well equipped well strength uh, with their own strategy with their own uh, expertise as well as corporates who left their job who joined us as a mentor so there are a group of people who are there happy to handshake make things available as well as if you have an existing company who feels that okay fine let's make things happen together if you are an individual feels that we can do something cool together we'll be more than happy to do that uh, to the world um, declaring that I'll be more than happy to probably handshake with Natalia. Natalia is doing massive good work. She's an artist. She wants to disrupt the NFT world. 
So we are story creator into VR and game and uh, augmented reality powered by blockchain. So we'll be more than happy to program a handshake with her. So this is what the magic is for World Leader Summit. The previous speaker who came, <laughs> Arijit Dutta, I am happy to share that we are actually trying to create all those kind of activity zone for him. So just to give his background, because he didn't, he is humble enough. He is coming from the family who actually funded Satyajit Ray's Pothir Pachali. If you have heard about that name, which got prizes worldwide, it's a, it's a huge thing that his family have done. And he runs Priya Entertainment Limited as a movie theater hall, couple of multiple different travel tourism business. So we have powerful people who are actually coming. Like for an example, John, V. Francis John, who is coming all the way from Dubai, they run an incubation center powered by Tata Group. My God, look at the kind of strength that these guys have got. So if you're looking for any kind of innovation support, feel free to reach that gentleman. He'll be more than happy to help, probably. That's, that's the assumption that we all can probably take. With due, due uh, course of time, I think I'm taking a lot of uh, speakers' time. I took already three minutes. So let's not, okay. let's not keep uh, talking, but Tony, Please be in touch. We'll be more than happy to talk. Nina got my number and we can exchange things in WhatsApp. We'd love to have another Zoom session with you. Until unless I travel to UK, I already traveled, but I'll be more than happy to be there. Hop in and have a cup of coffee with you. And uh, uh, for your another information, Tony, we have a football club here in Calcutta. I'm not sure how, uh, I mean, how many of you know that Calcutta is famous for soccer ball and football. So there is a football club which we support, run by another Bengali gentleman. He runs it with passion and love. They are creating national level football players. It's called United Sports as a club. So if you feel there is any kind of connection that you need, we'll be more than happy to connect that. In fact, our last previous speaker, who is in the Sports Authority of India. So that kind of person is already there in our council. So feel free to check our website. You'll find out council as an option. You go inside, you will find out people and their name and faces. Feel free to connect. There is no hard and fast rule that you cannot connect and you cannot communicate. And for the ecosystem development, we'll be more than happy to make things happen. With this note, I will skip a couple of questions from internet. We already got five questions for you, Tony, but I'll be mailing it to you directly because it is live happening. So people are asking questions. Um, but yeah, Nina, what do you propose? Shall I take the... Yeah, I'm actually going to hop out shortly. I'll still be online, but I'll be watching. I'll introduce the next speaker. But I just wanted to say to Arajit, he's put so much effort into the last couple of days from the beginning. And I've been really happy to have been his co-host along this journey. Remember to network, remember to chase up those connections that you're making. You never know who you're standing next to. At a bus stop, it happened to me. And now I'm a mindset coach for UFC fighters and MMA fighters because of that, just because I spoke to the person who was standing next to me. So don't disregard anybody along in this, in this process. Remember we're reaching over 90 countries and we have had over 120 speakers. Daily we've had the most amazing people with the amazing stories. And you know, they're sharing their knowledge which normally you would pay for. And talking about payments, the World Leader Summit has brought this facility to you for the last couple of years without any charge but a lot of effort and time goes into it so from next year if you want to be part of the world leader summit there will be a nominal charge just to cover our admin fees and also what's going on in the background but the depth of people that you will meet upon this kind of network is not really somebody you would bump into next to on a bus stop so it's an important platform to be on remember to follow Arajit on his personal social media Support him because he's a great person. Support the World Leader Summit and let's just keep connecting and bringing the world into a closer place. As I said, the World Leader Summit holds think tanks. They have investors, they have angel investors, and they have a lot of ideas that if you want to put forward to them, they would be more than happy to teach you to pitch those ideas and how you can create that idea into a reality. So stay in tune. Please watch to the end. Ping in your friends to come and watch you. And, you know, this will actually be live at the moment, but you can replay it and go watch the other speakers that have spoken. So I'm going to introduce the next speaker, which is Shanoli Ray. Shanoli Ray, are you available? Yeah. I'm if you here. could um, put your camera on, I'm going to give you the 15 minutes. I will be here for your 15 minutes and then I will just go into incognito and I've got another meeting, but I'll be listening in on the other, on the other side. So lovely to meet you all and thank you. And please take away the stage. Thank you, Shanoli. 
Thank you so much uh, for giving me the opportunity to share my views uh, here. I would like to share one PPT. Basically, is it uh, visible to all? Okay. So basically, uh, I am from the education sector. I, I am working as a school principal in India. And uh, as an educationist, uh, I have a long uh, journey of uh, around 22 years. But recently, I have started my own uh, learning and skills training platform, that is EdVision. Uh, it's uh, just a startup, uh, five, six months old. And we are looking forward uh, to expand uh, globally my training session because over the last uh, decade, I have uh, traveled uh, almost uh, different parts of uh, India. And I have uh, found and in also interacted uh, inter internationally in a different global summit and all. I have found that uh, there is a necessity for uh, proper skills training, vocational training, uh, and also teachers training. So that is why I have started this platform uh, where we want to provide uh, the required uh, skills, vocational, corporate, or teacher's training, uh, as well as uh, short courses, which are affordable to all. Because there are many platforms these days are coming up. Basically, I can say mushrooming up. But uh, this is not affordable for all. So our basic motto is to provide an affordable uh, platform, globally accessible uh, to all. So uh, we are uh, just working on expanding our course modules, uh, our training sessions, and uh, always open for collaboration and franchisee option uh, that can be opened up all around the world. So today I'll just show you a small uh, glimpse of how we can proceed for any kind of uh, training. So uh, I have selected uh, today a topic uh, that is a uh, need of the hour, education for sustainability, because uh, this is the need of the hour and how we will uh, give the training for the students or organization that may collaborate with us. So uh, let me explain. So education for sustainability is an educational approach that aims to develop students, schools, and communities with the values and the motivation to take action for sustainability in their personal lives, community, in community, and also as a global scale now and in future because sustainability is a, a target uh, from the uh, United Nations that has to be fulfilled by 2030. So this is not only a present uh, movement, but also it is uh, here to stay in future. So education for sustainability aims to build awareness and knowledge of sustainability issues but also to develop students and schools that are able to think critically, innovate, and provide solution towards more sustainable patterns of living. So that is how we want to train uh, the community, those students, because they are the young generation and future of the world. The global is, uh, the future is in their hand. So, if we get them the proper training, uh, how to uh, live sustainably in future, so our future will be safe in their hand. Next, uh, let us plus know what is sustainability actually. Sustainability is concerned with protecting the planet, halting climate change and promoting social development without endangering life on earth. Within the UN framework of action to achieve global sustainable development, the 2030 agenda is an action plan in favor of people, the planet, the prosperity, and is also designed to consolidate universal peace and access to justice. So that is what sustainability is, and we are working on it. So why should we teach sustainability? 
because sustainability education, the way we will be delivering the education that can be fun, engaging and empowering, as well as it allows those students to take responsibility for their actions and to contribute their vision for a sustainable future. It enables them to develop knowledge, skills, values, and motivations for action, allowing them to maintain their own well being and that of their community and the planet in an increasingly interconnected world. So, here our training program will be mostly activity based. It's not uh, just uh, uh, inside a classroom or inside uh, any room. It will be spread all over the, they will feel connected uh, all over uh, the world along with. So there are key sustainability concepts. Uh, the sustainability cross-curriculum priority has been organized around three key concepts. First one is systems concept, that is interconnections. Second one is world views concept, that is social justice, values, and judgment. And third one is future concept, that is the design and action. How the future, in future, uh, those students can develop a sustainable planet. So let us first have a look about the system concept. It looks at the interdependent and changing nature of systems that support life on Earth. This concept also focuses on well being and survival through the promotion of healthy social, economic, and ecological systems. It is about big picture thinking and creating solutions at a system level. So here, uh, the students will have the knowledge how they can interconnect between health, economy, and ecological system. They need to find out a solution. We will give them some project. They need to find out the solution, how that can be interconnected, and how a sustainable solution can come out with them. So here are uh, some ideas, uh, like uh, all life forms, including human life, are connected through ecosystems on which they depend for their well-being and survival. And second is sustainable patterns of living rely on the interdependence of healthy social, economic, and ecological systems. These two concepts, we have to make the students clear, and then we can give them a project, grow your own forest or reduce carbon footprints. So in this way, if we give one project like this, where they will be working towards sustainability as well as economic growth and as well as their own well-being. So how can one be proceed in this uh, uh, project? So first one has to pick a plan, whether you are an eco-planly individual, responsible traveler, eco concerts family or a group of friends who want to take part in climate action, first select the perfect plan for you. So here uh, from our team, we can help set up this kind of planning that will help them to work uh, in future. Next, the forests are lungs of our art. Help cleanse our atmosphere by planting trees every month and growing your own forest. So this way, if we work out on a plan, how to plant trees, how many uh, trees should be planted, or there will be total uh, planning system from our side that will help them go forward. Otherwise, they can support carbon offset projects. We cause carbon emissions one way or other, support carbon reduction projects in underdeveloped countries. Especially, we require to support those uh, projects in underdeveloped countries where pollution level is very high. Next is make a change for the people and the world, become carbon neutral. You can use uh, your lifestyle in such a way that you yourself live in carbon neutral way. So 
suppose forests are growing, projects are running with only a small step, you have made the world a better or cleaner place. So that is how uh, we can start working on the distribution of sustainability. Next, second strategy is the world views concept, which looks at uh, sustainability issues in a global context. World views that recognize the dependence of living things on healthy ecosystems and value diversity and social justice as essential for achieving sustainability. World views are formed by experiences at personal, local, national, and global levels and are linked to individual and community actions for sustainability. So with this view, we can give a project on food across the Asia region. So how students or organization can proceed about this. So the learning sequence examines how people from across the countries of Asia region access their food using the plants and animals in their region how they design and create different cuisines, explore how plants and animals are grown for food, clothing, and shelter, how food is selected and prepared for healthy eating. The peoples and countries of Asia are diverse in ethnic background, traditions, culture, belief systems, and religions. So through this study, uh, the students from around the world can have a uh, idea. This helped in developing their intercultural understanding and how to cultivate an eco conscious lifestyle. Students will be involved in learning about and engaging with diverse cultures in ways that recognize commonalities and differences, create connections with others, and cultivate mutual respect. So, this is the second strategy first um, so strategy I interrupt uh suddenly but we are running out of time and your speaking slot was for 15 minutes it's already over but if you can wrap up it will be great okay sure and uh, so the, that is what i was explaining he uh, the third concept will be future concept that is we will give one topic and the students will design an automation process or anything that is helpful uh, for uh, the students uh, in future. So this is how we can develop training schedules and programs for organizations, school, colleges, universities across the globe. And right now we are in online mode also, virtual mode, and also we can arrange in offline mode also. So this is all about uh, admission. You can connect with me on my LinkedIn profile. And thank you. Thank you so much. There is already a, a comment that actually came in your, uh, in your, I think it is for you in our live uh, telecast that is happening. Uh, someone from Vietnam, she wanted to get in touch with you. And definitely when you're talking about uh, carbon emission, uh, if you can kindly, uh, address a little bit situation of West Bengal in terms of carbon emission. What is the present scenario? And how do yeah. you feel that? How do you propose you can address the same? Yeah, basically, uh, as I have already mentioned, in uh, countries, underdeveloped countries are having uh, uh, much uh, more pollution and carbon emission. Uh, our lifestyle is such that uh, we need to immediately think about uh, how to live sustainably and uh, we need to reduce the pollution level. So that is why we have opened up uh, this, uh, our organization where we need to give awareness to the common people. And especially we should start uh, uh, putting awareness in schools and colleges where the students if the students get an uh, award about uh, how to control pollution, how to how to use properly, because uh, now after COVID, uh, when the things are normalizing, we can see, especially in West Bengal, uh, in Kolkata city, if we think about, there are twice or thrice the amount of cars are running. 
because now because of covid now people have stopped uh, uh, availing the local uh, uh, public transport and they all have their own uh, uh, either uh, two wheeler four wheeler or like this so we can see the public transport are running empty and people are uh, uh, moving uh, with their own vehicle so this way uh, the pollution level is getting higher and higher and uh, that way uh, the government also has to uh, cut down uh, trees and uh, to wide the road and uh, the plantation of trees is not happening in that level so this is where we need to uh, put our awareness campaign especially Brilliant. for school students shaloni uh, if i may propose there is a active group i think i know two three of them if you are willing to connect only in bengal i can connect with these uh, group of people who are actually planting trees in uh, nearby the station areas of bengal here and there mainly in sabars and they are completely opposing to chop off any kind of tree inside their 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 places like either is in district or is in it is in cities so i think if that helps you please feel free to reach out to me you have my phone number i'll be more than happy to connect you with these active group number 1 number 2 in our council we have uh, 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 basically two people who are running the same similar kind of activity not from this country but from some other countries uh, one of them if i'm not wrong he is from portugal and another one um i don't remember exactly where he is at the moment but definitely he is from asia so would love to connect you with these people feel free if you need any kind of connectivity any kind of support please drop me a message or send a mail to our common mail id there is a specific team who are actually working day and night in various part of the world approximate 17 of them are managing the email id they will be connecting you with the right kind of person brilliant yeah, work that you are doing i mean it's not that easy to you know execute things and uh, coming from the school background being a principal a, a honorary position and a noble position you are doing this kudos to you thank you so much thank you for your speech i'm really sorry i need to become devil today because we have a lot of speakers who are actually speaking from um, the beginning of the summit and we have been trying to manage time for all of you so our next speaker is chandi and khanna chandi if you can kindly uh, unmute yourself turn on your video it will be nice then we will go next to our next speaker thank you uh, stephanie for joining thank you nina for being such a beautiful amazing super cool host and a uh, integral part of world leader summit yeah over to you chandi thank you mr bhattacharya and good evening to all of you present here today and the special thanks to the world leaders summit for this opportunity to speak about a subject that's really close to my heart and coincidentally um, you mr bhattacharya and the speakers before me shonali have touched upon a subject which i am going to talk about in a little more detail which is emotional intelligence and that ties in beautifully with uh the talks of sustainability and environment and you know what we can do with the psyche of our children and with of course the adults who are a little more resilient to change but uh, you know they can always be molded emotional intelligence if we look at um, is broadly defined as the ability to understand accept and manage our emotions and the emotions of others and have the increased ability to remain empathetic not just towards ourselves but also towards things around us and the environment so very importantly with what uh, shonali ji was just speaking about uh, the environment is something that i think we've forgotten um as a as an eq certified practitioner i'm extremely extremely passionate about the subject i've been conducting workshops on this subject um so i'd like to talk first about ai in relationship with the environment and why it's so important today uh because i think sustainability for the environment comes has to come from inside it cannot be forced on anybody and uh, you know if the covid pandemic has taught us anything uh, it did bring unprecedented problems for people across the world uh we had unemployment we had losses in business complete shutdown of companies uh people suffering mental and physical health problems 
there was a lot of problem that COVID brought and, and the strains of which can still be seen. Um, we, we, it's rumored, I mean, not rumored, uh, the recession is going to hit us hard uh, sometime next year. And, uh, you know, uh, the reason for saying is that the world did change overnight. And the cities that supposedly never slept became deathly quiet. Our children became eerily silent because we had forced them to be silent. We had to, we had a new term called social distancing. We had to cover our face with masks, which is not something humans are cut out to be because we are essentially social beings. So what, what did happen was that, and the only, I think nature was probably the only thing that rejoiced because when we were inside, businesses were stalled, industrial activity was stopped. Nature seemed to rejoice. What we saw was a glimpse of the air that we would like to be, the environment we would like to live in. If only we remained aware of our duties towards nature. As soon as the COVID seems to have, have ebbed, we went back to being the monsters we were to the environment, to something that Chunaliji just touched upon. And COVID, I think, was a slap on the face of humanity from nature for our lack of emotional intelligence and mainly empathy in particular. So I think um, for me, this topic could not be more relevant today. And even if we consider that we are going back to where we used to be, well, global pollution levels are heading north once again. We know that well. We know what's happening to the environment. We be hearing about whether it's plastic, whether it's our children getting ill, whether it's the adults who are getting ill. <clears throat> what we need to understand is why emotional intelligence is so important is why can't we go back to thinking about were we not living with just the essentials? The indulgent activities that we love to do, uh, you know, when things seem normal, do we really need those? I'm not saying not to enjoy yourself, but we all want humanity that seemed to have disappeared. We want to be able to breathe easy. We want to just spread our arms, look at the sky, enjoy the sun, allow the grass and the sand to tickle our toes. If you ask anybody what they want, you know, what they want for the future, I don't think anybody is going to say that um, I want to be remembered for having loads of money. They would rather be, you know, remembered for the smaller things, to be able to hug their friends, to be smiling, to uh, you know, to just be dancing in the rain for no, no reason at all. When we build emotional intelligence, we build empathy towards the environment. And by our contribution, we would allow nature to resuscitate, to heal and to become stronger, which in turn will support the economy. When all of this is summed up, we can say three words that are the most important for the environment, which is high emotional intelligence. And with that comes very many traits, because as I said, it's a very broad term and it does not have to do just with emotion. It has to do with a lot of factors that get, that have a trickle effect when you have high emotional intelligence. We all need to do our bit to reduce the negative impacts on the environment and do ourselves a favor do our children a favor. We need to bring sustainable happiness to us and the future generations. And whether we realize it or not, emotional intelligence is the way to go because it, it's something that is changing inside out. As a society, we have long ignored and neglected the important things, acted too slowly and have not taken every opportunity as an as a community to protect ourselves and our planet. All it takes is the cultivating high emotional intelligence. I'd be happy to help and explain this in more detail if anybody wants. It's no longer about the virus or its effects. It's more about an appeal for ourselves, for our children, and for the future generations. The consequences of apathy and lower missing EI will surely be born by the future generations if you are not careful immediately. 
we run the risk of working only at a broad theoretical level without high emotional intelligence because we will be missing the heart of matters with high ei what happens is that we quickly elevate feelings of care concern and even affection not just towards each other but towards the environment and those more vulnerable than us which in particular i would talk about children and and uh, you know our elders the the point that i'm trying to make here is that if we build high emotional intelligence we will also be building familiarity with nature we will be able to explain to our children why it's so important to be in nature without harming it we humans may feel empathy towards each other but you know do we really feel that empathy towards plants and animals and things around us you know if it if we feel it's not impacting us directly you know that's that's something that uh, unfortunately is the truth what ai does is bro- draw our attention to a broader identity it will help us to see us ourselves as stewards of the planet partners in its sustenance we need to move beyond greed and the need to acquire and the sin of punishing nature for our own wants that is why i i keep emphasizing and i try to speak with educational institutions to include emotional intelligence not just as a separate subject but as part of the curriculum so that if there's a certain duration of a class is ei is included in that i would urge corporates to take emotional intelligence training for their for their staff because it does it will do a lot of good and when i say it will do a lot of good i'm also talking about you actually earn more when you boost your emotional intelligence i i'm, I'm uh, you know that's that's a fact um when you make time for the elements of emotional intelligence such as self awareness self regulation motivation empathy and social skills there is a direct connection between that and the bottom line and your own personal development from an economic perspective research shows that those who have this secret weapon in their kitty earn around 29000 dollars more a year there is a direct connection because emotional intelligence makes you effective productive and focused and when that happens you will automatically attract better talent you will automatically attract better opportunities and i think it's time that all of us got this weapon in our arsenal emotional intelligence uh, as i like to say is a muscle obviously because it's not something that can be built overnight just like you would exercise only for a day you you don't expect yourself to become fit in the same way ai is a muscle it has to be practiced it takes time and it's wise to stay on the journey to enable oneself to uh, on a self examining journey where you can say that okay i have brought in some changes for myself which i can then pass on i'm sure none of us knows anybody who says ah i am good with what i earn i don't want to earn any more i don't think we know anybody like that the good news is that once you and your company decides to include emotional intelligence the bottom line is going to expand because one of the main things that you can do with high emotional intelligence is bring down your customer acquisition costs which i think is one of the highest costs that uh, any business has today um yes it is a forecaster for money as well for monetary success so how how do emotional the intelligent people attract more money because they think beyond their circumstance they transcend the limitations of their current situation they perceive challenges as opportunities and occasions to teach themselves something new there are times when you know you might feel that oh i've done my bit i've done so much but i can't see the end of the tunnel so that's when you have to stay and that's where emotional intelligence helps you to remain resilient and tenacious in what you do 
uh, a speaker was speaking before about passion. I think uh, Mr. Datta was saying that, that passion is so important and emotional intelligence is one great way where you can build and sustain your passion. Those with high emotional intelligence recognize that, you know, adversities are not the end. It helps them give, get even more determined and productive in what they're doing. They move the focus to ask the right questions to manage challenges. They, they move from saying, why is this happening to me to how can this serve me? What is it trying to teach me? Which version of me would be the best to serve, you know, to meet these challenges head on? How could I use this to my advantage? That's what emotional intelligence does. It makes you the smartest and most capable version you can be of your own self. It most definitely is the skill, not just of now, but for the future as well. And it would be easier to make money because you're just doing your job very well, more effectively. Your contribution to your company will begin to get noticed and you would be adding more value to yourself and to the people around you. You become better communicators. You perform well even under stress. Stress does not you know, make you run haywire. It, in fact, it motivates you. It helps you to lead yourself and others. It helps you to be more productive. And at the end of the day, uh, an emotionally intelligent workforce can help any organization beat the, beat the competition. The possibilities are endless with high emotional intelligence. And this is the tangible part of what people term as a concept, but emotional intelligence has very, very tangible effects. If only we would take the time to learn. So get yourself some high EQ and I'd be happy to help. Thank you. Absolutely brilliant speech, Chandru. Thank you so much. Well, uh, for the sake of time, I will uh, move to Chandru and then eventually we'll go towards Stephanie. Chani, uh, we'll request you to please stay back with us if we get any kind of question from social media. Already you've got comments, not question to be very honest. So we will be more than happy to connect you with the gentleman or the lady who is asking the question. So with... Uh, Without failure, without taking so much of time, Chandru actually is waiting for us for his speech deliberation. I'm sure that probably Chandru is going to come with a lot of tech details to give a small brief about World Leader Summit, even though the name calls leader. Uh, well, we have 25 different teams each and every year, which is uh, always updating every year, depending on the situation. We have AI and data, education, edtech, investment, venture capital, Women entrepreneurship, fashion lifestyle, incubation and co working, social impact, blockchain, energy clean tech and auto tech, cybersecurity and cyber law, banking and finance, fintech, deep tech as a separate section, virtual reality, augmented reality, animation and VFX, travel and tourism, B2B and B2G meeting as a separate section, space technology, SME and MSME, startup investment sports and fitness, aviation, automobile, spirituality and lifestyle, gaming and esports, smart city and travel tech, marketing e-commerce, health and Ayurveda, food, agri-food and biotech and media entertainment. These are the theme for this year. People applied approximate 25,000 application we have received and out of which we have given chance to approximate 150 plus speakers across the world. We were about to touch 97 countries, but somehow God is really graceful. We crossed 111 countries this year. We thought that we'll be touching 100 plus speakers. That's why probably you have been watching in my poster that it is 100 plus countries and 100 plus speakers, but we actually crossed 150. Uh, without do any, any um, gap, I'll give this mic to Chandru to deliver his speech. So over to you, Chandu. 15 minutes is completely yours. I was just killing one minute of your time to give a brief about World Leader Summit, but you will have that time. Don't worry. I am keeping the time uh, with myself. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your brief introduction, Rajit. I hope I'm audible. Oh. Yeah. Perfect. Like, uh, 
thank you for having me in this meet and arjit like i am seeing you since uh, 4 pm indian time and you've been here for the past four to five hours i think um keep up the good work and let me start with who i am like myself chandru and i am the vice president handling sales and marketing division of a company called alpha private limited which is based out of india and we are from down south and our company predominantly deals with blockchain related technology for blockchain technologies and services related to it uh like this giving a small brief not a brief a little overview about my company like we are a team of 50 plus highly motivated individuals and we are focusing to give the world's best solutions that actually relies on the best technology that is available which is blockchain like uh i am here to speak about the trends in blockchain technology the race the trend that is going to uh might should the world is uh, a shorter term like uh, i don't want to brag about the technology much like uh, for the past 2 to 3 years we have been hearing blockchain all over blockchain blockchain here and there and because of the popularity of cryptocurrencies like bitcoin ethereum and other sort of cryptocurrencies but as a technology it is a different thing rather than what you are saying with cryptocurrencies blockchain is a standalone technology which was being utilized by currencies cryptocurrencies but it is not the major part of blockchain like with the functionality it has as everyone know generally blockchain is defined as uh, open ledger where data can be manipulated and in order to upload a data a series of events to be followed which is a kind of approval uh which is i mean the technology itself follows uh, a democratic setup uh, starting from the roman empire like there used to be senators who approves the who approves every kind of actions that the government or the ruler makes so here in the blockchain technology the same thing will happen like people who approve the notes will act as senators and no one cannot manipulate or fake data into it and the application of this technology varies like currently it is being applied everywhere but the primary application is being done in fintech financial technology as you all know like um, but these things are discussed and discussed too much times like uh, blockchain and fintech industry blockchain supply chain management blockchain and gaming blockchain and web3 which is the latest trend like these topics are widely being discussed over so i am here to talk about blockchain in identity management like identity management like when is identity management it complies with policy policies and technologies and authenticating or authorizing individuals into a specific set of operation like uh, let me start over with the note that i prepared for this like identity management is often referred to as identity and access management it makes ensuring that only those who are allowed may access the technological resources they acquire to carry out the job duties uh, which is nothing but a restriction of access like restriction of access uh, i mean it depends it different it differs i mean it differentiates from the level of hierarchy like a person with a superior hierarchy Yeah, am I audible? Yeah, okay. A uh, person with superior hierarchy or superficial superior powers would be able to access everything, everything that the company or industry holds. I mean, in terms of data. Whereas, uh, when the hierarchy narrowed down, people will be having only limited kind of access, like access to a certain thing, access to a certain division, access to a specific set of services. But how it is getting monitored? like when it is a centralized mode of monitoring uh there are chances for a breach to occur uh, when is it chances uh consider i guess we lost you in between uh yes i'm back can uh, sorry for that no problem um yes let me carry from where i left uh when we say uh consider a setup a setup 
of a server in a centrally occupied building. The access to the entire set of data available in the server can be controlled. Like people or a person who is safeguarding can be compromised. And it tends to happen like we are, like uh, when you watch movies like Mission Impossible, you tend to understand what I'm trying to say. Uh, but these things aren't a little things to be neglected. So with the implementation of technologies like blockchain or technologies uh, that can't be manipulated or that can't be convinced should, I mean, changes the entire vertical of how the data is being accessed and the access being shared. So in addition to preventing unauthorized access to systems and resources, identity management also aims, aids in the preventing the exfiltration of enterprise or protected data and raises alerts and alarms, which are being completely programmed. And again, it's a centralized thing. But uh, the hardware resources and organizations, such as servers, networks, and storage devices, are also protect protected by identity management solutions from unauthorized access, which could result in a ransomware attack. So due to the escalating amount of international regulatory complaints and government's requirements that aim to safeguard sensitive data from exposure of any type, identity management has become more significant than ever. Like, uh, this is not an easy thing to be neglected, neglected as I said before. And considering the past uh, 10 to 12 years, uh, entity management is being discussed as a serious concern and a lot of things being considered in order to make it more effective. Like, uh, and this gives the opportunity for the trading technology to prove its presence. Like, um, the reason that I'm backing this technology is personally, people are considering this as a fancy technology. Like, when we started to associate this with terms like cryptocurrencies, bitcoins, NFTs, gaming, this tends to be, this technology started to get a self projection of itself as a technology that won't be utilized for a better uh, development of society or better development or improvement of any other industry. So when we talk about identity and resource management, this proves the metal of the specific technology. So generally speaking, identity authorization management system are an element of IT security and IT tools for identity and access, access control. So our identity, man identity management is mainly concerned with the user identity and the rules, permissions, and group users belongs to a certain industry. So when we implement blockchain, there are certain issues which can be resolved, like data security issues, false identities, accessibility issues, and much more. So when I say data security, our most important identification data is now kept in a centralized government systems that are backed by outdated technologies. And though, though we have we have a lot of uh, VM service providers, VPS service providers, server providers like AWS. DigitalOcean and who are the market leaders. Everything is centralized completely, as you all know. Like though AWS has a proper ecosystem set up, it is centralized and people can access data that you store in a centralized storage system. Uh, currently, this can't be, I mean, currently there aren't any alternatives considering the Web2 system, but Web3 would change that. And with Web3's introduction, Blockchain would be the key. Like, uh, I'm not sure how many of you people are aware of Silicon Valley, a famous sitcom show that is completely based out of technology, where they seriously discussed about an issue called decentralized internet. Decentralized internet is a thing where data packs that are being stored in server will be migrated to a uh, set of distributed decentralized decentralized in the sense devices which are being used by a 
sorry again uh, there's a slight fluctuation in my internet sorry again no problem so uh, yes coming back uh, decentralized internet is a thing where people will be storing the data in different set of devices as a small bytes for example if a video file is the size of 178 megabytes it will be split into several bytes and stored in uh, i mean hundreds of different devices and when they access all the devices will share those data into a series of fragments and it will be played so this conceptual idea but decentralized internet will be the key solution to avoid all kind of issues and to like uh, when we have data stored in a centralized setup we can't be assured who are all watching it like everyone has a privacy which should be taken care and I'm getting a proper words to convey this. So, when we have data stored in a centralized setup, anyone can access it. Like even the implementation of blockchain cannot save. Was not wasn't able to weren't able to save the cryptos that got hacked only because of the hostings being done in a centralized servers. So, with the introduction of decentralized servers, a lot of things starting from the data currency illegal access and false identities can be averted so when is a false identities a restricted based entry will be granted and when i say a restriction like everything will be monitored and if a person of unknown is trying to access a certain set of data it can be averted with its previous entry and these things can be automated itself like i'm not going to talk about uh, skynet here when i say automate so automation what we can automate in terms of uh, identity access restriction we can just restrict a series of access for a specific hierarchy to a specific set of data when we automate this with a uh, transparent setup with the assistance of an open ledger which is nothing but blockchain everything can be solved in terms of data access and in 2023 this will be a highly discussed topic as we are into uh we are into a, a crypto boom crypto boom has happened already but it is getting uh, it is getting scale further with the introduction of metaverse introduction of web3 gaming web3 browsers and everything security will act as a key thing like people are getting access to their money easily in way in the way of crypto in the way of currency and there is a popular setup called upi unified payment system in india which facilitates transaction in milliseconds which is a great thing in terms of innovation but considering the security aspect there are a lot of things which needs further improvement and let's hope for a bright future in terms of security and i'm wrapping up here um i think we have few minutes left if you are done uh yes uh, i'm done thanks for the opportunity super well there are a lot of uh, tech uh, <clears throat> information that you have been sharing chandru uh talking about the crypto boom when you're talking about crypto boom we actually had a speaker a couple of uh, hours back uh who locked in from USA and was sharing that how she lost a uh, uh, couple of thousand dollars because she invested in a crypto project which is not very optimized or rather i would say bit of not proper the sources was not proper so she she fell in trap she lost a lot of money i think there are a lot of people who actually lost money like this even in fact if you know um i'm into blockchain uh, development uh, for last couple of years since 2017 the first project that we executed is in a country called ukraine which is not on crypto but on blockchain on a, on the top of a ecosystem building for a core place but if i look at the crypto project chandru there are a lot of gap that actually happened in a couple of years 
well, probably a lot of people uh, made money. They just shut down their platform, went off. What is your take in this? Chandru, you're there with us? Yes, yes, I'm here. Sorry. What is your take in this? Uh, like, see, every business has its flaws. And when you say a blockchain business, blockchain is a technology, keeping it apart. Uh, yeah. And I don't know about the background of the business that the speaker was trying to run. So when we say a business, there are a lot of factors involved and every business can lead a success and it can become failure based on different aspects. Like there are a lot of claims that people are losing money when they try to start an exchange or a wallet or any kind of project that they're trying to invest in. But as you know, development own is just up to me, it is just a 40 to 50 percent of the job done. And considering the setup, considering the market that they that you're trying to promote your service, there are a lot of things to be considered, starting from pitching it to the right community, providing a proper set of services, and there are a lot of takes has to be followed. So in order to comment on this in detail, I may need a few more details, like what sort of business the speaker tried to invest in. And as you know, any other day, it's just a business and the ups and downs. There are a lot of people who launch successful business and there are a lot of case studies for successful business models utilizing cryptocurrency and blockchain technology, right? So we can explain a technology for Super helpful answer, Chandru. I think uh, this will actually happen uh, in the world whenever we have any kind of technical innovation that is coming up and market disruption is happening. There will be people who are going to probably try something which is uh, at, in a different level altogether. So let's not keep our thought into that. Let's think positive and take things towards humanity. And when we are talking about humanity, when we are talking about something cool with life and become free, and of course, connect with the nature, we have our next speaker. Before that, I'll be requesting Chandru to stay back with us. I think there's a technical uh, glitch, but I'm sure that he will be coming back. So as I was saying, we are talking about humanity. We are talking about connecting with nature. <laughs> yeah, Chandru, thank you. Uh, we will move to the next speaker now. So I was actually trying to give a great uh, introduction of our next speaker. And if uh, my dear technology, you can allow me to introduce my beautiful friend and our next speaker coming all the way from Costa Rica. Stephanie, how are you doing? You're muted, my dear. Hello, hello, I am doing very well. Um, disclaimer, I am sick. So hopefully my words translate. And secondly, I'm actually in Chicago right now. <laughs> so my internet should be amazing compared oh. to when I'm in Costa Rica. But thank you for that glorious introduction. It is so great to be here. And it's been amazing listening to all of the speakers pivoting from carbon emissions to emotional intelligence to to um the blockchain and now um we all get to pivot um into a concept and an idea that um lies very close to my heart called nudity is healing so when arajit says you know being vulnerable that's exactly what this is all about so today I'm here to shed some light on nudity is healing and how that renovates holistic health. And for some of you, you might be thinking, why is nudity part of a world leader summit? Well, hopefully my, my conversation, my speech today will allow you to answer that question. So my, my first thing to sort of wrap your heads around this concept is you know, I want you guys to reflect, have you ever judged yourself on your physical appearance or altered your physical appearance in order to fit a certain environment? That's the premise of this conversation. So I, I used to judge myself and hate myself because of my physical appearance. It was never what I wanted it to be. It was never beautiful enough. 
It was never enough to be wanted by people in the world and liked by people in the world. So my whole life became about cookie cutting and altering my physical appearance so that I could fit in. And when I became accepting of my physical self, my personality and who I am in the world became the sexiest thing about me. Nudity is healing transcended, transcends how you are seen in this world by others beyond your physical appearance. So what does that mean? Well, as you can imagine, being naked, it has you be powerfully related to everything that you are and everything that you're not. You're literally getting confronted by your flesh, your physical image behind the clothes, behind the makeup, behind the everything that you distort yourself with out there in the world. And the relationship you have with your physical appearance literally dictates who you be in this world, what you do in this world, and how you speak in this world. So let me give you a few examples to demonstrate that. So inside of who you be in this world, your relationship to your physical appearance will, will make the difference between walking into a room with confidence or uncertainty. It will also dictate what you do in this world and it will be the difference between walking up to a stranger in a bar and talking about yourself proudly or when you walk into a new environment latching on to the closest person that you know and then what you say your relationship with yourself will mean the difference between how you receive a compliment whether you accept it diminish it or completely ignore it all of those actions and results out there in the world in regards to who you're being, what you're doing, and what you say is correlated to your relationship to self and your physical appearance. So nudity, as you can all appreciate, is super, super vulnerable because you're bearing yourself. You are no longer hidden. And so being vulnerable and at risk allows you to discover who you are, your true expression, your needs, wants, and desires. So to get to that point, I invite all of you to do something that scares the shit out of you. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that word out of sheet. So <laughs> tell me off later. And it could literally just be a small, just a small request uh, for the sake of uh, uh, the conference. We will skip uh, those uh, uh, <laughs> words, please. Thank you. So there was a light tap on the hand. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> so that that being scared and being vulnerable could simply be being naked with yourself in a room by yourself and being with yourself. I know that was a really huge deal for me. And that was me being at risk and that was me being vulnerable. For you, it could simply be going to a club and sitting next to someone that you somewhat find attractive and starting a conversation with them. It could be going to your next networking meet and playing a game to introduce yourself to 20 new people, being unapologetically you. Or it could be walking up to your boss and telling them why you need and deserve that raise. But I invite all of you to speculate on something, to do something that scares you and has you be at risk and vulnerable because it's then that we get to discover ourselves more. So my former work has led me to my evolved self. Okay, so through my work, others are now able to discover their own self-expression, their own identity, and even more importantly, they get to become at home with who they are in the skin that they're in. 
And when you have the absolute freedom to be you unapologetically in any conversation with anyone, in any circumstance, and in any situation, that's when you have the power to create a life that works for you. So how is this renovating holistic health? You've all heard that healing occurs from the inside out. But I do the complete opposite. This is all about healing from the outside in. Healing our relationship with our physical appearance so that we get to heal who we are internally. And once you learn to accept that you are not your physical self and that your self-worth and your magical superpowers are very distinct from your physical appearance, you get to unearth your true personality, your true desires, your true needs and wants. And you get to discover the leader that you are. Coco Chanel once said that beauty begins, let me emphasize that, beauty begins the moment you decide to be yourself. So now I want to get each of you to grab a pen of paper or your digital notepad, right? And to choose right here, right now, okay? Choose to be yourself today unapologetically and ask yourself what are three things not related to your physical appearance at which make you super sexy like really and if you're willing please put them in the chat I would love to hear what you have to say and what you see for yourself that transcends beyond your physical appearance. So if you want to become the sexiest person on earth by letting go of your physical self and understand your real sex appeal, let's talk. I offer a complimentary 30-minute conversation. My calendar, I'll drop it in the comment section. And I get to thank you for your time, your curiosity, your want to discover more about this world and yourself and your attention today. So I think I have a few minutes saved just for all of you to ask me some questions or share your sex appeal with me. And remember, there are no stupid questions. So fire away, I'm here. <laughs> Thanks, Arajit. Thank you so much, uh, Stephanie. I guess we are getting a lot of comments in uh, Zoom chat, as well as we got a couple of comments from social media. I'll pick them up from social media first. You can check the text in uh, Zoom itself. Uh, by the way, the person who just wrote you this beautiful comment, uh, Terry, he is our ambassador all the way coming from Europe. A beautiful person by heart is into cybersecurity and we are partnered into a particular project that we are executing together, which is a patented technology that they have developed uh, and we are making things together. For you, the next speaker is a, a ex-BBC journalist, but this is your time. So I'll be taking the question. Meanwhile, you can check your um, Zoom for the comments. I'm sure you're gonna like it. Okay, so the comments are coming in uh, social media, Stephanie, for you. Uh, somebody who is willing to connect you from Thailand, she's a pop singer, uh, would love to get in touch with you and probably will send you a connection request in your LinkedIn, already found you there. Then a comment came, wow, that's an awesome concept. Uh, people are saying agree with a uh, couple of comments, but I have a question. When you are talking about uh, healing, when you're talking about mental peace, it is not that easy first time to actually open up yourself in front of the nature. It's not that easy. So how did you actually cross that barrier and be in the nature? What was your secret sauce? 
Well, you know, I don't think it's a secret. <laughs> and I think what was what was there for me was I had to I had to hit rock bottom and I had to get to a point where I was like, why am I here? Why am I stuck in this vicious cycle, hating myself and judging myself? I want out. But I really had to hit that rock bottom. And, and I think we get to, um, what's the word for it? We, we get to um, get to rock bottom, but allow that to be an opportunity. You know, there's a rock bottom for a reason. And so that's what had me leap into the space of nudity is healing. And that's when I discovered nudity. And that's when, when I discovered that there was a whole new version of myself beyond myself but I really had to surrender and that's the difficult piece that you're talking about Arjit, is that surrender and I think the closer to rock bottom we get the easier it gets to get into a place of surrender because there is nowhere else to go um, and so I I think we get to stop talking about this rock bottom as the most horrific thing on earth it's not it's there it's an opportunity and some people just need to get deeper than others but it's an opportunity for us to discover what it is to surrender to ourselves, surrender to the world and discover a world that works for us. Brilliant. For the world, I would love to take an opportunity to share something. Um, so Tiffany and me, we, we know each other for quite a long number of months. We became friends apart from she is becoming a speaker in World Leader Summit. So uh, I'm not sure how many of you know that I draw. I draw quite well. Well, I try mm -hmm. to draw her in a picture. I would love to share you with, uh, with the audience. This is what I did with simple pencil and charcoal. And we are coming up with uh, our own concept of creating probably an art gallery of our own with the people who have got the same similar kind of mindset. So we'll be more than happy if you can connect directly to Stephanie about the entire project. Talk to her, understand what you are trying to do, and then let's make hands together, grow together, and make things happen. Thank you, Stephanie, for coming and sharing your beautiful insight and your thoughts. It's just mind-blowing and amazing. With this note, I will request you to please stay back with us, and I'll be asking our next speaker, our beautiful next speaker, coming all the way again from USA, CJ Grace. Could you please unmute yourself, and uh, we can have you on the screen, please. Hi, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak today, Arijit. Pleasure. So let me tell you that at the very end of a recent interview I did about cancer for Fox News Radio, the host mentioned the name of my new comic self-help memoir, and he did a double take. My guest today was CJ Grace, author of My Wild Ride, how to thrive after breast cancer and infidelity? Hmm, what's that all about, he remarked. What does one have to do with the other? Well, research and personal experience has shown me that there is a strong connection in both directions. Breast cancer often follows or is followed by infidelity and marital breakup. And how do I know? I've lived it. You see, I was a journalist with the BBC in Britain, meeting celebrities, politicians, people who were making their mark on the world. And then I got a transfer to work for China Radio International in Beijing. And it was there that I had a fairy tale falling in love with an American guy. Fast forward to our 25th wedding anniversary, spent in Hawaii, it was the best one ever. And little did I know that just two years later, both my marriage and my health would be in tatters. My husband was openly carrying on an affair with a woman half his age, whom he refused to give up, and I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I can tell you that that was a double whammy that left me reeling. I'm a two-time breast cancer survivor. I've got one of those BRCA genes that are mutated and make me more susceptible to cancer. But you know, I didn't want to take on the cancer victim role. I wanted to be a victor rather than a victim. 
And later on in my presentation today, I'm going to tell you a few things I did to deal with both the breast cancer and the emotional roller coaster that my husband's infidelity put me on, just to give you a few ideas of how to use setbacks as an opportunity to actually change your life for the better. And I'm also going to be discussing the difference between seeing humor in life versus cultivating a positive attitude. They're definitely not the same thing. But first of all, how does infidelity lead to breast cancer? Finding out that your partner's been unfaithful creates a number of different kinds of stress. And numerous studies have shown that stress is a major cause of disease, particularly cancer. There's the emotional stress of feeling betrayed, which can be somewhat like a bereavement as it's the death of your relationship as you knew it. Then there's the stress of potentially having to move out of your home. Then financial stress, because if you get divorced, you have to split up your assets. And even if everything is divided up equally between the two parties, 50% of what you used to own is always less than 100%. And all of these factors create the stress of insecurity and feeling overwhelmed. So in the research I did for my comedy self-help book, Adulterer's Wife, How to Thrive Whether You Stay or Not, that one was published in 2016, I came across several women who had developed breast cancer shortly after discovering their husbands had been cheating. Now, what about breast cancer leading to infidelity and marital breakup? Well, when women go through cancer treatment, sex is often the last thing on their minds and their marriages become celibate. This can lead their husbands to have extramarital affairs or to leave the marriage entirely. And indeed, research has shown that men are far more likely to cheat on and dump wives with serious illness than the other way around. There was a 2001 study of more than 500 married patients led by Michael Glantz. He was a neuro-oncologist at the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix. And the study showed female cancer patients were at a considerably higher risk of marital problems. Women with malignant brain, tumor, brain cancers were eight times more likely to undergo a separation or divorce than were men with brain tumors. And the rate for women diagnosed with systemic cancer was 12 times higher. And a follow-up study Michael Glantz published in 2009 showed even starker results. Does this happen because women are more equipped to take on the role of caregivers than men? At least according to this study, the sicker and higher maintenance the patients, the more likely the husbands were to walk away, despite that in sickness and in health marriage vow. The results of this research correlated with personal stories I heard about cancer and infidelity. A spine surgeon I know was operating on someone with, a, with metastatic breast cancer that had spread to her bones. And the poor woman came back from her surgery to a note on the kitchen table from her husband, telling her he was unable to face dealing with her cancer anymore and had chosen to leave. So how did I deal with both breast cancer and an unfaithful husband? I actually developed a six part plan of action you can read about it in detail on my website, cjauthor.com, that's cjauthor.com, and I also spoke about it in detail uh, at the Women's League uh, uh, Summit um, that happened earlier this year. But in a nutshell, it's about finding confidants and mentors with your best interests at heart, building a community of friends, old and new, taking care of your body, that means eating a healthy diet, getting enough sleep, and exercising. And for me, outdoor exercise has always been the best antidepressant. And another thing is finding your passion. That's a great thing to do. Some activity that makes your heart sing. Maybe it's music, art, writing. For me, it was writing or volunteering for a cause you believe in. And the last thing in the six part plan, which is always a work in progress for me, was trying to become more mindful of living in the present because yesterday's gone, tomorrow is fiction until it happens. And so now is all we have. So there were three mottos I took to heart. 
Number one, after infidelity, the best revenge is to get past the need for revenge. It's a toxic emotion. I wanted to put my life energy into planning how to move forward rather than plotting vengeance. Number two, information is power. Whether investigating treatment options for my cancer or finding out about my rights as regards divorce, I embraced my inner anal journalist to be fully informed before making decisions. And number three, if you don't laugh, you'll cry, and I'd much rather laugh. So I tried to find absurd humor in every situation I was faced with. Humor plays a big part in my life, as well as being a humorist writer. I've also even tried my hand at stand-up comedy. Numerous studies have shown laughter has both psychological and physiological benefits. So think about what makes you laugh. For me, anything done by the Monty Python team works every time. And as a former BBC reporter, I'd always prided myself on being up to date with world affairs. But when I was doing cancer treatment, I rarely bothered to keep up with the news because it's all bad news. Instead, I focused on comedies. Seeing humor in your everyday existence isn't the same thing as always cultivating a positive attitude. That's hard to manufacture. I can think of one or two people who sternly insisted I must stay positive when I was dealing with my breast cancer, who themselves manifested bucket loads of negativity when problems arose in their own lives. Yes, do whatever you can to keep your spirits up, but don't ever feel bad about feeling bad. Each side of the positive thinking debate has research to support it. Some studies show a positive attitude helps cancer recovery, while others indicate that positive thinking doesn't improve the outcome. Anyway, it's impossible to be positive all the time, especially when faced with setbacks like breast cancer or breast cancer treatment or being in pain. But laughter can take your mind off your difficulties. American political journalist Norman Cousins was in immobile and in extreme pain from a condition called ankylosing spondylitis. And he found, even though doctors said he would never recover from that condition, watching stuff like Marx Brothers films and Candid Camera, he discovered that just 10 minutes of induced hearty laughter would give him about two hours of painless sleep and eventually he became almost completely pain free. So as a humorist, but also a traditionally trained journalist, when I wrote my new self-help memoir, My Wild Ride, How to Thrive After Breast Cancer and Infidelity, it had to not only be funny, but also well-researched and hard hitting. I bring up serious issues, but there's always a humorous angle like the fact that right now I am totally and utterly braless. Now, why? One of the many books I read for my research was called Dress to Kill, The Link Between Breast Cancer and Bras. Great title. The authors present compelling evidence that the link between bras and breast cancer is stronger than that between smoking and lung cancer. Wow. Sadly, mainstream cancer groups haven't accepted this, pointing to just one study done in 2014 showing no link, but that study only looked at postmenopausal women in whom the damaging effects of bras were much weaker and it had no control group. So that would be like studying the link between smoking and lung cancer and including no non-smokers in your research. In May 2013, movie star Angelina Jolie went public with the news that she'd undergone a prophylactic double mastectomy based on a positive BRCA, also known as BRCA, test. Maybe I'm biased, but my personal view is that her a lot of women into unnecessary surgeries. Yes, some of my friends thought I was completely nuts to turn down mastectomies and go for lumpectomies both times I was diagnosed with breast cancer, but I'm happy with my decision. 
Who knows though, perhaps my tombstone will read, here lies CJ Grace because she refused to lop off her boobs. However, breast reconstruction can cause all kinds of problems. And many women now choose to go flat after mastectomies as breast implant illness is very real. Nicole Deruda's Facebook support group for breast implant illness to date has more than 170,000 members. That's despite a biased new industry-funded study that tries to imply a big factor is that the women who complain about implant illness are just neurotic. Seriously, that study is so bad that it's good in a Monty Python kind of way. Well, when Angelina Jolie's BRCA gene story appeared in the press, I felt there should have been much more coverage of the ovarian cancer risks faced by those with BRCA gene mutations, rather than just focusing on breast cancer and prophylactic mastectomies. Jolie's mother did get breast cancer, but she died from ovarian cancer. So I was advised to have my ovaries removed, but waited till after menopause to avoid being slammed into it artificially. I chose to have just the ovaries and fallopian tubes removed, that operation is known as an oophorectomy, rather than the full hysterectomy that some BRCA gene carriers are choosing to undergo. I didn't feel that the hysterectomy to me operation was necessary for me in my circumstances, and it would have had the potential for more side effects. Breast cancer is the most common female cancer worldwide. And in the United States and Britain, for example, one out of every eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in her lifetime. According to the American Cancer Society, the five-year survival statistics for early stage non-metastatic breast cancer are close to 100%. That's pretty good. But that being said, cancer is a crapshoot. I'm not a doctor, so I would never want to tell someone else how they should deal with their cancer, but that didn't stop people from bombarding me with unsolicited advice. Some insisted the chemo and radiation I underwent was toxic and wouldn't work. Others declared that the alternative therapies I chose to do as well were pure quackery. Did I make the right decisions? All I can say is, to quote Monty Python, I'm not dead yet. And I've even got the spam a lot badge to prove it. So if I could wave a magic wand and make the cancer and infidelity never have happened, would I do it? You might be surprised to hear me say no. I do not regret having gone through the experience, bleak and difficult though it was. Regret is not about the past. It's about the present. I'm happy with my life as it is right now. If I hadn't gone through the past exactly as it was, my here and now would be different. So both My Wild Ride, How to Thrive After Breast Cancer and Infidelity, and my first book, Adulterer's Wife, How to Thrive Whether You Stay or Not, examine how to deal with adversity by using it as a catalyst to raise you up rather than be crushed. And my aim is to inspire ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances to find ways to make their lives fulfilling, however long or short their time on this earth might be. So I'm CJ Grace. You can visit my website, cjauthor.com, that's cjauthor.com, to access various resources to help you cope with breast cancer and infidelity, including two free PDFs. So I hope you found my presentation useful, and I'd like to thank Arijit and the rest of the World Leader Summit team for organizing this mega event and inviting me to be a speaker today. Thank you so much, CJ. It was a beautiful presentation we all enjoyed, and a lot of kudos to you, man. What a courage, and what a disruption that you are trying to make. This is completely amazing. Uh, open offer to you, we have... Uh, a magazine which we usually publish uh, in a quarter. If you feel that you want to add something over there, we'll be more than happy to do that. 
We have a Thank you. We have a newsletter, which usually goes every month. We have social media, active social media. Usually people respond it. You can check uh, our social media likes if you if you really want to check those uh, uh, people. They are really, really active people. So feel free to connect with them in LinkedIn, in Facebook, in Instagram. We are more active in LinkedIn rather than any other social media. We have a two point, uh, over 2 million, uh, 2.5 million actually, 2.5 million plus subscribers into our email newsletter. So if you feel that we can do anything, we'll be more than happy to do that. Um, because we, we already uh, run out of uh, the time, I'll be uh, taking only one short question. One question is coming from, uh, if there is any question from uh, the other speakers, that is completely fine. Else I'll go to uh, the question which is coming uh, in the social media and nina is saying you are doing great so oh, yeah i'm on another call actually but i'm listening to you guys because i've got fomo of leaving Arage. i've kind of got attached to him so much over the last few days but i love cj and i wanted to say hello to her she's an amazing president i was listening to you whilst listening to the other talk so thank you for coming and thank you for your talk yeah CJ, well, thank you, so much, Nina. you are amazing too oh my god what an incredible lady nina is what yeah. she's gone through and what she does with her life is just incredible. She is amazing. So there is a there's a small comment that came that how uh, someone, if someone wants to get some kind of mentorship, how they can get a uh, lot of girls in my village probably is going to face the same challenge. This question is coming very distant part of India, which uh, we can see uh, from the from the message box that uh, we can track. So any comments on that, CJ? Because um, in India, um, CJ, let me tell you, uh, internet connection in those villages are not that good. So net connectivity will be a trouble in those villages. But somehow this lady is courageous enough to travel just to attend the summit, to have a good network in a nearby city area and asking this question to you. And it is late night, about 10.30 p.m. Um, and what is the question? The question is how, how somebody can get some kind of mentoring from you because they are village in their villages their girls are probably going to face the same similar kind of issues um i have so many resources on my website i mean that, that's the trouble in terms of net connect connectivity but if one person can um go to my website i have a um, cj also will give you links to a page called cancer stuff i have a lot of advice about cancer reading um books you can read about cancer and also cancer skin care and there are some very simple things that you can do. Just not wearing a bra, if you can possibly manage to do that, you will reduce your chances of getting breast cancer. Um, because it's constricting the lymph flow and the toxins collect in the breasts, um, in the fatty tissue. And so if you're wearing very tight clothing in that area, you are preventing toxins and waste products from moving out of that area. So if you could do just one thing, that would be something that will cost you no money at all and will reduce your chances of breast cancer. Um, they've done studies, people in um, uh, indigenous societies where they don't wear Western clothing, the instances of breast cancer are very similar between men and women. How many men do you know with breast cancer? Hardly, I, I think I've only ever heard of one person. Um, then they start working for Western companies that move in wearing the Western clothing and breast cancer starts happening in the women. Seriously, this is what is written about in this book, Dress to Kill. Dress to Kill, brilliant book. Um, highly recommended to, to see why that is a, um, a big deal bras and breast cancer. So, you know, it's very difficult to suggest things that don't cost any money in terms of health and healing. That is one thing that costs you nothing. Brilliant. CJ, we have a startup which is uh, lead by Rahul. Rahul is a past speaker in, uh, I think, two days back, if I'm not wrong. It's called Health Planeta. We are trying to give proper Ayurveda and natural therapy to the people instead of giving medicine and supplements. So mm -hmm. Rahul, if you are there, yeah, Rahul is here. Maybe you both can connect with each other. We can do some kind of workshop for women so that we can maybe take a couple of things forward. Beautiful to have you, Rahul. If you need to say something, please feel free to talk to us. Right. Yeah. yeah, let's connect. <laughs> Super. Put your, put your information in the chat and I will connect with you. <laughs> sure, we'll connect you. So I also have a question. I put it in the chat box. But 
Like I have read a lot of articles that, that says that silicone-based implants are linked directly to higher instances of breast cancer. Is that true in your opinion? Abs absolutely. Um, I, you're talking about the dangers of breast implants, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes. 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 Um, there, there's a lot of research out there and um, the, the, it, it causes a number of different conditions. There can be systemic um, uh, feelings of every system in the, in the body can be affected by leaking silicone from your breast implants. Um, and if you, um, if anybody who's having problems and they don't know why, um, but they've had breast implants should investigate that possibility. And uh, Nicole Deruda, as I mentioned, has a Facebook support group for breast implant illness. She was bedridden for six years, I believe, until she realized the reason why she felt so terrible was her breast implants. And when she had them removed, her symptoms went away. Um, so, uh, and it's a, it's a really serious situation. Even the FDA in, in America, which is not the fastest organization to um, say that something is dangerous, now has, um, has warnings about breast implants. And again, on my website, on the cancer stuff um, page, I do have a link to an article that I wrote about um, breast implant illness and um and and this new study that uh, came out this ludicrous new study that i just mentioned um uh, the one that says that women are just neurotic uh and then i also have um a link to more information about the bra and bras and breast cancer um story so so yes um you're right that all kinds of different problems including cancer can be caused by um breast implants Thank not you for, for everybody. That, not for everybody. I will say, you know, um, there are some people who are fine, but there are a significant number of people of women wearing who, who have breast implants who are definitely not fine. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, uh, CJ, for the beautiful speech. Thank you, Rahul, for the question. And uh, this is, I think, uh, end of today's discussion and speaking slot. Well, the summit is happening from 2nd December to 7th December every year. Please mark that date. We do this every year as a mega summit. I'll be giving you a small brief what all we do. We have a leaders meetup every month. We do that utilizing internet connectivity. The concept is to do good business with each other. People who have some business need, they want to connect with each other. They need to network. They can come. They can network with each other. There's an offline meetup that we do on a country basis, which is lead by the country ambassadors, depending on their availability and the places and the structure, we usually float that. We have done that in several different countries altogether. We have another program, which is the mentoring program, which is lead by Entrepreneur Face, which is a platform of ours of mentors, change makers, investors. We have our acceleration program called Coin of Adventures, wherein we have our own fund, own angel syndicate. If you need any kind of support, any kind of contact, any kind of scale up, feel free to reach to us. Please understand that we have been doing this World Leader Summit for the last three years for free for all of you. You don't know how much effort it goes. We get thousands of thousands of applications. I'm so sorry to make a statement that we don't accept anyone and everyone. It completely depends on the theme of that particular year. So when you apply for next year World Leader Summit or any of our program, please read the description before you just hit the apply a speaker button. We have specific themes, depending on the theme, if this is interesting and your profile is really cool, you want to make some impact, you need some help, you want to give back. We only take those kind of people in the platform so that they can do a couple of things, a couple of good things together. This is not a, just a platform just to come and share your inputs. Sorry about the rough words. Then we have a platform called Glamour Face, which is mainly for media, entertainment professionals, photographers, models, actor, actress, it's a large database wherein we create, connect them with the production houses, add uh, monetization companies, as well as a couple of OTT and uh, uh, web app companies. We have another platform called Virtual Infocom, which is my company. We started that in 1998. Gracefully, we created more than hundreds of games on virtual reality, on 
smartphones, PC, and a couple of different uh, platforms altogether. We create mainly story-based, superhero-based game. We take a real-time, real-life actor, actress, or a person who is a change maker. We create a storyline out of it and make a game out of it, put it in the market. I'm not sure how many of you know the strength of gaming market is more than movie and music industry altogether. Somehow, I'm coming from a country and a space, specifically a city called Calcutta, where all these things somehow is untouched and unheard of. Coming from those kind of background, settling down in multiple different countries and doing business with more than 100 plus country is not that easy. I hope that you all understand that. We tried our best to give you best possible hospitality and warmth from the heart. Please, 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 please pardon us if we have done something wrong, if we have pushed you, um, asked you to stop in between or asking you to join or probably asking you uh, for to do a couple of favors for us. We are more than happy to make things available. We are open for any kind of handshake, any kind of partnership. Talking about the partnership, when you talk about partnership, definitely it is my pleasure to take name of those partners who actually helped us to uh, do this summit. Um, these partners, we call them as an ecosystem partner. They also shared and cared and uh, connected with multiple different kind of uh, countries altogether. Thank you so much, Anim Gaming. Thank you so much, Deep Tech Knowledge. Thank you so much, Coin of Adventures, Art and Craft Market. This is a beautiful platform for artists if they want to sell their art, buy the art. So this is a buyer-seller market for Art and Craft. Health Planet Art definitely would be lead by Rahul next. Um, I'm just a founder. He is going to be the CEO. Um, AVGC, which is Australia Vietnam Business Council, Eight Metals, Glam World Face, Abel Global, Property Planet, Animation Reviews, Virtual Infocom, Web Hub, MyFinV, um, Virtual Game Developer, Cyber Security Gigs, Mind Superhero, I Am Superhero, Yoga Training for You, My Films, Sports Zone In, Second Life Tech, Cosplay Seller, CXO Designs, Chef Rome, Entrepreneur Face, World Women uh, Awards, Generation S, Tech Sauce, Culture Italia, WASME, Poverty Foundation, and all the other ambassadors who made it happen. There is a good number of people who are working in the background, um, awake, working day and night, communicating with speakers, communicating with the people so that we can give you best possible opportunity. We hope to do this summit physically world is open now so hope for the best wish us good luck and let's see each other somewhere in the globe and respect each other a lot of you have asked me that why can't you speak tomorrow on 7th of december what's happening in 7th of december with this last note i'll be ending this session 7th of december is actually meant for investor investee connection 7th december is not the day for speaking slot, wherein we have 25 odd startups who will be pitching in front of our own investors. It is not going to be live. It will be completely inside our closed door Zoom room. So we are sorry that we cannot invite you over there for so many reasons. And definitely we will declare the results in our social media. I'm sure that with the blessing, you will, these people will grow farther in life. What happened in the last three years, we awarded multiple number of people across the globe, irrespective of the fact we never ever charge anybody. The reason we did that so that people can recognize them. You saw more probably one of the speaker coming all the way from Zimbabwe, sharing that after that award, her entire life has been updated and changed. We have a lot of these kind of stories. So if you really want to read these stories, please hop in and log into our blog. We have a blog in World Leader Summit. You can see the kind of people, change makers that actually is doing disruption in the world. World is big, keep spreading love, keep in touch and wait for next year's World Leader Summit. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for connecting and thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you.